Introduction of the Mummy, a Tale of the Twenty-Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Mummy, a Tale of the Twenty-Second Century, by Jane Loudon. Introduction. I have long wished to write a novel, but I could not determine what it was to be about. I could not bear anything commonplace, and I did not know what to do for a hero. Heroes are generally so much alike, so monotonous, so dreadfully insipid, so completely brothers of one race, with the family likeness so amazingly strong. This will not do for me thought I, as I sauntered listlessly down a shady lane one fine evening in June. I must have something new, something quite out of the beaten path. But what? Ah, that was the question. In vain did I rack my brains. In vain did I search the storehouse of my memory. I could think of nothing that had not been thought of before. It is very strange, said I as I walked faster, as though I hoped the rapidity of my motion would shake off the sluggishness of my imagination. It was all in vain. I struck my forehead and called wit to my assistance. But the malignant deity was deaf to my entreaty. Surely, thought I, the deep mine of invention cannot be worked out. There must be some new ideas left. If I could but find them... To find them, however, was the difficulty. Thus lost in meditation, I walked onwards till I reached the brow of a hill, and a superb prospect burst upon me. A fertile valley richly wooded, studded with sumptuous villas and romantic cottages, and watered by a noble river, that wound slowly its lazy course along, spread beneath my feet and lofty hills swelling to the skies, their summit lost in the clouds, bounded the horizon. The sun was setting in all its splendor, and its lingering rays gave those glowing tints and deep masses of shadow to the landscape that sometimes produce so magical an effect. It was quite a Claude Lorraine scene, and more fully to enjoy it I entered a hayfield and seated myself upon a grassy bank. The day had been sultry, and the evening breeze, as it murmured through the foliage, felt cool and refreshing. It is a lovely world, thought I, notwithstanding all that cynics can say against it. Our own passions bring misery upon our heads, and then we rail at the world, though we only are in fault. Why should I seek to wander in the regions of fiction? Why not enjoy tranquilly the blessings heaven has bestowed upon me? I felt too indolent to answer my own question. A delicious stillness crept over my senses, and the heaving chaos of my ideas was lulled to repose. A majestic oak stretched its gnarled arms in sullen dignity above my head. Myriads of busy insects buzzed around me, and woodbines and wild roses, hanging from every hedge, mingled their perfume with that of the new-mown hay. I reclined languidly on my grassy couch, listening to the indistinct hum of the distant village, and feeling that delightful sense of exemption from care, which a faint murmur of bustle afar off gives to the weary spirit, when suddenly the bells struck up a joyous peal, the cheerful notes now swelling loudly upon the ear, then sinking gently away with the retiring breeze, and then again returning with added sweetness. I listened with delight to their melody, till their softness seemed to increase. The sounds became gradually fainter and fainter. The landscape faded from my sight. A soft languor crept over me. In short, I slept. It would be of no use to go to sleep without dreaming, and accordingly I had scarcely closed my eyes when methought a spirit stood before me. His head was crowned with flowers, his azure wings fluttered in the breeze, and a light drapery, like the fleecy vapor that hangs upon the summit of a mountain, floated round him. In his hand he held a scroll, and his voice sounded soft and sweet as the liquid melody of the nightingale. "'Take this,' he said, smiling benignantly. "'It is the chronicle of a future age.' 
weave it into a story it will so far gratify your wishes as to give you a hero totally different from any hero that ever appeared before you hesitate continued he again smiling and regarding me earnestly i read your thoughts and see you fear to sketch the scenes of which you are to write because you imagine they must be different from those with which you are acquainted this is a natural distrust the scenes will indeed be different from those you now behold the whole face of society will be changed new governments will have arisen strange discoveries will be made and stranger modes of life adopted the restless curiosity and research of man will then have enabled him to lift the veil from much which is to him at least at present a mystery and his powers both as regards mechanical agency and intellectual knowledge will be greatly enlarged but even then in the plenitude of his acquirements he will be made conscious of the infirmity of his nature and will be guilty of many absurdities which in his less enlightened state he would feel ashamed to commit to no one but yourself has this vision been revealed do not fear to behold it though strange it may be fully understood for much will still remain to connect that future age with the present the impulses and feelings of human creatures must for the most part be alike in all ages habits vary but nature endures and the same passions were delineated the same weaknesses ridiculed by aristophanes plautus and terence as in after times were described by shakespeare and moliere and as will be in the times of which you are to write by authors yet unknown but still you hesitate you object that the novelty of the illusions perplexes you this is quite a new kind of delicacy as authors seldom trouble themselves to become acquainted with a subject before they begin to write upon it. However, since you are so very scrupulous, I will endeavor, if possible, to assist you. Look around. I did so, and saw, as in a magic glass, the scenes and characters which I shall now endeavor to pass before the eyes of the reader. Chapter 1, Volume 1 of The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Hort. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century by Jane Loudon. Chapter 1, Volume 1. In the year 2126, England enjoyed peace and tranquility under the absolute dominion of a female sovereign. Numerous changes had taken place for some centuries in the political state of the country, and several forms of government had been successfully adopted and destroyed, till, as is generally the case after violent revolutions, they all settled down into an absolute monarchy. The religion of the country was mutable as its government, and in the end, by adopting Catholicism, it seemed to have arrived at nearly the same result. Despotism in the state, indeed, naturally produces despotism in religion. The implicit faith and passive obedience required in the one case, being the best of all possible preparatives for the absolute submission of both mind and body necessary in the other. In former times, England had been blessed with a mixed government and a tolerant religion, under which the people had enjoyed as much freedom as they perhaps ever can do, consistently with their prosperity and happiness but it is not in the nature of the human mind to be contented we must always either hope or fear and things that at distance appear so much more beautiful than they do when we approach them that we always fancy what we have not infinitely superior to anything we have and neglect enjoyments within our reach to pursue others which like ignis fatui elude our grasp at the very moment when we hope we have attained them Thus it was with the people of England, not satisfied with being rich and prosperous, they longed for something more. Abundance of wealth caused wild schemes and gigantic speculations, and though many failed, yet, as some succeeded, the enormity of the sums gained by the projectors incited others to pursue the same career. New countries were discovered and civilized. 
the whole earth was brought to the highest pitch of cultivation every corner of it was explored mountains were leveled mines were excavated and the globe racked to its center nay the air and sea did not escape and all nature was compelled to submit to the overwhelming supremacy of man still the english people were not satisfied enabled to gratify every wish till society succeeded indulgence they were still unhappy perhaps precisely because they had no longer any difficulties to encounter education became universal and the technical terms of abstruse sciences familiar to the lower mechanics whilst questions of religion politics and metaphysics agitated by them daily supplied that stimulus for which their minds enervated by over cultivation constantly craved the consequences may be readily conceived it was impossible for those to study deeply who had to labor for their daily bread and not having time to make themselves masters of any given subject they only learned enough of all to render them disputatious and discontented their heads were filled with words to which they affixed no definite ideas and the little sense heaven had blessed them with was lost beneath a mass of undigested and misapplied knowledge conceit inevitably leads to rebellion the natural consequence of the mob thinking themselves as wise as their rulers was that they took the first convenient opportunity that offered to jostle these aforesaid rulers from their seats an aristocracy was established and afterward a democracy but both shared the same fate for the leaders of each in turn found the instruments they had made use of to rise soon become unmanageable the people had tasted the sweets of power they had learned their own strength they were enlightened and fancying they understood the art of ruling as well as their quondam directors they saw no reason why after shaking off the control of one master they should afterwards submit to the domination of many we are free said they we acknowledge no laws but those of nature and of those we are as competent to judge as our would-be masters in what are they superior to ourselves nature has been as bountiful to us as to them and we have had the same advantages of education why then should we toil to give them ease we are each capable of governing ourselves why should we pay them to rule us why should we be debarred from mental enjoyments and condemned to manual labor are not our tastes as refined as theirs and our minds as highly cultivated will we assert our independence and throw off the yoke if any man wish for luxuries let him labor to procure them for himself we will be slaves no longer we will all be masters thus they reasoned and thus they acted till government after government having been overturned complete anarchy prevailed and the people began to discover though alas too late that there was little pleasure in being masters when there were no subjects and that it was impossible to enjoy intellectual pleasures whilst each man was compelled to labor for his daily bread this was however inevitable for as perfect equality had been declared of course no one would condescend to work for his neighbor and everything was done badly as however skillful any man may be in any particular art or profession it is quite impossible he can excel in all in the meantime the people who had though they scarcely knew why attached to the idea of equality that of exemption from toil found to their infinite surprise that their burthens had increased tenfold whilst their comforts had unaccountably diminished in the same proportion the blessings of civilization were indeed fast slipping away from them every man became afraid lest the hard-earned means of existence should be torn from his grasp or as all laws had been abolished the strong tyrannized over the weak and the most enlightened nation in the world was in imminent danger of degenerating into a horde of rapacious barbarians this state of things could not continue and the people finding from experience that perfect equality was not quite the most enviable mode of government began to suspect that a division of labor and a distinction of ranks were absolutely necessary to civilization and sought out their ancient nobility to endeavor to restore something like order to society these illustrious personages were soon found those who had not emigrated had retired to their seats in the country where surrounded by their dependents and the few friends who had remained faithful to them they enjoyed the otium cum dignitate and consoled themselves for the loss of their former greatness by railing it most manfully at those who had deprived them of it amongst this number was the lineal descendant of the late royal family and to him the people now resolved humbly and unconditionally to offer the crown 
imagining with the usual vehemence and inconsistency of, of popular commotions that an arbitrary government must be best for them as being the very reverse of that the evils of which they had just so forcibly experienced the prince however to whom a deputation from the people made this offer happened not to be ambitious like another cincinnatus he placed all his happiness in the cultivation of a small farm and had sufficient prudence to reject a grandeur which he felt must be purchased by the sacrifice of his peace the deputies were in despair at his refusal and they re-urged their suit with every argument that the stress of their situation could inspire they painted in glowing colors the horrors of the anarchy that prevailed the misery of the kingdom the despair of the people and at last wound up their arguments by a solemn appeal to heaven that if he persisted in his refusal the future wretchedness of the people might fall upon his head the prince continued inexorable and the deputies were preparing to withdraw when the prince's daughter who had been present during the whole interview rushed forward and prevented their retreat stay i will be your queen cried she energetically i will save my country or perish in the attempt the princess was a beautiful woman about six and twenty and at this moment her fine eyes sparkling with enthusiasm her cheeks glowing and her whole face and figure breathing dignity from the exalted purpose of her soul she appeared to the deputies almost as a supernatural being and regarding her offer as a direct inspiration from heaven they bore her in triumph to the assembled multitude who awaited their return whilst the people ever caught by novelty and desirous of any change to free them from the misery they were enduring hailed her appearance with delight and unanimously proclaimed her queen the new sovereign soon found the task she had undertaken a difficult one but happening luckily to possess common sense and prudence united with a firm and active disposition she contrived in time to restore order and to confirm her own power whilst she contributed to the happiness of her people the face of the kingdom rapidly changed security produced improvement and the self-banished nobles of the former dynasty crowding round the new queen she chose from amongst them the wisest and most experienced for her counsellors and by their help compounded an excellent code of laws this book was open to the whole kingdom and cases being decided by principle instead of precedent litigation was almost unknown for as the laws were fully and clearly explained so as to be understood by every body few dared to act in open violation of them punishment being certain to follow detection and all the agonizing delights of a lawsuit were entirely destroyed as every body knew the moment the facts were stated how it would inevitably terminate this renewal of the golden age continued several years without interruption the people being too much delighted with the personal comforts they enjoyed to complain of the errors inseparable from all human institutions whilst the remembrance of what they had suffered during the reign of anarchy made them tremble at a change and patiently submit to trifling inconveniences to avoid the risk of positive evils this generation passed away and with it died not only the recollection of the past misfortunes of the kingdom but also a spirit of content they had engendered a new race arose who with the ignorance and presumption of inexperience found fault with everything they did not understand and accused the queen and her ministers of dotage merely because they did not accomplish impossibilities the government however was too firmly established to be easily shaken the judicious economy of the queen had filled her treasury with riches her prudent regulations had extended the commerce of her subjects to an almost incredible extent whilst her firm and disciplined disposition made her universally respected both at home and abroad the malcontents were therefore awed into submission and obliged in spite of themselves to rest satisfied with growling at the government they were not strong enough to overturn at this time the queen died and the state of affairs experienced an important change it has been before mentioned that the religion of the country had altered with its government atheism rational liberty and fanaticism had followed each other in regular succession and the people found by fatal experience that persecution and bigotry assimilated as naturally with infidelity as with superstition a fixed government seemed to require an established religion and the multitude ever in extremes rushed from excess of liberty to intolerance the catholic faith was restored new saints were canonized and confessors appointed in the families of every person of distinction 
these priests however were far from having the power they had possessed in former times the eyes of men had been too long open to be easily closed again education still continued amongst the lower classes and though at the time this history commences it was going out of fashion with persons of rank its influence was even felt by those most prejudiced against it during the reign of the late queen the minds of the public not having any state of affairs to occupy them had been directed to the improvement of the arts and sciences and so many new inventions had been struck out so many wonderful discoveries made and so many ingenious contrivances put into execution that poor nature seemed to be degraded from her throne and usurping man to have stepped up to supply her place before the queen died she chose her niece claudia to succeed her and as she enacted that none of her successors should marry she ordered that all future queens should be chosen by the people from such female members of her family as might be between twenty and twenty-five years of age at the time of the thrones becoming vacant every male throughout the kingdom who had attained the age of twenty-one was to have a voice in this election but as it was presumed it might be inconvenient to convoke these numerous electors into one place it was agreed that every ten thousand should choose a deputy to proceed to london to represent them and that a majority of these deputies should elect the queen it seemed probable to thinking minds however that this scheme like most feasible in theory would present some difficulties when it was to be put in practice but of these the old queen never troubled herself to think she had provided against any immediate disturbance by choosing her own successor and she left posterity to take care of itself queen claudia was one of those fainéant sovereigns of whom it is extremely difficult to write the history for the simple but unanswerable reason that they never perform any action worthy of being recorded but as she seldom did any harm though she did not do much good she contrived to escape either violent censure or applause and in short to get through life very decently without making much bustle about it she continued the same counsellors that had been employed by her predecessor appointing the sons when the fathers died to save trouble she left the laws as she found them for the same reason and in short she let the affairs of government go on so quietly and so exactly in the same routine as before that for two or three years after her accession the people were scarcely aware that any change had taken place end of chapter one chapter two part one of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon, Chapter 2, Part 1. The indolent Claudia had already reigned three years in the most profound tranquility, and the year 2127 was beginning also to roll placidly away when early in its spring the peace of the kingdom was interrupted and the council of the queen thrown into most distressing consternation by the intelligence that roderick king of ireland had landed in wales at the head of an invading army and that the malcontents from every part of the kingdom were flocking to his standard the crisis was alarming the pacific reign of the late queen and inertness of the present one had occasioned the standing army of england to be a splendid toy kept rather for show than use and universal education had made its component parts reasoning pendants rather than active agents it was indeed no uncommon occurrence to see a regiment thrown into confusion on a review day in consequence of the orders of the general not exactly coinciding with the notions entertained of military tactics by the privates who whilst arguing the point quite forgot what they had been ordered to perform little could reasonably be expected from an army thus constituted 
but the native spirit of Englishmen and their hatred of foreigners rose triumphant over every obstacle, and the soldiers unanimously professed themselves ready to obey the orders of the council and to die in defense of their queen and government if necessary. Unfortunately, however, the council were in no condition to give orders. This worthy and sapient body had hitherto contrived to manage their affairs very comfortably, by referring in all cases of doubt and difficulty to decisions made in the reign of the late queen. But this case was quite unprecedented, and the illustrious lawgivers were consequently completely at a loss as to what was best to be done. Meanwhile, the enemy, who had no such scruples to contend with, entered the suburbs of London, and, attacking the Queen's Palace in Hammersmith Street, upon the banks of the Thames, would inevitably have taken Her Majesty prisoner, had not this fatal outrage been prevented by the courage and activity of Edmund Montague, a captain in the Queen's bodyguard, who had obtained his commission through the interest of the Queen's great-uncle, the old Duke of Cornwall, only a short time previously. This youthful hero luckily had command of the guard at the time of the enemy's attack, and by his decision and presence of mind he succeeded in animating his soldiers to defend the post committed to their charge till a body of regular troops under the duke of exeter a veteran officer of the late queen came to their relief and compelled the invader to retreat the duke of exeter was a good soldier and a sensible man he saw the danger of his country and, like another Washington, left his beloved retirement to save it from destruction. The counsellors of the Queen gladly submitted to his dictation. They felt their own weakness, and cheerfully gave up the reins of government to hands better qualified to guide them. The Queen was equally glad to escape all responsibility, and the Duke of Exeter, appointing young Montague, with whose conduct he had been much pleased, second in command, soon by a succession of vigorous and consistent measures, drove the enemy from the kingdom, their retreat indeed being hastened by the news Roderick received of an insurrection having broken out in Dublin during his absence. Whilst these intestine commotions were agitating England, the emperors of Greece and Germany, who had long envied the prosperity of the little sea-girt isle, took the opportunity of declaring war against it, and Claudia only found herself freed from domestic foes to contend with foreign ones. Her army, however, encouraged by success, professed themselves ready to encounter any enemy and they set off for Germany in high spirits under the command of General Montague, the Duke of Exeter's age and infirmities making him decline leaving England. The youthful general was the son of a baronet in the west of England, and rapid as his promotion had been at court, it was by no means greater than he deserved. His face and figure were such as the imagination delights to picture as a hero of antiquity, and his character accorded well with the majestic graces of his person. Haughty and commanding in his temper, ambition was his god, and the love of glory his strongest passion. Yet his very pride had a nobleness in it, and his soldiers loved, though they feared him. Very different was the character of his younger brother, Edric, whose romantic disposition and contemplative turn of mind often excited the ridicule of his friends. As usual in similar cases, the persecution he endured only wedded him more firmly to his peculiar opinions, and determined to sustain them with the constancy of a martyr, whilst he secluded himself from society, and despised the opinion of the world because he found it was against him, 
supposing himself capable of resisting every species of temptation, simply because, as yet, he had met with nothing adequate to tempt him. Older and more experienced persons have made the same mistake. Perhaps the striking difference perceptible in the character of these young men might be occasioned more by education than nature. Until the period of Edmund's obtaining his commission, they had both resided entirely at the country seat of their father, Sir Ambrose, where the care of their instruction was confided to Dr. Entwerfen, a German enthusiast, whom an unlucky propensity for trying experiments had banished from his native land. This philosopher, however, was unfortunately better skilled in the knowledge of the sciences than in that of the human heart, and the lofty spirit of Edmund, despising his control, soon sought a more congenial companion in Father Morris, confessor to the Duke of Cornwall, who resided in the neighborhood, and who, having been a warrior in his youth, was well calculated to sympathize with the feelings of a young aspirant for military glory. The confessor was an intelligent, well-informed man, and feeling flattered by the fondness Edmund showed for his society, he devoted all his leisure hours to the instruction of his young friend, leaving Dr. Entwerfen to occupy himself entirely with Edric, whose disposition accorded better with his own. Sir Ambrose was well satisfied with the change. Edmund was always his favorite son, and possessing the happy privilege of favorites, found no difficulty in persuading his father that whatever he preferred was the best and most prudent plan that could possibly have been adopted. He thus easily contrived in due time to get permission to enter the army, and being naturally ardent and enterprising, success had hitherto attended all his efforts. Country gentlemen have always been allowed to form a genus perfectly distinct from every other class of the community. There being something in the mere circumstance of a man's living entirely upon his own estate, which never fails to produce a peculiar effect upon the mind, an English squire is indeed almost a petty monarch, surrounded by his tenants and dependents, he rarely, except upon occasions of ceremony, meets with any superior or even equal to himself, and he becomes the son of his own system, around whom the doctor, the parson, and the lawyer of his village roll as attendant planets. Notwithstanding all the changes that had taken place in the political, moral, and religious state of England, this caste remained the same and Sir Ambrose was as warm in his feelings as hasty in his temper, and as violent in his prejudices as any of his predecessors. He was nevertheless far superior to the generality of his class, and amongst innumerable other good qualities was an indulgent master and an affectionate father. His foible, for alas, where shall we find a character without one, was a desire to show occasionally how implicitly he could be obeyed, though in general he was easy to a fault, and it was only when roused by opposition that the natural obstinacy of his disposition displayed itself. Edmund's military glory was flattering to his parental pride, and his eyes would glisten with delight at the bare mention of his darling's name. In common with most persons of his class, Sir Ambrose Montague considered regularity as a cardinal virtue, and his own habits as he was undeviating and exact as the machinery which performed the principal domestic operations in his mansion. Every day after dinner, at the same hour, he proceeded regularly to his library, where Abelard, an old butler who had grown gray in his service, as regularly presented him with a splendid hookah, which he smoked with infinite satisfaction. 
whilst Davis, his steward, reported all that had occurred relative to the affairs of the farm during the day, and received orders for all that was to take place during the morrow. One fine evening in June 2127, Davis was not listened to with the accustomed interest, and the smoke of the hookah, instead of being gently puffed out with its usual air of calm enjoyment, rose rapidly in volumes, or sank away entirely as Sir Ambrose appeared alternately excited by strong feeling or lost in meditation. Parental affection occasioned this unwanted agitation. Letters had been received from Edmund, announcing him to be upon the eve of battle with an army far superior to his own, and the impatience with which the doting father expected intelligence of the event may be easier imagined than described. Still, the force of habit prevailed, and the accustomed hour found him— with his faithful attendants, David and Abelard, at their usual posts in the library. The worthy baronet was above seventy, and his long white hair hung in waving curls upon his shoulders, as he sat in his comfortable elastic armchair, leaning one elbow upon the table before him. His features had been very handsome, and his complexion still retained that look of health and clearness, which, in a green old age, is the sure indication of a well-spent life. His countenance, though intelligent, was unmarked by the traces of any stormy passions. The cares and troubles of life seemed to have passed gently over him, and content had smoothed the wrinkles age might have made upon his brow whilst the tall, thin figure of Mr. Davis, as he stood reverentially bending forward his hat in his hand, and his whole demeanour expressing a singular mixture of preciseness and habitual respect, contrasted strongly with the dignified appearance of his master. The windows of the library opened to the ground, and looked out upon a fine terrace, shaded by a veranda, supported by trellis-work, round which twined roses mingled with vines. Below stretched a smiling valley, beautifully wooded, and watered by a majestic river winding slowly along, now lost amid the spreading foliage of the trees that hung over its banks, and then shining forth again in the light as a lake of liquid silver. Beyond rose hills majestically towering to the skies, their clear outline now distinctly marked by the setting sun. As it slowly sank behind them, shedding its glowing tints of purple and gold upon their heathy sides, whilst some of its brilliant rays even penetrated through the leafy shade of the veranda, and danced like summer lightning upon the surface of a mirror of polished steel, which hung directly in the face of Sir Ambrose. "'What a lovely evening!' exclaimed the worthy baronet, gazing with a delightful eye upon the rich landscape before him. "'Often as I have looked upon this scene, methinks every time I see it I discover some new beauty.' How finely the golden tint the sun throws upon the tops of those trees is relieved by the deep masses of shadow below. That was Edmund's favorite grove, poor fellow. And the anxious father sighed as he puffed his hookah. It is a fine evening, said Davis, bowing low, and, if your honor pleases, I think we had better get the steam-mowing apparatus in motion to-morrow. If the sun should be as hot to-morrow as it has been to-day, I am sure the hay will make without using the burning glass at all. Do as you like, Davis, returned his master, puffing the smoke violently from his pipe. I leave it entirely to you. And does not your honor think I had better give the barley a little rain? It will all be burnt up if this weather should continue." and if your honour approve it may be done immediately for i saw a nice black heavy-looking cloud sailing by just now and i can get the electrical machine out in five minutes to draw it down if your honour thinks fit 
I have already told you I give you permission to do as you like, Davis, returned the baronet, puffing out volumes of smoke from his hookah. Inundate the fields, if you will, so that you don't trouble me any more about the matter. But I would not wish to act without your honor's full conviction, resumed the persevering steward. Your honor must be aware of the aridity of the soil and the impossibility that exists of a proper development of the incipient heads unless they be supplied with an adequate quantity of moisture. You are very unreasonable, Davis, said Sir Ambrose. Most of your fraternity would be satisfied with being permitted to have their own way, but you— "'Excuse my interrupting, Your Honor,' cried Davis, bowing profoundly, "'but I cannot bear it to be thought that I was capable of persuading Your Honor "'to take any steps Your Honor might not thoroughly approve. "'Now, as to the Germanization and ripening—' "'My good fellow!' exclaimed Sir Ambrose, smiling at the energy with which Davis spoke." his thin figure waving backwards and forwards in the sunshine and his earnest wish to convince his master almost depriving his voice of its usual solemn and sententious tone my mind is too much occupied to think of these things now so i give you full and free liberty to burn dry or drown my fields as you may think fit empowering you to take all the necessary steps either to germinate or ripen corn upon any part of my estate only permitting that you do not trouble me upon the subject any longer and so good night this being spoken in a tone of voice davis did not dare to disobey he slowly retired apparently as much annoyed at having his own way as some people are at being contradicted when suddenly a brilliant flash of light gleamed on the baronet's polished mirror ha ah, what was that exclaimed sir ambrose starting up and dashing his pipe upon the ground he gazed eagerly upon the mirror for a few seconds in breathless anxiety bending forward in a listening attitude and daring not to stir as though he feared the slightest movement might destroy the pleasing illusion the flash was repeated again and again in rapid succession whilst a peal of silver bells began to ring their rounds in liquid melody thank god thank god exclaimed the aged baronet sinking upon his knees and clasping his hands together whilst the big tears rolled rapidly down his face my edmund has conquered my edmund is safe the faithful servants of sir ambrose followed the example of their master and for some minutes the whole party appeared lost in silent thanksgivings the silver bells still continuing their harmonious sweetness though in softer and softer strains till at last they gradually died away upon the ear sir ambrose started from his knees as the melody ceased and desiring abelard to summon edric and father morris who was then with the youthful philosopher in his study he rushed upon the terrace followed by davis to examine a telegraph placed upon a mount at a little distance so as to be seen from one end of it the light and music just mentioned being a signal always given when some important information was about to be transmitted subdued the germans and taken the whole of the fine province of france six six and four alas my failing eyes are too weak to see distinctly davies look i implore you the signal is changing before we have discovered its meaning for mercy's sake look before it is too late alas alas i had forgotten your eyes are as feeble as my own oh davis where is edric why is he not here to assist his poor old father at such a moment as this the sun had now sunk behind the hills and the shades of the evening were rapidly closing in as the baronet with straining eyes watched the various movements of the machine one two and six said he yes that signifies he has won the battle and is safe 
My heart told me so. When I saw the signal flash, my darling Edmund, two, four, and eight, he has... But Edric was otherwise engaged. After the departure of Edmund for the continent, the attention of Father Morris had been directed to his brother, and the mind of Edric, which had long craved for stronger food than it could obtain from the good-natured Dr. Entwerfen, expanded rapidly beneath the culture bestowed upon it. He had long been fond of abstract studies and visionary speculations, but they now formed the only pleasure of his existence, and he pursued them with an eagerness which made all the ordinary affairs of life appear tasteless and insipid. An idea suggested by Father Morris in one of their conferences as to the possibility of reanimating a dead body took forcible possession of his mind. His imagination became heated by long dwelling upon the same theme, and a strange, wild, undefinable craving to hold converse with a disembodied spirit haunted him incessantly. For some time he buried this feverish anxiety in his own breast, and tried in vain to subdue it. But it seemed to hang upon his steps, to present itself before him wherever he went, and, in short, to pursue him with the malignancy of a demon. "'You are so changed. I scarcely know you, and your eyes have a wild expression. Absolutely terrific!' "'I am, indeed, half-mad,' returned Edric, with a melancholy smile. "'And yet perhaps you will laugh when I tell you the reason of my uneasiness. "'To say truth, the conversation we had together the other day has occasioned it. "'You convinced me so clearly of the possibility of resuscitating a dead body "'that since that moment I have been tormented by an earnest desire "'to communicate with one who has been an inhabitant of the tomb. "'I would fain know the secrets of the grave "'and ascertain whether the spirit be chained after death "'to its earthly covering of clay, "'condemned till the day of final resurrection "'to hover over the rotting mass of corruption that once contained it.' or whether the last agonies of death free it from its mortal ties, and leave it floating, free as air, in the bright regions of ethereal space. I do, replied the pupil, but forgive me if I add, I do not feel satisfied with it. In fact, mine is not a character to be satisfied with building my faith upon that of any other man. I would see and judge for myself." "'I do not blame you,' resumed the Father Morris. "'A reasonable being should believe nothing he cannot prove, "'and to remove your doubts I would advise you to step into the adjoining churchyard, "'where you can try Dr. Entwerfen's galvanic battery of fifty surgeon power, "'which you must allow is surely enough to reanimate the dead upon a body, "'which then hold, hold!' cried Edric, shuddering. "'My blood freezes in my veins at the thought of a churchyard. "'Your words recall a horrible dream that I had last night, "'which even now dwells upon my mind "'and resists all the efforts I can make to shake it off.' "'Tell it, then,' said the confessor sternly. "'For when the imagination is possessed by horrible fantasies, "'it is relieved by speaking of them to another person.' "'I thought,' said Edric, that I was wandering in a thick, gloomy wood, through which I had the utmost difficulty to make my way. The black trees frowning in awful majesty above my head, twined together in masses so as almost to obstruct my path. Suddenly a fearful light flashed upon me, and I saw at my feet a horrid charnel-house, where the dying mingled terrifically with the dead, the miserable living wretches turned and writhed with pain, striving in vain to escape from the mass of putrescence heaped upon them. I saw their eyeballs roll in agony. I watched the distortion of their features, 
and making a violent effort to relieve one who had almost crawled to my feet i shrank back with horror as i found the arm i grasped soften to my touch and a disgusting mass of corruption give way beneath my fingers shuddering i awoke a cold sweat hanging upon my brows and every nerve thrilling with convulsive agony mere visionary terrors said the father you have suffered your imagination to dwell upon one subject till it is become morbid is it not strange continued edric apparently pursuing the current of his own thoughts that the mind should crave so earnestly what the body shudders at and yet how can a mass of mere matter which we sink into corruption the moment the spirit is withdrawn from it shudder how can it feel i can scarcely analyze my own sensations but it appears to me that two separate and distinct spirits animate the mass of clay which composes the human frame the one the merely vital spark which gives it life and motion and which we share in common with brutes and even vegetables and the other a divine ethereal spirit which we may properly term the soul and which is a direct emanation from god himself only bestowed upon man in my opinion said father morris the organs of thought reflection imagination and reason are material and as long as the body remains uncorrupted all may be restored provided circulation can be renewed for that i think the principle essential necessary to set the animal machine in motion i confess resumed edric we all know that circulation and the action of the lungs are inseparably connected and that if the latter be arrested death must ensue how frequently are apparently dead bodies recovered by friction which produces circulation and inflation of the lungs with air which restores their action if the idea be correct that the soul leaves the body the instant what we call death takes place how can these instances of resuscitation be accounted for think you that the soul can be recalled to the body after it has once quitted it or that it hovers over it in the air attached to it by invisible ligatures ready to be drawn back to its former situation when the body shall resume its vital functions it cannot surely remain in a dormant state and be reawakened with the body for this would be inconsistent with the very idea of an incorporeal spirit if you could overcome your childish reluctance to trying an experiment upon a corpse said father morris your doubts would be set at rest for if you could succeed in reanimating a dead body that had been long entombed so that it might enjoy its reasoning faculties in full perfection my opinion would be completely established but where shall i find a body which has been dead a sufficient time to prevent the possibility of its being only in a trance and which yet has not begun to decompose for even if i could conquer the repugnance i feel at the thought of touching such a mass of cold mortality as that presented in my dream according to your own theory the organs must be perfect or the experiment will not be complete what think you of trying to operate upon a mummy you know a chamber has been lately discovered in the great pyramid which is supposed to be the real tomb of cheops and where it is said the mummies of that great king and the principal personages of his household have been found in a state of wonderful preservation but mummies are so swathed up not those of kings and princes you know all travellers both ancient and modern who have seen them agree that they are wrapped merely in folds of red and white linen every finger and even every toe distinct thus if you could succeed in resuscitating cheops you need not even touch the body 
as the clothing in which it is wrapped would not at all encumber its movements. The idea is feasible, and, as you rightly say, if it can be put into execution, will set the matter at rest for ever. I should also like to visit the pyramids, those celebrated monuments of antiquity, whose origin is lost in the obscurity of the darker ages, and which seem to have been spared the, by the devastating hands of time, purposely to perplex the learned. Dr. Entwerfen had been present during the whole of this conversation, though he had been so busied with some of his philosophical experiments that he had not joined in it. Roused, however, by the word pyramid, he now started forward. "'You are right!' cried he with enthusiasm. "'They are, indeed, a mystery, which it has puzzled ages to develop. "'Go to Egypt, and I will accompany you. "'I feel an inward voice call me to the spot. "'Yes, we will explore these monuments, "'and who can tell but that we may be the favoured mortals "'destined to raise the mystic veil which so long has covered them.' We may be decreed to revive their mummies and force them to reveal the secrets of their prison house. It was Cheops raised the pyramids from the dust by science, and Cheops, by the force of science, shall be compelled to disclose their origin. I am glad, resumed Father Morris, to find the opinions of Dr. Entwerfen coincide so exactly with my own and that he will have the kindness to accompany your expedition. You will want a companion who can enter into your feelings and participate in your hopes. My monastic vows chain me to this spot, or I would gladly lend my humble aid to accomplish so valuable a discovery. Well, well, we can easily fancy that, cried Dr. Entwerfen impatiently. But though you can't go, we can, and, and, when shall we set off, Edric, dear? Stay, stay, replied Edric, smiling at the doctor's impetuosity. Though I own I should like to visit Egypt, yet there are many things to be considered before such an expedition can be undertaken. I must obtain my father's consent. I must hear... A gentle tap at the door interrupted Edric's argument, and made the doctor, whose nerves were rather susceptible, leap two or three yards in a fright, whilst Father Morris, with his usual air of calm composure, opened the door to the unwelcome intruder. It was old Abelard the butler, half ashamed of the unphilosophical terror he had evinced. The doctor felt glad to be able to hide his emotion under the appearance of anger, and demanded peevishly what was the matter. "'Have I not told you a hundred times,' continued he, "'that I do not like to be interrupted at my studies, and that nothing is more disagreeable than to have one's attention distracted when it has been fixed upon an affair of importance?' "'I do not attempt to controvert the axiom you have just propounded,' returned Abelard, speaking in a slow, precise manner, as though he weighed every syllable before he drawled it forth. "'For undeniable facts do not admit of contradiction. However, as the message with which I stand charged at the present moment relates to Master Edric,' and the Reverend Father Morris, instead of yourself. I humbly opine, no blame can attach itself to me, on account of the unpremeditated interruption of which you allege me culpable. "'And what have you to say to me?' demanded Edric. "'That the worthy gentleman, your respectable progenitor, requests you instantly put in exercise your locomotive powers,' to join him on the terrace to the end that there your superior visual faculties may afford soulagement to the mental anxiety under which he at present labors by aiding him to develop the intelligence conveyed to him by the telegraphic machine what exclaimed edric eagerly 
and then, without waiting a reply, he darted forward, and in a few seconds was by the side of his father, whilst Father Morris followed with nearly equal expedition. Abelard gazed after them with amazement. "'There is something very astonishing,' said he, addressing Dr. Entwerfen, "'in the effervescence of the animal spirits during youth. "'I labor under a complete catalepsy upon the subject. "'I should think it must arise from the excessive elasticity of the nerves. "'Ideas strike. "'But here, happening unfortunately to look up, "'he too was struck to find Dr. Entwerfen had also vanished.' and being unwilling to waste his eloquence upon the empty chair, he departed slowly and solemnly, however, according to his custom, to join the party assembled on the terrace. End of chapter 2, part 1 Chapter 3 Volume 1 of The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sally J. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century by Jane Loudon. Chapter 3, Volume 1. My dear Edric, exclaimed Sir Ambrose, throwing himself into the arms of his son. My dear, dear Edric, your brother has gained the battle. The Germans are completely overthrown. He has taken their king and several of their princes prisoners, and the fine province of France is cededly to us entirely. I am rejoiced to hear it, cried Edric, returning his father's embrace with emotion. And he, I hope, is safe? I hope so too, replied Sir Ambrose. Though he says nothing of himself, but you know, Edmund, our troops won this, our army gained that, the soldiers fought bravely. He never speaks of himself. To hear him relate a battle, nobody would imagine he had ever had anything to do with it. It is too dark for me to see any more, said Father Morris, who during this conversation had been watching the telegraph, and now turned from it in despair. The machine is still in motion, but it is too dark for me to decipher what it means. The attention of all present was directed to the sky as he spoke. It was indeed become of a pitchy blackness. A general gloom seemed to hang over the face of nature. The birds flew twittering from shelter. A low wind moaned through the trees, and in short, everything seemed to pretend a storm. Had we not better return to the house? said Dr. Endwarfen looking around with something like fear of these alarming indications, for his heated imagination had not yet quite recovered the effect of the awful speculations in which he had been so lately indulging. What is that black spot over there? I declare it moves! Good heavens! What can it be? Really, doctor, returned Abelard, you provoke the action of my risable faculties. That opaque body which you perceive at a little distance, and which seems to have occasioned such a fearful excitement of your nervous system, is only a living specimen of the corvus genus who has probably descended upon earth to scratch this vermicular repast. I beg your pardon, Mr. Ebelard, rejoined Mr. Davis, speaking with his usual precision, but according to my uh, humble apprehension, your labor under a slight mistake as to that particular. The feathered biped that has so forcibly attracted your attention appears to me not one of the corvi, but rather one of the gratuli, a variety of extremely rare occurrence in this vicinity, and which are sometimes called incendriae ivis, from their unfortunate propensity to put habitations into combustion by picking up small pieces of phlogisticated carbon and carrying them in their beaks to the combination of straw and other materials sometimes piled upon the apex of a house, to defend it from the inroads of pluviosity. It is of no use, sighed Sir Ambrose, still straining his eyes to endeavor to decipher the movements of the telegraph, the outlines of which now only appeared, stamped as if in jet 
and strongly relieved by the dark gray sky beyond. It is of no use, reiterated Father Morris, and the whole party were preparing to retire, when suddenly a vivid light flashed upon them from the hill, and instantly a long line of torches seemed to stream along the horizon. He is coming home, but will write more tomorrow, exclaimed the whole party simultaneously, for all knew well by experience the meaning of that signal. He is coming home, thank God, repeated Sir Ambrose, his pallid lips quivering and every limb trembling with agitation. Look to my father, cried Edric. He will faint. Oh, no, no, repeated Sir Ambrose. Thank God, thank God. Lean upon me at least, said Edric affectionately. Sir Ambrose complied and, supported by his son, gazed anxiously on the torches the red glare of which by shedding an unnatural light around them made the surrounding darkness only appear more intense. Thunder now growled in the distance and rain began to fall in large drops. Yet still Sir Ambrose stood with his eyes fixed upon the torches and no persuasions could induce him to leave the terrace. These wild fearful looking lights gleaming through the tempest seemed a connecting link between him and his darling son and it was not till they were obscured by a thick, heavy rain, and even in the outline of the telegraph vanished in the gathering clouds around, that he could be induced to seek for shelter. Sir Ambrose slept little that night. The sleep of his age, easily broken, and perhaps the joyful agitation of his spirits had produced a slight access of fever. He rose at the dawn, and long before the rest of his family had descended, summoned Abelard, that he might dispatch him to inform the Duke of Cornwall of the news, as Father Morris, on account of the storm, had passed the night at the house of Sir Ambrose. Go, said he, as soon as the drowsy butler had made his appearance. I am sure the Duke feels nearly as great an interest in the success of Edmund as myself, and will not be displeased if he is disturbed a little earlier than usual upon such an occasion. I obey, replied Abelard. I will shake off my somnolent propensities and speed with the velocity of the electric fluid to the castle of the noble chieftain. Take heed you do not forget your message, by the way, repeated Sir Ambrose, smiling. Not all the waters of Letha could wash such significant tidings from my memory, replied the butler. Your honor's words are imprinted upon the mnemonic organ of my brain, and my sensorium must be divided from my cerebellum ere they can be effaced. The Duke of Cornwall had been an intimate friend of Sir Ambrose almost from infancy. They had been companions at school and at college, besides which, peculiar circumstances which had happened in their youth, had linked them together in indissoluble in ties. What these circumstances were, however, no one exactly knew except the parties concerned, and they always avoided alluding to them. All that was generally understood upon the subject being that Sir Ambrose had, in some manner, been instrumental in saving the Duke's life, but how, when, or where was never clearly explained. The Duke of Cornwall was of the royal family of England and closely allied to the throne. His father had been the brother to that prince who had so steadfastly refused the crown when it was offered to him by the ambassadors from the people. And as that prince had left no male descendants, the duke might be considered as legitimately entitled to reign. The thought of disturbing by his claims the female dynasty now established had, however, never entered into his mind. For having taken into his head that he would marry his daughter Elvira to Edmund Montagu and his niece Rosabella to Edric, he turned all his thoughts, plans, and wishes to the accomplishment of his object and suffered no other idea to interfere with it. Like most persons living in complete retirement, the Duke was exceedingly fond of petty mysteries and needless maneuvers, and he wasted as much iniquity as many contrivances over this scheme as might, if differently applied, have sufficed to overturn a kingdom. It was true. The interest of the plot was somewhat spoiled by the fear that the instant he made known his intentions, everyone would be delighted to comply with them. Yet, still as long as it was kept secret, it was a plot, and it was the best the duke could muster. He resolved to make the most of it. 
For this purpose, he had made Father Morris his confidant, and held long private conferences every day with him upon the subject. The Duke was now completely happy. He had not only something to plan and something to think about, but he had also had someone to oppose, for Father Morris's opinions as to the dispositions of young people was diametrically opposite to his own. He thinking the strong mind and haughty spirit of Rosabella better suited to the ambitious Edmund, whilst the soft yielding disposition and feminine graces of Elvira seemed to harmonize exactly with the taste of the philosophic Edric. No persuasions, however, could induce the Duke to deviate in the slightest degree from his design. Like many of the higher classes of society in the days of universal education, he affected an excessive plainness and simplicity in his language, so much so, indeed, as sometimes almost to degenerate into rudeness, in order that it might be clearly distinguished from the elaborate and scientific expressions of the vulgar. And when urged by his confessor upon the subject of these intended marriages, he would roughly say, Don't talk to me. There is nothing like a little contradiction in the married life. If two people were to live together, who were always of the same opinion, they would die of ennui in six months. No, no, I'm right and so they'll find it in the end. He would then shake his head and put on such a look of positive determination that Father Morris would generally retire in silence, feeling it perfectly in vain to attempt to alter his resolution. As to consulting the inclinations of the young people themselves, the idea never entered his imagination. Children don't know what is good for them, he would reply sharply, if such a thought were suggested to him, and it is the duty of the parents and guardians to decide in such matters. The duke had already risen and was in his garden when the messenger of Sir Ambrose arrived, panting for breath and quite exhausted by the velocity, as he expressed it, which he had employed in endeavoring to execute with the utmost expedition the wishes of his master. The duke was surprised to see him. What brings you out so early, Abelard? demanded he. Oh, your grace, replied the butler, gasping for utterance. The haste I have made has impeded my respiration, and the blood, finding the pulmonary artery free, rushes with such force along the arterial canal to the aorta that, that I am in imminent danger of being suffocated. Psh, said the duke. Besides, continued Abelard, a saline secretion distills from my every pore of my skin in a serious transudation from the excessive exertions I have made use of. And what has occasioned these violent exertions? The earnest desire experienced by Sir Ambrose to transmit with all expedition possible to your grace the intelligence that he had just received from the acquisition of a victory by Master Edmund in the hostile territory of Germany. Victory! shouted the Duke. Victory! Rosabella! Elvira! Where are you, girls? Here's tidings to rouse you from your slumbers. And how is he, Abelard? Is the brave boy safe himself? God bless him! Victory will be nothing to us if we are to lose him. It occasions me excessive chargon, replied Abelard, that I am totally unable to resolve that integratory to your grace's complete satisfaction. Taciturnity, however, upon some subject is, I believe, generally considered synonymous with prosperity, and, as Master Edmund, to the best of my credence, conveyed no information relative to his sanity in the communication made by him to his paternal ancestor. I humbly opine that there are no reasonable grounds for supposing it su has suffered any material deterioration in consequence of the late sanguinary encounter in which he had been engaged. The duke had not patience to wait the conclusion of this speech, but hobbled away as fast as his infirmities would permit, vociferating for Elvira and Rosabella in a voice that might have silenced Stenter. And Abelard, finding himself alone, was fain to his example, marveling as he went along at the excessive impatience and fiery spirits of age, which would not permit people to remain stationary, even to hear what he called a compendious replication to the very questions which they themselves had propounded. Whatever faults might fail to share of the Duke of Cornwall, that of a cold heart was certainly not amongst the number, and the delight he felt on hearing of Edmund's triumph 
could not have been greater if the youthful hero had been his own son. His eyes, indeed, absolutely sparkled with transport when he communicated the intelligence to his niece and daughter, and his tidings were not bestowed upon insensible ears, for the breasts of both his youthful auditors throbbed with pleasure at the news. Elvira had been the idol of Edmund's homage from her childhood, and she fancied she returned his passion with equal fervor. But she deceived herself, and love was as yet a stranger to her heart. Endowed with a great beauty and superior talents, accustomed from her earliest infancy to be worshipped by all around her, surrounded by flatterers, till even flattery had lost its charm, Elvira had yet never loved. Why she had not, we leave to the philosophers to explain. We merely state facts and leave the others to draw conclusions. Rosabella's character was much more easy to decipher than that of her cousin. Passion was the essence of her existence, and her dark eyes flashed a fire that bestowed an intensity of her feelings. She loved Edmund, but though she loved him with all that overwhelming violence, which only a soul like hers could feel, yet she would not have scrupled to sacrifice even him to her revenge, if she had thought he had treated her with neglect or contempt. She scorned the opinion of the world, and regarded mankind in general, but as slaves, whom she had honored by trampling beneath her feet. Ambition was leading her passion, and even her love for Edmund struggled in vain for mastery against it. This feeling was how highly gratified by the tidings of Edmund's victory. She triumphed in his glory, and a deeper glow burnt upon her cheek from the proud consciousness she felt that she had not placed her affections upon an unworthy object. "'We have no time to lose, girls,' said the Duke. "'I would not miss being with Sir Ambrose when he receives this letter for the kingdoms. "'Here, Hippolyte, Augustus, get a balloon ready. Let us be off directly. "'How tedious these fellows are!' They might have removed a church and steeple in the time they have wasted about a balloon. If your grace would have a moment, patience, said the Hippolyte, holding the cords of the balloon. But his grace had no patience. It was an ingredient nature that had quite forgotten to put into his composition. And, without waiting for an ascending ladder to be put down, he sprang into the car in such haste, the moment the balloon was brought to the door, that he was in imminent danger of oversetting it. So... So, he said, very well, that will do. And now, girls, that you are safely embarked, we will be off. Hippolyte, will you steer us? And Abelard, go into the buttery and let my fellows give you something to eat. You will want something after your fatigues. There, there, that will do. Don't let us hinder a moment. And the rest of his speech was lost in the air as the balloon floated majestically away. It has often appeared very astonishing to me, said Abelard, after watching the balloon till it was out of sight, to observe how partial great people are generally to an aerial mode of traveling. For my part, I think the pedestrian manner infinitely more agreeable. De gustibus non est disputandum, replied Augustus, the duke's footman, to whom this observation was addressed. But I think I observe symptoms of lassitude about you, Mr. Abelard. Will you not adjourn to the apartment of Mrs. Russell, our housekeeper, to repair, by some elementary refreshment, the excessive exhaustion you have sustained in the course of your morning exertions? Willingly, Mr. Augustus, I own candidly, I feel I want of a little wholesome nutrition. I shall, besides, be extremely happy to avail myself of the opportunity fortune so benignly presents of paying my respect to Mrs. Russell, whom I have not seen in three three days. The worthy housekeeper was equally rejoiced with Abelard at this instant of fortune's benignity, a sort of sentimental flirtation having been going on between them for at least thirty years. She accordingly stroked down her snow-white apron, readjusted her mob cape, and smoothed her gray hairs, which were divided upon her forehead with the most scrupulous exactness, before she advanced to welcome her visitor. "'What will you take, my dear Abelard?' she said, as soon as he was within hearing. "'What can you fancy?' "'I have a delicious corner of cold venison pasty in the pantry.' Words are altogether too feeble to express the transports of my gratitude at receiving so gracious an alcalade, beautitious Eloisa, replied the romantic butler, for thus an allusion to his own name was he wont to call her. 
But though you had only the rigors of the parrot's sleet to invite to me, instead of the comforts of your well-stored pantry, still would words be wanting to express the feelings of my bosom thus again beholding you. Spare my blushes, said Mrs. Russell, casting her eyes upon the ground and playing with the corner of her apron. I feel a rosate sufficient glow upon my cheeks as your flattering accents strike upon the tympanium of my auricular organs. Oh, Mrs. Russell, sighed Abelard, gazing upon her tenderly, and then, after a short pause, he continued. As to the ailments with which your provident kindness would solage my appetite, though venison be a wholesome viand and was reckoned by the ancients officious in preventing fevers, and though the very mention of the savoury paste makes my aperte usually employed in secreting the mucus of my tongue erect themselves, thereby occasioning an overflow of the saliva, yet I will deny myself the indulgence and content myself simply with a boiled egg, as being more likely to agree with the present enfeebled state of the digestive organs of my stomach. You shall have it instantly, cried Mrs. Russell. And will you have the kindness to superintend the culinary arrangement of it yourself, rejoined Abelard? I do not like the albumen too much coagulated, and I prefer it without any betracious oil, simply flavored by the addition of a small quantity of common muriate of soda. The egg was soon prepared and devoured. Thank you, thank you, dear Mrs. Russell, said Abelard. This refraction was most acceptable, and I had felt for some time the gastric juice corroding the coats of my stomach, and still, though I have now given it some solid substance to act upon, I think it would be amiss to dilute its very virulence with the addition of a little fluid. Have you anything cool and refreshing? I have some bottled beer, replied Mrs. Russell but I am afraid the carbonic acid gas has not been sufficiently disengaged during the process of the venous fermentation to render it wholesome. And there is scarcely any alcohol in the whole composition. That is exactly what I want, said Abelard, for my physicians have expressively forbidden stimulants. Provided the gluten that forms a germ was properly separated in the preparation of the malt and the seed sufficiently germinated to cover the fescula into sugar, I shall be perfectly satisfied. I can guarantee the accuracy of its preparation both with regard to the malt and the beer, repeated Mrs. Russell. And the frothing liquid soon sparkled in a goblet, to the infinite satisfaction of the thirsty butler, who after a hearty drought vowed nectar itself was never half so delicious, and that all the gods on Olympus would envy him, if they could, but taste his fare and see the blooming Hebe that was his cupbearer. End of chapter 3, volume 1. Chapter 4 of The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. By Jane Loudon, Volume One, Chapter Four. When the balloon of the Duke approached the habitation of Sir Ambrose, its occupiers perceived the worthy baronet walking with hasty strides towards the mount of the telegraph, which commanded an extensive view of the surrounding country, followed by Edric, Father Morris, and Doctor Entwerfen, who appeared vainly endeavouring to persuade him to relax a speed so little suited to his advanced years. "'Talk not to me of going slowly when I expect news of my darling, Edmund,' exclaimed Sir Ambrose, continuing his rapid pace, his heart beating with paternal pride and his countenance beaming with exultation. "'I am also anxious to hear of my brother,' said Edric. "'But after the information we have already received by the telegraphic dispatch, it appears to me that we have little more to learn of importance. "'Edric, you are not a father, and you can have no idea of a father's anxiety,' replied Sir Ambrose hurrying on to the mount as though he hoped the rapidity of his motion would afford some relief to the impatience of his mind, whilst the party of the duke, seeing the point to which he was hastening, opened the valves of their balloon and made preparations to descend upon the same spot. The duke and Sir Ambrose were always glad to meet, but as the present occasion was one of more than ordinary interest, so they now greeted each other with more than ordinary pleasure. The duke had always been warmly attached to Edmund, and his voice actually trembled with agitation as he exclaimed, Well, my old friend, you see your brave boy is determined to keep us alive still. 
our blood would stagnate in our veins if he did not give us a fillip now and then to rouse us but what does the young rogue say of himself i hope he's not wounded he never mentions himself replied sir ambrose tears glistening in his eyes as he pressed the hand of his friend warmly in his own edmund loves his country too devotedly to think of himself when he is engaged in her service well well it is all right cried the duke he is a brave boy that is certain sir ambrose did not reply for he had now reached the summit of the mount and was too eagerly looking around in every direction to attend to his friend's remark in those days the ancient method of conveying the post having been found much too slow for so enlightened a people an ingenious scheme had been devised by which the letters were put into balls and discharged by steam cannon from place to place every town and district having a piece of toile metallique or woven wire suspended in the air so as to form a kind of net to arrest the progress of the ball and being provided with a cannon to send it off again when the letters belonging to that neighborhood should have been extracted whilst to prevent accident the mail post letter balls were always preceded by one of a similar description made of thin wood with a hole in its side which collecting the wind as it passed along made a kind of whizzing noise to admonish people to keep out of the way the mount on which sir ambrose now stood commanded an extensive view and the scene it presented was beautiful in the extreme on one side innumerable grass fields richly wooded and only divided from each other by invisible iron fences appeared like one vast park whilst on the other the waving corn its full heads beginning to darken in the sun gave a rich glowing tint to the landscape but sir ambrose thought not of the prospect he did not even see the murmuring brooks and shady groves the smiling vales and swelling hills that constituted its beauty no his attention was wholly occupied by a small black spot he had just discovered on the edge of the horizon in breathless anxiety his eyes almost starting from their sockets he bent eagerly forwards gazing on this small and at first almost imperceptible speck it gradually grew larger and larger it rapidly approached and in a few seconds a slight noise buzzed through the air as the long expected balls whizzed past him sir ambrose's agitation was excessive with trembling limbs and livid lips he hurried to the nearest station which luckily was close at hand and round which several of his household were assembled in their impatience to hear the news sir ambrose could not speak but the person whose province it was to sort the letters guessed his errand and opening the bag held forth the ardently expected treasure gasping for breath sir ambrose eagerly attempted to take it but his hands were unequal to the task the violence of his emotion overpowered him and after a short but fruitless struggle he fell senseless on the ground the confusion produced by this unexpected incident was indescribable the old duke walked up and down wringing his hands and exclaiming what shall we do what will become of us whilst the rest of the party endeavoured to give assistance to sir ambrose parental affection said davis who had an unfortunate propensity for making long speeches precisely at the moment when nobody was likely to attend to him parental affection has been universally allowed by all writers both ancient and modern to be one of the strongest passions of the soul and the most exalted instances might be produced of the surprising energy of this universal sentiment for heaven's sake help me to raise my father cried eric give him air or he will die patience continued davis is necessary in all things and is perhaps one of the most useful and estimable qualities of life it enables us to bear without shrinking the bitterest evils that can assail us without patience philosophy would never have made those wonderful discoveries that subjugate nature to our yoke fetch me some water exclaimed edric or he will expire before your eyes it appears to me said a laborer who had been mending a steam digging machine in a neighboring field and who now stood leaning upon his work and looking on gravely at all that passed without attempting to offer the least assistance it appears to me that it would be highly improper to administer the aqueous fluid in its natural state of frigidity under the existing circumstances the present suspension of animation under which sir ambrose labors is evidently occasioned by want of circulation now as it is the property of hot liquors rather than cold ones to supply the stimulant necessary for the reproduction of circulation i opine that hot water would answer the purpose better than cold in the meantime father morris had brought some water from a neighboring fountain 
and throwing it on the patient's face, Sir Ambrose opened his eyes. For some moments he stared wildly around him, but as soon as he began to recollect what had passed, he implored Father Morris to give him his ardently desired letter. You are not yet equal to reading it, said Father Morris compassionately. I fear the exertion will be too much for you. Oh, give it me, give it me, exclaimed the poor old man. If a spark of mercy remain in your soul, do not keep me in this agony. It was impossible to resist the tone of real anguish that accompanied these words, and Father Morris put the letter into his hands. Sir Ambrose took it eagerly, though he trembled so that he could scarcely break the seal. At last he tore it open and gazed at its contents, but he could not read a word. He dashed away his tears and rubbed his eyes impatiently. All was in vain. The writing was still illegible. Read, read, cried he in a voice trembling with agitation. For heaven's sake, read. Will no one have pity on me? Father Morris took the letter and read it aloud, whilst Sir Ambrose sate, his eyes raised to heaven, his hands clasped together, and the tears rolling down his aged cheeks, listening to his words and drinking in every syllable. After giving a circumstantial account of the battle and assuring his father that he had not been wounded, Edmund proceeded thus. The queen has written me a letter of approbation in her own hand and has been graciously pleased to signify her intention of honoring me with a triumphal entry into London. She has likewise conferred upon me letters of nobility. The goodness of my sovereign makes a deep impression upon my breast. But for the rest, I assure you that neither the applauses of the multitude nor the privilege of writing the Lord before my name can afford a moment's satisfaction to a heart that pants only for the pleasure of seeing again those most dear to it. Nor shall I enjoy my triumph unless those I love be present to give it zest. I congratulate you, my dear sir, exclaimed Father Morris as soon as he had finished. I congratulate you from my inmost soul. Go to his triumph, exclaimed the Duke, rubbing his hands in ecstasy. Yes, yes, that we will, won't we, my old friend? God bless him. I'm glad he is not hurt, though. And so you see, in spite of all his glory, he can't be happy without us. How prettily he says that. Not all the approbation of my sovereign, the praises of the people, nor, nor, what is it? I don't remember the exact words, but I know the sense was that he couldn't be happy without us. And God bless him. I'm sure I'm as happy as he can be at the thought of seeing him. Sir Ambrose could not reply, but the tears ran down his aged cheeks like rain, as his heart breathed a silent offering of thanksgiving to the Almighty Being, who had thus bestowed victory upon his son, and his lips murmured some inarticulate sounds of transport, whilst Elvira and Rosabella mingled their tears with his, for joy often becomes painful and seeks for a relief by grief. The party now slowly returned to the mansion of Sir Ambrose, so completely occupied in discussing Edmund's letter as to be totally unaware that Edric had not accompanied them. Yet such was the case. The youthful philosopher's heart had swelled almost to bursting, as he had listened to the reading of his brother's letter, and he now rushed into a thick wood, shelving down to a romantic stream which formed part of the pleasure grounds of Sir Ambrose. Almost without knowing where he was going, Edric plunged amongst the trees and threw himself upon a grassy bank under their shade, upon the border of the rivulet. The gentle murmuring of the water gave a delightful sense of refreshing coolness, particularly agreeable from the burning heat of the day, and Edric lay, his eyes fixed upon the sparkling waves as they danced in the sunbeams, with both his hands pressed firmly upon his throbbing temples, endeavoring in vain to analyze the new and strange emotions that struggled for mastery in his bosom. By degrees he became more calm, and though his heart still beat with feelings he could not quite explain, he felt soothed by the softly gliding streamlet, and the stormy passions of his breast seemed lulled to tranquility, as one hand fell carelessly down by his side, and the other merely supported the head it no longer strained. It was not envy that occasioned Edric's emotions, but shame and indignation burnt in his bosom when he recollected that he was wasting his days in comparative obscurity, whilst his brother, only a few years older than himself, was ennobling the name bequeathed to him by his ancestors. And cannot I also become famous? thought he, his heart swelling with emulation. Though I abhor the profession of a soldier, are not other ways open to me of attaining eminence? Why should I not exert myself? I will remain in indolence no longer. I too will prove myself worthy of my forefathers, 
and show the world that the exalted blood of the Montagues has not degenerated in my veins. His eyes sparkled with the thought, and he half raised himself, as though eager to put it into immediate execution. A moment's reflection, however, restored him to himself, and he could not help smiling at his own folly. And yet I call myself a philosopher, he thought. Alas, alas, how little do we know ourselves? For after all, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake is the only employment worthy of a man of sense, and the transitory applause of the multitude it is beneath him to accept. Nature is the goddess I adore, and if it should be granted to me to explore her secrets, I shall be the happiest of mankind. But why should I pass my life in anxious cravings never destined to be realized? The events of today have only proved clearly the little value my society is of to my father. He is too much occupied with my brother to even think of me, and were I absent, I should soon be forgotten. Why, then, should I not travel and satisfy these restless wishes that gnaw at my heart and poison every pleasure? I was not born to rest contented with the dull routine of domestic life, and I detest hypocrisy. I will seek my father, and, explaining my real sentiments, set off for Egypt immediately. Satisfied with this resolution, Edric rose and walked hastily towards his father's mansion, with all the inward vigor which the consciousness of having made up one's mind is certain to bestow, and which, perhaps, is one of the most agreeable sensations that can be experienced by the human mind, as that of suspense or indecision is undoubtedly one of the most unpleasant. Eric found his father and the duke busily engaged in consulting upon their intended journey, which was an event in both their lives. For as, since the universal adoption of balloons, journeys were performed without either trouble or expense, the rich had lost all inducement to undertake them, and it was rare for a man of rank to quit his family mansion unless he had some post at court. I have a palace in London, said the duke, which I hope you will make your home, though it has been so long unused that I doubt whether it will be fit for your reception. Do not distress yourself about making arrangements for my family, replied Sir Ambrose. There will be only Edric and myself, and we can make shift with anything. Indeed, I shall not consent to any such arrangement, said Elvira, who now entered the room with Rosabella and Clara Montague, the orphan niece of the baronet, who had been brought up in his family. What has Clara done that she is to be excluded from the party? Oh, Clara is too young to think of such things, returned Sir Ambrose, smiling. Not she, cried the duke. I'll engage for it. Are you my pretty rosebud, continued he, drawing the smiling, blushing girl to his knee. Shouldn't you like to go to London, eh? Oh, yes, cried Clara, with all the eagerness and innocence of fifteen, for that was her age. Very much indeed, if my uncle has no objection. My dear Sir Ambrose, said Elvira, coaxingly, do pray indulge us. Well, well, we shall see, replied the good-humoured baronet, smiling. Thank you, thank you, my dear, dear uncle, cried Clara, flying to him and almost smothering him with kisses. But I have not consented yet, you know. No, but I'm sure you will. You look so good-natured. Go, go, you are a little coaxing puss. But why did you not come home last night, Clara? My nurse was so ill and it rained so. Besides, you know, uncle, you gave me leave to stop if I liked. Well, well, I believe I did. It was of no great consequence. You are always safe under the care of Mrs. Robson. She is a very respectable woman. I hope she's better. Oh, she'll soon be well now. I'm going to tell her of Edmund's victory. And she said yesterday, if she could but hear that he had conquered, it would cure her if she were dying. Off with you then, said Sir Ambrose, laughing. You are always on the wing. And hark ye, you may tell your nurse also that you are going to London. Clara's delight and gratitude were unbounded and she sprang away like a young fawn to tell her nurse the joyful news, while Elvira's eyes sparkled with pleasure, as she thanked Sir Ambrose warmly for his kindness. The duke was also highly gratified. You must bring Abelard and Davis also, said he, for I am sure you won't be happy without them. Sir Ambrose owned he should not, and the duke, being like most people who lead dull, monotonous lives, quite delighted with an event that promised a little change, bustled off followed by his fair companions, fully determined to make the most of it. Edric's heart throbbed violently when he found himself alone with his father. The moment was arrived he had been so ardently wishing for, and yet he was silent. 
he had scarcely had patience to wait the end of his father's conference with the duke and whilst it had lasted he had been arranging and rearranging a thousand times in his mind the phrases he meant to make use of yet now they seemed to have all vanished from his memory and he stood gazing through the open window his mind feeling a perfect chaos and without being able to recollect one single word of what he had determined to say after continuing for some time in this state of irresolution he was suddenly startled by his father's exclaiming well edric my dear boy i am very glad i have an opportunity of speaking to you alone as i have something of importance to communicate the voice of sir ambrose sounded harsh and abrupt in the ears of his son and edric felt incapable of uttering a single word in reply what is the matter cried sir ambrose after a short pause surely you are not ill edric my dear boy do speak shall i send for dr coleman oh no no cried edric faintly i am not ill i assure you what is the matter then resumed sir ambrose impatiently perhaps you want some new philosophical instrument and you don't like to ask for it because you know the low state of my finances but don't distress yourself on that account for you are going to marry a rich wife and then you can indulge yourself with anything you like marry cried edric in alarm yes returned his father the duke has just most generously proposed that you shall marry rosabella and that he will give her a fortune equal to what he gives alvira but i do not love rosabella and nothing shall induce me to marry her i should be utterly miserable even to think of it not marry rosabella exclaimed sir ambrose in the utmost astonishment indeed i cannot i am convinced she would make me wretched for our tempers don't assimilate and we should both be miserable i should be very sorry to cause either you or the duke a moment's uneasiness but in an affair like this which concerns the happiness of my whole life don't talk to me sir cried sir ambrose in a violent passion i won't hear a word sir not a syllable my son shall obey my orders go to your room sir and prepare to marry rosabella immediately or never expect to see my face again my dear father said edric attempting to take sir ambrose's hand away sir cried the baronet shaking him off obedience far outweighs words if i am your dear father you will act in compliance with my wishes and if you do not it is a mockery to call me dear i cannot marry rosabella was ever such obstinacy such folly the world will think you distracted i care not for the world cried edric impatiently but you must care for the world the world must not be slighted and as long as you live in it you must conform to its opinions i do not like to hear people say they don't care for the world when people pretend to scorn it it is generally because they have done something to make it scorn them but my dear father you would not wish me to sacrifice my conscience to its dictates and pray sir what has your conscience to do with the matter in question should i not sacrifice it by marrying a woman i feel i could never love in my opinion nothing can be more sacred than the marriage vow and with what feelings could i enter into this solemn engagement in the presence of almighty god calling upon him to witness it when i knew my heart was at variance with my words my soul would recoil with horror at such blasphemy you talk about your conscience edric but should you not rather say your inclinations the person of rosabella does not please your fancy i suppose and to gratify a capricious whim you would destroy the happiness of your father and ruin your own prospects forever it is not of the person of rosabella that i complain i allow her to be beautiful as a venus and that her talents even exceed her personal charms but when i see her dark eyes flashing fury and her lips curved into an expression of pride hatred or scorn i forget her beauty and think only of the fearful passions of her soul your objections are futile edric at any rate they are of no avail you must marry her i am sorry it is against your inclination but i will not have my authority disputed however as i have always been an indulgent father i do not wish you to decide hastily and i give you four and twenty hours to make up your mind at the expiration of which time you shall marry rosabella or quit my house forever no reply young man i won't hear a word it was in vain to attempt a reply and edric left his father's presence oppressed by that strange mysterious presentiment of evil which like a fearful cloud dark gloomy 
and impenetrable sometimes hangs upon our thoughts foreboding horrors though so dimly and indistinctly that like the gigantic phantoms we sometimes fancy through the mist of twilight their terrors seemed increased tenfold by the very uncertainty that half shrouds them from our sight mingled with these feelings was one of wild unearthly joy driven from his father's house he would be free to travel his doubts might be satisfied he might at last penetrate into the secrets of the grave and partake without restraint of the so ardently desired fruit of the tree of knowledge nothing would then be hidden from him nature would be forced to yield up her treasure to his view her mysteries would be revealed and he would become great omniscient and godlike his mind filled with a chaos of thoughts like these which he strove in vain to arrange and which seemed to swell his brain almost to bursting edric sought the study of dr entwerfen to inform his worthy tutor of the change a few short hours had wrought in his destiny end of chapter four of volume one volume one chapter five of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon, Volume 1, Chapter 5 Why did you not join with your cousin in inviting Clara Montague to go with us to London? said the Duke to Rosabella. As their balloon proceeded homewards, I thought the humility of my situation rendered it improper, returned Rosabella with an affected air of modesty. It surely would be wrong for a poor dependent like myself to take the liberty of inviting guests to the house of her patron. Rosabella, you know I can't bear to hear you talk so ridiculously. I hate to hear of your dependent situation and humility and nonsense. We all know that you are not humble. You are as proud as Lucifer. And, as to dependence, I never make any distinction between you and Elvira. You are my daughters whilst I live, and shall be my heiresses when I die. Ay, and perhaps before I die. But you'll see. I am sure my cousin did not mean to offend you, sir, said Elvira. She loves you tenderly, and— A propos de bot, exclaimed the duke. What letter was that which I saw you receive this morning? It was from Edmund, replied Elvira, trembling and blushing as she drew it from her bosom and gave it to her father. In case of Claudia's death, Elvira and Rosabella were the next heiresses to the throne. And, as neither had attained the age which would prevent their being eligible candidates, they had not the least idea the duke would wish them to marry until after that period. Thus both earnestly regarded the duke as he perused the epistle, which Elvira knew, and Rosabella suspected, breathed only love, and both expected a torrent of rage when he had concluded it. To their infinite surprise, however, he folded it up, and— putting it into his pocket, merely told Elvira that he wished a private conference with her in his library as soon as they reached home. Poor Elvira turned pale at the mention of the library, for when aught went wrong in the duke's household it was there he was accustomed to lecture the unfortunate offender, and there Elvira herself had often trembled in her childhood. In short, the place was associated in her mind with only disagreeable recollections, and, anticipating nothing pleasant connected with it, she sat completely absorbed in a gloomy silence. Rosabella seemed equally disinclined for conversation. Though the conduct of her uncle was quite different from what she had expected, her active mind had already suggested a thousand explanations for it, each less consonant to her judgment than her wishes. His letter must have been one of mere friendship, and it is possible that he does not love her, thought she, whilst, as the idea flashed across her mind, she turned eagerly to Elvira, 
to read its confirmation in her countenance. But alas, those timid downcast looks and those glowing cheeks told but too plainly a tale that drove Rosabella to distraction. Scarcely had the balloon stopped when she sprang from the car and rushed to her own room in a state little short of madness, whilst Elvira, with a beating heart, followed her father to the library. Rosabella was met at the entrance to her apartments by her favorite attendant, Marianne, who had lived with her from childhood, and who governed her with a despotic sway. It is strange, but the most haughty people are generally the most submissive slaves to those who have acquired power over them, and the proud-spirited female who would spurn indignantly all control from her titled relatives— will obey implicitly, nay, almost servilely, the wishes of a favorite servant. Thus it was with Rosabella. Marianne was perfectly aware of her power, and she occasionally used it tyrannically. But on the present occasion she was really alarmed at the glowing cheeks, flashing eyes, and agitated frame of Rosabella, and asked with an appearance of deep interest if she were ill. Rosabella did not speak, but throwing herself upon a sofa, hid her face in both her hands. "'What is the matter?' asked Marianne, gazing at her with astonishment. "'He loves her. He adores her,' cried Rosabella, starting from her couch and transversing the room rapidly. "'Curse on her beauty! Oh, that a look of mine could wither it!' or that she could feel the burning fire that rages here. Then, stopping suddenly, she gazed upon her attendant with the wildness of a maniac, and pressing her hand firmly against her side, threw herself upon her couch, exclaiming, Oh, Marianne, why am I not beloved like Elvira? And are you certain that she is beloved? Certain, reiterated Rosabella, wringing her hands. Alas, alas, were I not so certain, but can I doubt the evidence of my senses? This day, this very day, she has received a letter from him. I saw a blush of conscious pleasure glow upon her cheeks, and I could have stabbed her to the heart, yes, and exulted in her dying agonies, triumphed in her groans. <sighs> Marianne! Is it not extraordinary that one so great, so noble, and so exalted as Edmund can love such a poor, weak, feeble being as Elvira? But she loves him not, at least not as he should be loved. She is incapable of it. I think she is. And that though he now admires her beauty, yet when he discovers the feebleness of her soul, he must despise her. But he is so blinded that he fancies her very false perfections. That blindness cannot continue. When Edmund knew Elvira, he had seen nothing of the world, and people thus situated, who have warm imaginations, generally amuse themselves by conjuring up an idol of perfection, to which they attach all kinds of merit, probable or improbable. They invest the first face or figure that takes their fancy with these imagined charms, no matter whether they accord or not, and then fall in love with the image they have created, whilst the delusion under which they labor makes them see every action of the beloved object under a false light. Just as people wearing green spectacles fancy the whole creation tinged with emerald, Intercourse with the world dispels these visions, and when Edmund returns he will be as one awakening from a dream. He will look in vain for the charms which once bewitched him. Oh, that you may be right, but yet I fear, fear nothing. Edmund will return quite changed. Though in reality he has been absent only a few months, he will have acquired more knowledge of the world than in all his previous life. He will now know himself, and will feel that he wants a companion in a wife, one that can enter into his views, participate in his wishes, and, if necessary, aid him in his plans. 
Then will he be able to properly estimate your character, and, despising the feeble Elvira, he will lay his heart and hand humbly at your feet. Alas, alas, were even this nattering vision realized, it would be then too late. Too late? What mean you? That even now Elvira is confessing his attachment to her father and perhaps oh there is madness in the thought even at this moment she may be receiving his approval then we are lost said marianne and a pause ensued interrupted only by the convulsive sobs of rosabella who wrung her hands and wept aloud in the bitterest agony but you are sure you have not deceived yourself resumed the confidant your jealousy may have given weight to trifles not worthy of serious attention. The duke asked her if she had heard from him, and she gave him Edmund's letter. My uncle read it calmly, and when he had finished, desired her to attend him to his library. I confess this does not look well, said Marianne, and another long pause ensued, which was broken by the sound of rapid footsteps and in an instant Elvira rushed into the apartment with a face radiant with joy. "'Oh, my dear cousin,' cried she, "'my father is so kind, so good. I have told him everything, and he is not in the least angry. He has given his consent, and all is settled. I am to marry Edmund, and you, Edric, and—' "'I marry Edric?' exclaimed Rosabella. The crimson flush of anger darkening over her fine features, and proud scorn curling her beautiful lips. I marry that feeble, inanimate wretch? When we meet, and he offers his hand to greet me, his touch seems to freeze my veins. Cold, prudent, and calculating, he has all the vices of age without its excuses. And shall I marry such a being? No, if all other resources fail, death shall free me before the hated moment arrives. And, starting from her couch, she paced the room in violent agitation. My dear Rosabella, said Elvira, following and trying to soothe her, do pray compose yourself. Consider, my father, how angry he would be if he were to hear you. He is so positive he might— Here Elvira stopped, her delicacy making her averse to remind her cousin how completely she was in the duke's power. Go on, cried Rosabella tauntingly. I know what you would say. Upbraid me with my meanness. Trample upon me. Spurn me. Do not even spare the memory of my poor dear father. I am prepared for everything. I know the worst— I know that my uncle is positive, and that I am a poor dependent, subsisting upon his bounty, and that it is in his power to turn me this instant from his door, without a shilling to procure me food or shelter. But not even this shall control my will. Poor and dependent as I am, I am free, and I would sooner labor in the meanest servitude, beg my bread, or even perish for want, then reside in a palace surrounded by crowds of adoring slaves, if the price were that I must call Edric husband. My dear mistress, exclaimed Marianne, soothingly, you are too violent. I am very much hurt, Rosabella, said Elvira, to find you think me capable of saying anything intentionally to wound your feelings. As to your unhappy father, you must be aware that I know his history only vaguely, as it is a subject to which the Duke never suffers any one to allude. And, I assure you, he was not even in my thoughts when I spoke. Oh! cried Rosabella, clasping her hands together energetically as she spoke. Ob that it were but permitted to me to clear my father's name from the shade that hangs over it. I know, I feel, that he cannot have been guilty. He must have been the victim of slander, of vile contrivance or malice of plots raised against him 
by those who envied his fair fame. Oh, that I knew the facts and could clear him from all blame! By heaven, neither the gratification of my love nor any revenge could afford me half the pleasure. You use strange language, Rosabella, said Elvira, blushing at her cousin's warmth. I own I cannot comprehend such violent feelings. Thank God! Nature formed mine in a more temperate mould. Your feelings! cried Rosabella scornfully. You have none. You cannot even fancy them. You are incapable of love. There you do me injustice, replied Elvira. Such passions as yours I am indeed incapable of feeling. But love, real, pure, undefined love, that absorbing affection which prefers another's happiness to its own, that devotion which would sink unknown to the grave to procure another's happiness, that seeks not its own gratification, but would sacrifice all the world can give to promote the welfare of another, that can taste of no pleasure and partake of no delight, unless it be participated by the beloved object. And even then, joys in his satisfaction more than in its own, this I can feel. My heart tells me that I can, and this, I hope, I shall in time feel for Edmund. Then you own you do not love him yet, asked Rosabella with a bitter smile. I fear I do not, returned Elvira, sighing. At least not as he should be loved. But, continued she, after a short pause, perhaps my ideas of love are foolish and romantic, and I shall in time become more reasonable. A smile of contempt was Rosabella's only answer, when their conference was interrupted by a summons for them both to attend the duke. They obeyed in silence, and found him sitting in his library, with Father Morris standing beside his chair. "'Of course Elvira has told you what I mean to do for you,' said the duke, addressing Rosabella. "'Yes, my lord, she has,' returned Rosabella with dignity. "'Well, and what do you say to it?' "'I thought your grace did not intend either my cousin or myself to marry "'till we were past the age fixed by the late queen. "'Pooh! Nonsense! "'You neither of you have the least chance of ascending the throne. "'Claudia is not thirty, and she is likely to live these fifty years.' "'Rosabella did not speak, but the color fled from her cheeks.' and her eyes were cast upon the ground, whilst her strongly compressed lips showed that it was with infinite difficulty that she controlled her feelings sufficiently to hear her uncle with patience. "'In short,' continued the Duke, "'I have made up my mind that you shall both marry, and, as Edmund, it seems, has fixed upon Elvira, I think I cannot do better than to give you to his younger brother.' "'And do you know of whom you are disposing so unceremoniously?' asked Rosabella, raising her brilliant eyes from the ground and fixing them upon him with a look of proud scorn. The duke shrunk involuntarily from the withering glance, which seemed to fall upon him with the fabled power of that of the basilisk. "'Of whom I am disposing,' stammered he, unconsciously repeating her words, of whom I am disposing. Why, of my niece, to be sure, he continued, arranging with difficulty his scattered ideas. You are my niece, are you not? Yes, returned Rosabella. Unfortunately, I am your niece, and I blush for an uncle who does not scruple to abuse so barbarously the last legacy bequeathed to him by an unfortunate brother. "'Yes, my lord duke, I am your niece, your protégé, your dependent. "'I am not ashamed to own that I owe my daily bread to your bounty. "'But notwithstanding all this, I am not aware that I am your slave. 
nor do I think the pecuniary obligations I am under to you sufficient to give you the right of disposing me as an article of furniture, or a beast of burthen. You mistake the matter entirely, Rosabella, said the duke. I do not wish to hurt your feelings. Do you think, then, that I am formed of stone or iron that I am to be told to marry, when and where you list, without having my inclinations consulted or my affections gained? I am not so quiescent. Were my poor father alive, you would not treat me thus. Beware, Rosabella. You tread on dangerous ground, said the duke, violently agitated. Alas, alas! cried Rosabella, wringing her hands. Why am I treated thus? Have I no friend to take my part? Will no one interpose to save me from destruction? Oh, that my poor father were alive! He, at least, would pity his unhappy daughter. Father Morris, you have always professed to love me. I have been told you were my father's friend. Can you stand and see me thus cruelly oppressed? and not proffer one single word in my behalf? I appeal to you as a friend, as a Christian, as a man. Father Morris made no answer to this appeal, but his lips turned of a livid paleness, and uttering a low groan he sank into a chair, hiding his face in his hands, whilst every nerve quivering with agitation. "'Go to your chamber, Rosabella,' said the Duke, in a trembling voice. "'And when you have learnt to express yourself more temperately "'towards one who has been your only friend and benefactor, "'perhaps I may send for you again.' "'Rosabella attempted to speak, but the Duke sternly forbade her. "'Go,' said he. Your ignorance of your real situation may now plead an excuse for your conduct, but the time will shortly come when you will shudder at your folly, and wonder at my present forbearance. Awed by his manner, and the mysterious emotion of Father Morris, Rosabella withdrew in silence, followed by Elvira, and each retired to her separate chamber to muse in solitude upon the strange events which had occurred during the day. End of chapter 5, volume 1LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. The Mummy, a tale of the twenty-second century, by Jane Loudon. Volume One, Chapter Six. When Edric left his father to seek Doctor Antwerfen, he encountered Father Morris in the way, and so absorbed was he in his own meditations that he had almost passed the Reverend Father without seeing him. This is quite in philosophy said the priest with a smile as he intercepted his pupil's path what is the matter edric i did not think king cheops himself could have made you so soon forget your old friends indeed i had not forgotten you for i was thinking of you that very moment do you really think it possible that if i went to egypt i might succeed in resuscitating a mummy i do not doubt it the ancient egyptians you know believed that the souls of their mummies were chained to them in a torpid state till the final day of judgment and supposing this hypothesis to be correct there is every reason to imagine that by employing so powerful an agent as galvanism reanimation may be produced if i recollect rightly the ancient egyptians did not imagine the souls of their dead remained in their bodies but that they would return to them at the expiration of three thousand years and it is now about three thousand years since cheops was entombed it is strange continued edric musing what influence your words have upon my mind whilst i listen to you the racking desire i feel to explore these mysteries becomes almost torture and i muse upon it till i fancy it an impulse from a superior power and that i am really selected to be the mortal agent of their revelation to man 
and why may not this impulse which seems to operate with such irresistible force upon your mind and which you say you fancy be a real feeling implanted in you by the divine author of your being to guide you to a country where you are destined to attain immortality egypt is rich in monuments of antiquity and all historians unite in declaring her ancient inhabitants to have possessed knowledge and science far beyond even the boasted improvements of modern times for instance could we attempt to erect stupendous buildings like the pyramids where enormous masses are arranged with geometrical accuracy and the labors of man have emulated the everlasting durability of nature are we even capable of conceiving works so majestic as those they put in execution we assuredly are not and in every point excepting in their religion they surpassed us and though returned edric every scheme of religion falls infinitely below the divine perfection of christianity yet as christianity was not revealed in the times we are speaking of it cannot be denied that the egyptians made some approach to wisdom even in their devotions they worshipped nature though they disguised her under the symbols of her attributes and gratified the vulgar taste by giving them tangible objects to represent ideas too sublime for their unenlightened comprehension that they entertained the divine idea of resurrection and of rewards and punishment in a future life is evident not only from their favorite fable of the phoenix and the use they made of the now hackneyed image of the butterfly but by the care they bestowed upon the preservation of the body their mournings for the loss of osiris and rejoicings when he was found and the kind of trial to which they subjected the human corpse after death when if serious crimes were alleged and proved against it it was denied the rites of sepulture and left to decay unlamented then can any modern institutions excel the wisdom of the laws enacted by the pharaohs or can any modern magnificence equal that displayed in the cities of memphis and thebes and since this will hardly be disputed what country can be more fitting than that once so highly favored to be the scene of the most important discovery ever made by man i perfectly agree with you replied father morris and only wonder with these impressions upon your mind that you can hesitate an instant about undertaking your voyage to egypt alas i have no longer any occasion to hesitate what do you mean my father has just ordered me to quit his house immediately unless i marry rosabella and that no tortures shall ever induce me to do for i hate her then the duke has spoken said father morris gloomily i thought this success of edmund's would open his lips but continued he addressing edric i think you ought to rejoice at such a circumstance as your principal objection to visiting the pyramids was the difficulty of getting your father to consent to such an expedition that objection at least is now removed but how removed father morris think you that i could bear to leave england perhaps for ever and upon an expedition so awful in its tendency and consequences whilst laboring under a father's curse i cannot do it i must again see my father and obtain his forgiveness before i go you are then prepared to comply with his wishes never i have before told you no force shall compel me to marry rosabella and do you imagine sir ambrose will relinquish his project so easily is it not more probable that your opposition will only increase his determination and that another interview if you still refuse to obey his commands may provoke the curse you now seem to dread what shall i do then for in my present state of mind life is a burthen to me my brain feels bewildered go to dr entwerfen's study and remain there concealed for the present till the effervescence of your father's rage shall have evaporated my duty now calls me to my patron but i shall soon return i will then see your father and perhaps a conversation with me may bring him to reason i trust my cause in your hands father said edric and may your eloquence bring it to a happy issue you may depend upon me rejoined the reverend father i feel deeply interested in the business and they parted edric proceeding to seek his tutor and father morris returning to the house of the duke of cornwall when edric entered the study of dr entwerfen he found him engaged in what considering his age and station seemed a very extraordinary amusement he was apparently dancing a hornpipe drawing his heels together and alternately rising and sinking like a clown in a pantomime 
twisting his face in the meantime into the most hideous grimaces what is the matter cried edric gazing at him with surprise i i i am galvanized cried the doctor in a piteous tone nodding his head with a sudden jerk that seemed to threaten every instant to throw it out of its socket and then suddenly starting he kicked out one leg horizontally and twirled round upon the other with an air of an opera dancer how did it happen cried edric excessively shocked at the unnatural contrast exhibited between the doctor's serious countenance and involuntary antics i can't exactly tell replied the doctor bolting forth his words with difficulty and still swimming grinning and capering to the inexpressible horror of his companion till by degrees his grimaces subsided and he was enabled at last to stand tolerably steady he now informed his pupil that trying some experiments with his galvanic battery he had unfortunately operated upon himself and in his turn listened to the account of what had passed between edric and sir ambrose instead of expressing sorrow however when he found his pupil had quarrelled with his father the doctor's eyes sparkled with joy then you must inevitably travel exclaimed he we shall visit the pyramids we shall animate the mummies and we shall attain immortality no i cannot leave england without being reconciled to my father he is old and i may never see him again i could not bear to part from him in anger but consider the object you have in view and the countries you will visit all the english travel i never knew a young englishman in my life who was not fond of it the inhabitants of other countries journey for what they can get or what they hope to learn but an englishman travels because he does not know what to do with himself he spares neither time trouble nor money he goes everywhere sees everything after which he returns just as wise as when he set out not that i blame curiosity no i admire it above all things it is that which has led to all the great discoveries that have been made since the creation of the world and it is that which now impels us to explore the pyramids edric looked annoyed at the conclusion of this speech and to change the subject asked the doctor if he thought his galvanic battery powerful enough for the experiment they meant to try with it powerful exclaimed the doctor why i feel it even now tingling to my fingers ends i should think sir the effect it has upon me is a sufficient proof of the force of the machine if we do go said edric apparently pursuing the thread of his own reflections i should feel inclined to visit other countries besides egypt and so should i i should like particularly to see india for some black letter pamphlets in my possession allude to its being once governed by an old woman and as the regular historians make no mention of the fact i should like to see what traditions i could gather respecting it on the spot the religion of the ancient hindus before they were converted to christianity has been said to have resembled that of the ancient egyptians by comparing the monuments of both one might be made to illustrate the other i should also like before we quit africa to see the celebrated court of timbuktu i have long been in correspondence with a learned pundit there who has communicated to me some of the most sublime discoveries the whole of the interior of africa must be interesting particularly the rising states on the banks of the niger it is generally instructing as well as amusing to watch the birth and struggles of infant republics and to remark how fast the people encroach and then the governors whilst the rulers are weak they are always liberal but their exalted sentiments in general decrease in exact proportion as they become powerful in short resumed the doctor i would willingly traverse the whole world i know but one country that i should dislike to visit and which is that asked edric america i have no wish to have my throat cut or my breath stopped by a bowstring i have a perfect horror of despotic governments then how do you endure the one we live under the case is quite different with us the spur of despotism is scarcely felt and the people being permitted occasionally to think and act for themselves are not debased and brutalized as the slaves of absolute power are in general despotism with us is like a rod which the schoolmaster keeps hung in the sight of his boys but which he has very seldom any occasion to make use of from such despotism as that of the americans however heaven defend us amen for as we are happy now we should be idiots to desire a change 
what an unphilosophical sentiment exclaimed the doctor i am really quite shocked that you edric should utter such a speech what an abominable doctrine remember that if you once allow innovation to be dangerous you instantly put a stop to all improvement you absolutely shut and bolt your doors against it oh it is horrible that such a doctrine should be ever broached in a civilized country you surely could not be aware of what you were saying perhaps i was not for i own candidly i scarcely do know what i am doing to amuse you then i will give you a treat i will show you a curious collection of ballads all of which are at least three hundred years old which a friend of mine picked up in london for me the other day and sent me down this morning by the stage balloon they are all of the genuine rag paper a certain proof of their antiquity for you know the asbestos paper we now use has not been invented more than two hundred years but you shall see them follow me so saying the doctor trotted off to his library that paradise of half-forgotten volumes most of which had been accidentally saved from their well-merited destination of covering over butter and wrapping up cheese to be drawn from the dust and obscurity in which they had lain for centuries to ornament the shelves of dr entwerfen and whose authors if they could have taken a peep upon the earth and beheld them would have been quite astonished to find themselves immortal entering this emporium of neglected learning the doctor hastily advanced to a table on which lay his newly acquired treasures and holding them up exclaimed look edric how beautifully dirty the paper is no art could counterfeit this dingy hue this sooty tinge is the genuine tint of antiquity you know edric in ancient times the caloric employed in culinary purposes and indeed for all the common usages of life was produced by the combustion of wood and of a black bituminous substance or amphilites drawn from the bowels of the earth called coal of which you may yet see specimens in the cabinets of the curious as these substances decomposed or rather expanded by the force of heat the attraction of cohesion was dissolved and the component parts flew off in the shape of smoke or soot this smoke rising into the air was dispersed by it and the minute particles or atoms of which it was composed falling and resting upon everything that chanced to be in the way produced that incomparable dusky hue which the moderns have so often tried though in vain to imitate i beg your pardon edric for using such vulgar language to express what i wish to say but really treating upon such a subject i did not know how to explain myself elegantly oh i understand you very well sir after all the only true use of language is to convey the ideas of one person to the understanding of another and provided that end be attained i really do not see that it is of any consequence what words we make use of true edric dear you make very just observations sometimes well but the ballads i was going to show you my treasures my jewels as the roman lady said of her children look what beautiful specimens these are a little torn here and there and with a few of the lines illegible but genuine antiques i'll warrant every one of them above three hundred years old look it is real linen paper you may tell it by the texture and then the spelling see what a number of letters they put into their words that were of no use look at the titles of them here is the tragical end of poor miss bailey and here cherry ripe and i've been roaming here is the loves of captain waddle and miss roe and here are jessie the flower of dumblaine and dunois the brave but this is my phoenix here is what will be the envy of collectors here is my invaluable treasure this i believe is absolutely unique and that i am so blessed as to possess the only copy extant the date is wanting but the manners it describes are so unpolished that i should almost think it might be traced back to the times of the aboriginal britons thus it begins at winsbury there was a cocking a match between newton and scroggins the nailers and colliers left work and to spittles they all went jogging tol de rollo i used to be very much puzzled at this burthen which is one of frequent recurrence in ancient songs at first i thought it a relic of some language now irrevocably lost then it struck me it might be an invocation 
to the deities of the aborigines in short i was quite perplexed and knew not what to think when a learned friend of mine hit upon an idea the other day which seems completely to solve the difficulty he suggests that it was an ancient manner of running up and down the scale and that tol de ro lol had the same significance as do re mi fa which solution is at once so simple and ingenious that i am sure you as well as myself must be struck by it i here omit a few stanzas in which the author enumerates his heroes exactly in the homeric manner the names are so barbarous that i am afraid of loosening my teeth in pronouncing them there was plenty of beef at the dinner of a bull that was baited to death bunny hyde got a lump in his throat which had like to have stopped his breath what a beautiful simplicity there is in that last line which had like to have stopped his breath oh we moderns have nothing equal to it the company fell in confusion to see this poor bunny hyde choke so they hurried him down to the kitchen and held his head over the smoke this develops a curious practice of antiquity you know edric i explained to you just now the manner in which combustion was formerly effected and the causes of the production of what was called smoke i own however it seems a strange way of reviving a half suffocated man to hold his head over smoke which being loaded as i said before with innumerable atoms of all sorts and sizes would one might think be more likely to impede respiration than restore it the fact however is undoubted and it not only affords a curious illustration of the manner of the ancients but is of itself a strong proof of the authenticity of the ballad for such an idea never could have entered the head of a modern to return to poor hyde one gave him a kick of the stomach and another a thump of the brow his wife cried throw him in the stable and he will be better just now this unfeeling conduct of his wife does not say much in commendation of the ladies of those times here follows an hiatus of several stanzas i find however by a word or two here and there that they celebrated the exploits of two gallic heroes the best if country bred the one was a brassy wing black and the other a dusky wing red these unfortunate victims of the cruelty of man seem both to have perished there is a stanza however before this catastrophe which seems to relate to the combat the conflict was hard upon each till glossy winged blackie was choked the colliers were nationally vexed and the nailers were all provoked this passage seems very obscure nationally is evidently a sign of comparison but i cannot say i ever saw it employed before it is however another proof of the amazing antiquity of the ballad after this it appears that the people broke in upon the ring and both cocks were crushed to atoms i don't know whether you are acquainted with the manner in which these gallic combats were conducted edric a kind of amphitheatre was formed upon which the birds were pitted one against the other whence the name cockpit the combatants were armed with large iron spurs and the victor generally left his rival dead upon the field the ballad proceeds the cockpit was near to the church as an ornament to the town one side was an old coal pit and the other was well gorsed round gorse was a kind of heath or furze peter hadley peeped through the gorse in order to see the cocks fight spittle jobbed his eye out with a fork and said blast you it sarves you right this is very spirited and expressive though the false quantities render it difficult to read some folks may think this is strange who wensbury never knew but those who have ever been there won't have the least doubt but it's true for they are all savage by nature and guilty of deeds that are shocking jack baker he whacked his own feather and so ended the wensbury cocking it is very fine certainly said edric who was half asleep upon my word returned the doctor i don't think you have heard a single word i have been saying oh yes i have replied edric every syllable it was about a man killing his own father and putting his eyes out with a fork eh cried the doctor somewhat annoyed at this unequivocal proof that though his words might have struck upon the auricular organs of his pupil they had not reached his brains the exclamation of the doctor restored edric to his senses and he began to apologize i am really very sorry said he but you must excuse my inattention 
sometimes you know the mind is not in tune for literary discussions even when proceeding from the most eloquent lips this is my case at the present moment my mind is so occupied by the important change that has just taken place in my affairs that i own even your learning and eloquence were thrown away upon me if that be the state of your mind replied the doctor with chagrin it is of no use to show you any more of my literary treasures else i have some of matchless excellence here is a letter addressed to sheridan a witty writer of comedies in the eighteenth century which has never been opened and here is a tailor's bill of the immortal byron which may possibly never have been looked at but here is the most inestimable of my relics look at least at this this piece of paper covered carelessly with irregular strokes and lines was once in the possession of that enchanting that inimitable novelist of the nineteenth century generally distinguished in the works of contemporary writers by the mysterious title of the great unknown see here is half the word waverly written upon it and doubtless all these other irregular marks and scratches proceeded directly from his pen i confess edric i never contemplate this relic of genius without a feeling of reverence and almost of awe perhaps say i to myself when i look at it when these letters were formed the first idea had but just arisen in the mind of the author of those immortal works which were afterwards destined to improve and delight mankind perhaps at that very moment gigantic thoughts were rushing through his brain and a variety of new ideas opening their treasures to his imagination oh there is something in the mere random stroke of the pen of a celebrated character inexpressibly affecting to the mind it carries one back to the very time when he lived it seems to make one acquainted with him and to let us into the secrets of his inmost thoughts but i see you are not attending to me edric i am very sorry another time i should be happy but now i cannot however when we return perhaps it may be then too late said the doctor with solemnity and locking up his cabinet he led the way back to his common sitting room in high dudgeon end of chapter six of volume one Chapter 7 of The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century by Jane Loudon. Volume 1, Chapter 7. When Father Morris had left Edric, he proceeded to the house of the Duke of Cornwall, intending to return to that of Sir Ambrose almost immediately, but the scene which took place between the Duke and his niece altered his determination. It is not in the power of language to describe the agony of Father Morris at the appeal of Rosabella. She had accidentally touched upon a chord that thrilled through every nerve and almost drove him to madness. The Duke, after attempting in vain to console him, retired leaving him a prey to the bitterest torments for like the votaries of eblis he felt unquenchable fire burning in his bosom and like them he sought in vain to escape he was roused from this state of unutterable anguish by a summons from sir ambrose to attend him instantly and with a heavy heart he obeyed repenting the sins he had committed yet meditating more Father Morris endeavoured, as he slowly retraced his steps to Sir Ambrose's mansion, to soothe his feelings by dwelling upon the good he meant to do when he should attain power, rather than on the means by which that power was to be obtained. For it is a remarkable fact that no man likes to appear a villain to himself, and even when his crimes escape the eyes of the world, he is not satisfied unless he can frame plausible excuses for them in his own mind though it is true that these excuses would not bear strict examination as self-love is an able sophist and slight reasons look brilliant when set off by such colouring nearly reconciled to himself by arguments the fallacy of which he would never have been first to detect if they had been offered by another father morris entered the house of sir ambrose with his usual calm smile 
but his equanimity was almost again upset when he found dr coleman a highly respectable physician in the neighbourhood already closeted with the worthy baronet father morris hated dr coleman it would perhaps be difficult to say why unless it was that the priest feeling conscious his designs would not bear exposure shrank from the penetrating eye of the physician whose natural shrewdness was considerably heightened by his professional acumen there are indeed no classes of society better acquainted with the vices of mankind than the professors of law and physic a great writer has called law the chimney through which the fiery passions of the world expend themselves in smoke and the experience of the medical man sometimes even surpasses that of his legal brethren admitted into the very bosoms of families often the unavoidable confidant of the most delicate secrets an experienced physician becomes naturally cautious penetrating and suspicious this was the case with dr coleman and father morris now felt particularly annoyed by his presence as however there was no remedy the father was too good a politician to suffer his annoyance to be seen and smoothing his brow he expressed in his usual soft low voice the pleasure he said he felt at meeting so unexpectedly with his old friend i am glad to hear that you are pleased to see me said dr coleman with marked emphasis how can it be otherwise it is so kind of you who have so many professional engagements to occupy your time to bestow any of it upon your friends dr coleman did not speak but he fixed his eyes upon father morris with an expression that the latter could not bear hastily drawing the cowl in which his features were generally shrouded still closer over his face he turned to sir ambrose and asked what had occasioned the hasty summons he had received the conduct of edric replied the baronet abruptly he refuses to see me and as i understand he had a long conference with you this morning i have sent for you to know what he means that my dear sir returned father morris with a gentle smile and half closed eyes you must allow it would be impossible for me even to guess the minds of young men are wayward and capricious they scarcely know their own wishes how then can one so ignorant of the world as i be expected to divine them our good friend dr coleman is much more competent to advise you upon the subject than i am oh you are too humble father said dr coleman ironically pray have a juster sense of your own merit all this has nothing to do with the business exclaimed sir ambrose getting into a passion i want to know what you said to edric this morning and what he said to you he told me that he would sooner die than marry rosabella the young villain then let him die first if he likes it but it's all nonsense a mere figure of speech it is very easy to talk about dying but few people like it when they are put to the test not that he's the least intention of anything of the kind he thinks i'm an old fool and only says it to frighten me but i see through his schemes i'm not to be duped and i won't give up the point i shall be deaf to all his prayers and supplications I do not think that he intends to offer any not offer any what do you mean that i think he has a project in his head which makes him rather glad of the quarrel that has taken place than otherwise impossible this must be false cried dr coleman starting from his seat see him and judge for yourself returned father morris scowling at his opponent and what is this project asked sir ambrose as soon as he had recovered a little from his astonishment he intends to go to Egypt, and visiting the pyramids, to try to resuscitate a mummy. Dr. Coleman groaned in the spirit. Sir Ambrose shook his head. I fear it is but too true, said he. It is just like one of his plans. The boy is mad, evidently distracted. That silly tutor of his has quite turned his brain. I really am afraid he is deranged, sighed Dr. Coleman, if he seriously entertains so mad a scheme but you will excuse me father morris if i still entertain some doubts upon the subject he may only have mentioned such a thing in joke talk to him yourself he is in the chamber of dr entwerfen i do not wish you to confide in my representations it is always painful to me to interfere in family disputes indeed when edric this morning wished me to explain his intentions to his father i declined doing so 
and you will witness that it was only in compliance with the earnest entreaty of my worthy friend that I spoke at all on the subject. Notwithstanding, said Dr. Coleman, after musing a short time, I shall be better satisfied when I have seen Edric myself. I beg you will do no such thing, interrupted Sir Ambrose. He will fancy you an ambassador from me, and I could not bear that. It is his place to submit, not mine. He shall not triumph over me in that manner. I am sure he would feel no triumph. But I tell you he would, sir. He would rejoice, exult, and glory in such a thing. I will be master in my own house and over my own sons. You shall not see him, nobody shall see him, and he shall remain shut up in the asylum he has chosen till he comes to his senses. It is useless to enrage Sir Ambrose by further opposition now, whispered Father Morris to Dr. Coleman. Edric cannot go to Europe without money, and you know he never has any in hand. It can do no harm to adjourn the subject till tomorrow. They will both then be calmer and more likely to listen to reason. Dr. Coleman could not deny the policy of this advice, though he felt reluctant to follow it as it was suggested by Father Morris. Discarding the presentiment of evil, however, as a prejudice which it was his duty to overcome, as it was contrary to his reason, the worthy physician took his leave, fully determining to reconcile the father and son on the morrow. But the morrow, alas, who shall dare speculate upon the morrow? was destined to see Edric and his tutor on their way to Egypt. When Father Morris returned to the adagium of, of Dr. Entwerfen, he informed Edric that his father, so far from expressing anger at his intended expedition to Egypt, seemed glad of the opportunity to get rid of him, as he said his presence would only spoil Edmund's triumph. He says you always look so gloomily, continued the wily priest, that even when he is disposed to enjoy himself, you throw a damp upon his spirits, the instant you appear. He therefore gave his free consent to your journey, and commissioned me to supply you with the funds necessary for the expedition. It had ever been the prevailing weakness of Edric to believe his brother more beloved by Sir Ambrose than himself, and Father Morris, knowing this, had framed his tale accordingly. We easily believe what we fear, and Edric, though not generally credulous, placed implicit faith in the father's story, though it gave him acute anguish. "'I knew he did not love me,' said he, "'but to bid me go thus, on so perilous an enterprise, "'without seeing me, I did not expect.' "'And involuntary tears rolled down his cheeks as he spoke, "'whilst the good-natured Dr. Entwerfen sobbed for sympathy. "'Never mind it, Edric, dear,' said he, "'throwing his arms round his pupil's neck. "'You have one friend, at any rate, who loves you dearly,' and will never desert you. I know it, exclaimed Edric, warmly returning his tutor's embrace. Yes, doctor, you are my friend. Of that I am fully satisfied, and we will succeed or perish together. You will want many things to enable you to proceed with your enterprise, said Father Morris, with which you must furnish yourselves in London. Besides, as Edric has never been ten miles from home in his life, he should stay a short time to see the wonders of that vast metropolis before he leaves his native country. For seeing this, and thinking, as strangers in London, you would feel awkward in having no place to go on your arrival, I have dispatched a carrier pigeon to a friend of mine in town, Lord Gustavus de Montfort, who will, I am sure, give you a hearty welcome, and will afford you both the shelter of his house and the aid of his advice. I know not how to express my gratitude, returned Edric. Then say nothing about it. If you really feel obliged, profit by my directions. A stage balloon will pass through the village in an hour. Shall you be ready to avail yourself of the opportunity? I will go this instant, exclaimed Edric. The doctor, with some difficulty, consented to this arrangement, and, at the appointed moment, Edric and his tutor were on their way to London though the doctor could scarcely be persuaded to set off, for again and again he would return to survey the treasures he was leaving behind, and the moment Edric thought he had him safe, he would recollect some indispensable requisite for their journey, and hurry back again to find it. At last they were fairly started, and a favourable wind blew them rapidly towards London. Edric had never seen this vast metropolis, and his astonishment and delight, when its magnificent palaces, its superb streets, 
its public buildings, its theatres, and its churches, broke upon him, was quite beyond description. His transports and exclamations, indeed, at length, became so violent as quite to annoy the learned doctor. "'If you feel such rapture at the sight of London,' said he, peevishly, "'I suppose you will be reluctant to quit it, "'and I dare say you already repent having proposed to travel.' "'Oh, what is that?' cried Edric, without attending to him, "'as, lost in amazement, he saw a house in the suburbs "'gently slide out of its place and glide majestically along the road, "'a lady at one of the windows kissing her hand "'to someone in another house as she passed. "'Do my eyes deceive me, or does that house move?' "'Certainly it does,' replied the doctor. "'Did you never see a moving house before? "'You must have heard of them, at any rate, for nothing can be more common. "'It certainly is convenient, when one wants to go into the country for a few weeks, "'to be able to take one's house with one. "'It saves a great deal of trouble in packing, "'and permits one to have all one's little conveniences about one. "'You see there are grooves in the bottom of the houses "'that just fit on the iron railways, "'and as they are propelled by steam, they glide on without much trouble. It does not answer, however, with any but small houses, for large ones can't well be made compact enough. However, you must postpone your admiration of that, as well as of all the other wonders of London. For here we are at Lord Gustavus's door. What a noble mansion, is it not? This street, Hedrick, is called the Strand, and it is the most fashionable in London, because it adjoins the Queen's favourite place at Somerset House. Is that the palace? said Edric, it seems a noble pile of building. The gardens are fine, but as they are thrown open to the public and nothing is paid for admission, it is reckoned vulgar to walk in them. You English do not like anything you do not pay for, but more of this hereafter. We must now prepare to pay our respects to our noble host. Lord Gustavus de Montfort received them very kindly, but Edric found something in his voice and manners excessively forbidding. He had a pompous, disagreeable manner of speaking, with a nasal accent so strong that it was absolutely torture to Edric, whose sense of hearing was uncommonly fine, to listen to him. He had also a conceited dictatorial way of delivering his opinion, which Edric thought extremely unpleasant. He generally commenced his speeches with, Thinking as I think, and I am positive everyone who hears me must think, or at least ought to think, and this exordium formed an epitome of his character. He was firmly persuaded that every one who differed in the slightest degree from his opinion was decidedly wrong, whilst the possibility of his ever being mistaken himself never entered his imagination. His father had been one of the councillors of the late Queen, and his eldest brother, having declined to take the father's place upon his death, Lord Gustavus had been appointed to it. Thus he was really a person of some consequence in the state, and though his being so was quite a matter of chance, arising from the circumstances above mentioned, and the indolence of the Queen, he affected to regard it as a matter of personal favour to himself, and endeavoured to persuade his hearers that the affairs of government could not possibly go on without him. Knowing his foible of wishing to be thought of importance in the realm, and feeling the want of a leader of rank, some of the discontented spirits of the kingdom had endeavoured to gain him over to their party, and though Lord Gustavus was strictly loyal, and even particularly fond of talking to Her Gracious Majesty the Queen, and boasting of the confidence she placed in him, yet his vanity would not altogether resist the able attacks made upon it by the rebels. He wavered, he began to talk of reform, and to mingle boasts of his popularity amongst the people, with those he had before indulged in, of enjoying the favour of his sovereign. Thus he hung upon the balance, ready to incline to either side, according to the circumstances that time or chance might produce. "'I am extremely happy,' said he, as he advanced to meet his guests, "'that my worthy and respected friend, Father Morris, has procured me the honour of such illustrious visitors. The Holy Father has informed me of the sublime purpose that animates your bosoms, and lead you to traverse realms of air, to explore the hitherto undiscovered secrets of the grave. His partiality for me has also led him to imagine that my humble means may perchance prove conducive to so great an end, and he has requested me to give you all the assistance in my power to promote the gigantic objects you have in view. Thus you may rest assured 
no efforts shall be wanting on my part to fulfil his wishes and as though insignificant in myself i am so happy as to be honoured by the protection and favour of her majesty the queen my most gracious sovereign and also as my feeble attempts to promote the public good have been rewarded by the gratitude of the people it may perchance be in my power to serve you and in the meantime i hope you will do me the honour to partake of such hospitality as my humble mansion can afford so saying lord gustavus led the way through a sumptuous suite of rooms to one where an elegant cold collation was laid out of which he invited his guests to partake nothing could be more splendid than the furniture and embellishments of this apartment the rooms were hung with crimson silk trimmed with gold valuable paintings decorated the walls statues of inestimable price filled each corner and magnificent mirrors increased tenfold the magic of the scene lord gustavus secretly enjoyed the astonishment and admiration painted upon the countenances of his guests while he openly affected to talk of his poor house and his humble attempts to entertain them etc his heart covertly exulted in the grandeur around him and his eyes sparkled with pleasure at the effect he saw it produced upon the strangers nothing makes one so much disposed to be in a good humour with the world as being in a good humour with oneself and nothing is so certain to produce that delightful sensation as to see what we possess excite the admiration of others thus as the flattery conveyed by looks far outweighs that expressed by words and as the looks of edric and the doctor unequivocally declared their sentiments lord gustavus was quite enchanted with his visitors and spared no pains to render them equally happy as himself he ordered a large apartment to be prepared for the doctor that he might make his arrangements for the intended egyptian expedition quite at his ease he commanded his servants to obey his directions implicitly and he directed tradesmen to supply everything that might be wanted at his own expense having thus given the doctor carte blanche he next turned his attention to edric and finding it was his first visit to london volunteered to show him all the wonders of that immense metropolis which then spreading enormously in every direction seemed like a fabled monster of the indians to stretch its enormous arms on every side and swallow up all the hapless villages which were so unfortunate as to fall within its reach sir ambrose being too proud to make any inquiries respecting his rebellious son edric's departure was not suspected by his father till the arrival of dr coleman on the following day as father morris had predicted the worthy baronet was become much more cool and by the persuasion of dr coleman at length consented to see his son and not to insist upon his marrying rosabella until he had given the subject more mature consideration after this concession his astonishment and indignation when he learned the truth may be easier conceived than described nothing is so mortifying to a passionate man as to find his intended kindness of no avail and sir ambrose in the transport of his rage vowed never to see his offending son again let me implore you to consider what you are doing said dr coleman when he heard this oath oh my dear uncle cried clara clinging to his knees don't say that you will never forgive him i never will exclaimed the enraged baronet i swear by all my hopes of happiness here and hereafter that i never will see his face again you will repent this rashness said dr coleman when it is too late i feel confident there must be some deception in the business deception cried sir ambrose eagerly by whom can it have been practised and for what purpose pray explain yourself you will perhaps feel offended at what i am about to say and probably will not believe me but in my opinion here the worthy doctor was interrupted by the appearance of a round fat rosy looking face which just popped in for a moment at the door of the apartment and was then instantly withdrawn good heavens i should surely know those features exclaimed dr coleman and yet i hope i trust it cannot be who is there cried sir ambrose pettishly what do you want and why are you ashamed of showing your face that jolly face again made its appearance but it was now accompanied by a portly body which certainly did it no discredit though it was clad in the garments of a priest sure and it is not my face that i'd be ashamed of showing anyhow said the apparition with a strong south-country brogue 
but i it was that myself didn't like to intrude and i was just looking for the doctor there and what is your will with me father murphy asked dr coleman with an air of melancholy sure and i'll be after telling ye directly barring that i've a bit of note here that i'll speak further than i can so saying he presented a letter to dr coleman who opened and read it with considerable agitation you'll excuse me sir ambrose this is a matter of greatest importance so my young friend is waiting without i must see him instantly i must bid you adieu for the present sir ambrose but you shall see me again in a day or two i have a friend the son of an old friend mr henry seymour come to spend some time with me i hope you'll permit me to have the honour of introducing him to you i am sure you will like him he is a young irishman a very nice young man after running through this speech with astonishing volubility he hurried away leaving sir ambrose excessively annoyed at his departure and totally at a loss how to account for it or how to class his strange visitor till he recollected that dr coleman had passed many years in ireland and that it was the illiberal policy of the king of that country to have his priests lowly descended and ill-educated men lest they should acquire too much influence over the subjects and become dangerous to his government the irish priests thus divested of all the dignity of the sacerdotal character gradually degenerated into a kind of privileged jesters tolerated in every great house for the amusement they afforded and obliged if they had any wit to conceal under the appearance of folly father murphy was evidently one of the humiliated class and his connection with dr coleman was easily accounted for by supposing him to belong to some family dr coleman had formed an acquaintance with when in ireland but the mysterious allusion which the doctor had made respecting edric was not so comprehensible and sir ambrose waited eagerly for several days in the hope that he would call to explain what he had meant no doctor however arrived and as the duke's mind was completely occupied by another subject sir ambrose was left entirely to his own reflections without having a single creature to whom he could impart them or from whom he could hope for sympathy the duke in fact was a specimen of a class common enough in the world of men whose minds will not hold more than one idea at a time and his head was now so full of the splendid images connected with edmund that edric's rejection of rosabella and subsequent departure were almost forgotten it was far otherwise with sir ambrose who now began to repent though secretly of the unwarrantable severity with which he had treated his son it is a trite though undeniable observation that we never know the real value of any possession till we have lost it and thus sir ambrose though he had thought nothing of the respectful and dutiful attentions of his son whilst he was in the habit of constantly receiving them now felt their want and regretted bitterly the ill-timed harshness that had deprived him of them for ever still however he was too obstinate to own he had been wrong and though he knew that by recalling his son he should restore his lost happiness he like many other persons in similar situations most magnanimously determined to persist in being miserable four days had elapsed since that on which dr coleman had so abruptly left sir ambrose ere he called again and when he made his reappearance he was accompanied by a tall handsome young man whom he introduced as henry seymour and the good-humoured though eccentric father murphy sir ambrose received his guests very coldly for he felt hurt by the doctor's neglect but the duke who attended by father morris happened to be with sir ambrose when they arrived was quite enchanted with them and when they rose to depart gave them a general invitation to his castle this courtesy which seemed to displease alike father morris and dr coleman was accepted with transports by the strangers especially by the younger whose enthusiastic expressions of gratitude quite delighted the old duke from this moment the fancy the duke had so suddenly conceived for the strangers rapidly became intimacy and they were quite soon domesticated at the castle henry seymour listened to the duke's stories laughed at his jokes admired his dogs and horses and above all approved of his improvements whilst he talked and walked with elvira or read to her as she worked or accompanied her when she sang or played with his voice or flute in short he became quite l'ami de la maison and was beloved by every one in it excepting father morris marianne and rosabella marianne he seemed to consider as quite beneath his notice 
and Rosabella he was uniformly polite to, but Father Morris he evidently hated, and took very little pains to conceal his feelings. When these broke forth a little too strongly, Dr. Coleman would often look grave and shake his head, but in vain. Prudence was not Henry Seymour's forte. Wit and good humour danced gaily in his bright blue eyes, but the expression of violent passions often flittered in quick transition over his animated features, and he frequently appeared to have the greatest difficulty in restraining himself within due bounds. His manners, too, were much too familiar for his station, and when disappointed in trifles, he often treated the duke and princesses with unwarrantable haughtiness. Like a petted child, he was always either offending or suing to be forgiven, and though on these occasions Dr. Coleman always whispered, Beware! The admonition was generally forgotten at the very moment when it might have been of service. Notwithstanding this perverseness, it was impossible to know Henry Seymour without loving him, and his own affection seemed as warm as those he inspired. He loved the Duke and Elvira, respected Dr. Coleman, and was evidently tenderly attached to Father Murphy, though no two beings could be imagined more different than he and that reverend personage. Father Murphy, indeed, was a general favourite, and the whole household of the Duke concurred in thinking of him quite a non pareve of a priest, for, as he was not very fond of doing penance himself, so he was not very rigid in imposing it upon others, and consequently he and his penitents were always upon the best terms imaginable. In short, he seemed especially designed by nature to be good friends with all the world, and on his side he certainly did the utmost not to thwart the beneficent old lady's kind intentions. The time now rapidly approached for Edmund's return. Letters had been received from him, announcing that he should be in England in a couple of days, and the Duke, having made all the preparations possible, and twice as many as were necessary, for removing his whole household to town, became in an agony of impatience to set off. He had not permitted either Sir Ambrose or Elvira to inform Edmund of his approbation of his attachment, and he anticipated with almost childish delight the effect that would be produced on Edmund's mind by the joyful intelligence. Elvira, however, did not appear to participate in her father's pleasure, and as the hour approached for their departure for town, her spirits became evidently more and more depressed, while Henry Seymour's gaiety seemed also to have quite deserted him, till the good-natured duke, compassionating his dejection and really feeling sorry to part with so agreeable a companion, invited him to accompany them to London. Henry Seymour's bright eyes sparkled with joy at this proposition, and seizing the duke's hand, he exclaimed, I'll go with all my heart, and you are a dear good creature for thinking of asking me. There's nobody shall be more welcome, returned the duke, not at all offended with the familiarity of his young friend's address, though it was quite out of all rule, according to the bienseances of the age. For I don't know anybody I love better, except in my old friend here, Sir Ambrose and Edmund. And Elvira and Rosabella and me, said Clara Montague coaxingly, "'What should I love such a little hussy as you for, I wonder?' "'Oh, that I don't know, but I'm sure you do love me. "'Let you say what you will,' returned Clara, "'whom delight at the idea of her expected journey had made half wild. "'Good heaven! Henry Seymour!' said Dr. Coleman, in an impressive tone. "'You cannot surely be so mad as to intend going to London.' "'Why not? There is no danger. "'And if there were, would it not be worth braving in such a cause?' "'By heaven, I would leap over the crater of Mount Etna "'with such an object in view. "'Well, you must do as you like. "'I know it is in vain to attempt to reason with you "'when you have made up your mind. "'Quite, my dear doctor, so don't waste your eloquence.' "'We shall set off tomorrow,' said the Duke. "'I wish we were there.' "'What a pity,' remarked Henry, "'that nature did not mingle a little patience "'with your grace's other good qualities.' "'It is indeed.' "'for patience, as Father Murphy says, "'robs care of its bitterest sting. "'Och, and it's me you're quoting from, your grace. "'And where's the use of that, pray, "'when you know I'm just here and ready to quote for myself? "'If all your observations are as good as that "'the Duke has just repeated,' said Sir Ambrose, "'I don't know anybody that might be quoted from "'with more advantage.' "'Sure, and it's of myself you're saying that?' "'asked Father Murphy. "'For if you are, you never made a better speech in all your life.' 
Only there's a little mistake if you think the observation you're talking of came out of my own head, for it didn't do any such thing. Do not be alarmed, said Father Morris, who now approached and who spoke with his usual satirical sneer. No one who knows you will ever suspect you of anything so atrocious. Good nature and integrity are sometimes more than equivalent to brilliant talents, said Sir Ambrose bitterly. True, rejoined Father Morris, in one of his softest, most insinuating tones, but they become inestimable when united, as in the example before us, bowing to Father Murphy as he spoke. Sir Ambrose turned and looked earnestly at the tall, thin figure of the monk as he stood before him, his arms crossed upon his breast, and his head, as usual, bent towards the ground, but he did not speak. "'By the way,' said the Duke, "'is it not strange that we have never heard anything of Edric since he left? I begin to think that it was all a planned thing, and they would have gone just the same if nothing had been said of Rosabella.' "'Impossible!' exclaimed Sir Ambrose. I see no impossibility in the business, resumed the Duke. I think the case is clear. They did not know how to get off decently, and so Edric pretended to quarrel with you, and me, to give the thing a face. I cannot fancy Edric guilty of such meanness, cried Sir Ambrose passionately. I don't think the matter admits of a single doubt. I only wish I had not offered him my niece. What is your opinion of the subject, Father Morris? "'Men devoted to austere professions like myself,' replied the priest, without raising eyes from the ground, "'know but little of what is passing in the world. "'Thus, though my body be no longer shrouded in the gloom of a cloister, "'my mind still remains too much abstracted from the busy scenes around me "'for me to be a competent judge of the effect of human passions.' "'Ark, then ye are very right to say nothing about them,' cried Father Murphy." "'For though I am in a passion every day of my life, "'I never know what to say when I begin to talk of it. "'So I just think it's the wisest way to hold my tongue.' "'Neither Sir Ambrose nor the Duke made any reply, "'and after settling that they should commence their journey "'on the following morning, they separated. "'End of Chapter 7 of Volume 1volume one chapter eight of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon volume one chapter eight The journey of the Duke and his party to London had nothing in it to distinguish it from hundreds of other journeys. They did not meet with a single adventure worthy of being recorded, and they arrived in perfect safety at the palace of the Duke, which was situated in the Strand, that being, as we have before stated, in those days the most fashionable part of London, and had beautiful gardens shelving down to the Thames. The Duke had brought all his establishment to town, and it would be difficult to conceive any one in a greater bustle than the worthy Mrs. Russell for several days after their arrival. The tender Abelard could not find her at liberty for a single moment to listen to his poetical effusions. One day, however, having been, as he conceived, particularly happy, he determined to make himself heard. He accordingly waited upon the fair Eloisa, whom he found busily employed in giving directions to the servants. "'Mrs. Russell,' sighed he, in love's softest cadence, but Mrs. Russell heard him not. She was talking to the cook." "'You must quite alter your style, Angelina,' said she. "'Remember, nothing can be too plain for great people. "'Fricassees and ragouts are only devoured by the canaille.' "'I am instructed of that, ma'am,' replied Angelina, "'a great, fat, bonny-looking cook. "'But I flatter myself I know how to concoct dishes.' "'That is the very thing you must avoid,' 
interrupted Mrs. Russell. Anything did for the country, but here the case is different. The Duke's rank requires a certain degree of style, and it is the fashion now for great people to have only one dish, and that as plainly cooked as possible. I have been told by a friend of mine, who got a peep at the great dinner the Queen gave the other day to the foreign ambassadors, that there was nothing in the world upon the table but a huge round of boiled beef and a great dish of smoking potatoes, with their jackets on. Well, ma'am, returned Angelina, I will rally both my physical and mental energies to afford you all the satisfaction in my power notwithstanding which i am free to confess that in my opinion the gastronomic science is now cruelly neglected and that i do not think the digestive powers of the stomach can be properly excited from their dormant state by such unstimulating food as that you mention besides the muscular force of the stomach must be strained to decompose such solid viands and i should think the diaphragm seriously injured you alfonso continued Mrs. Russell, addressing the footman, and cruelly interrupting the learned harangue of the cook. "'Must take more care in cleaning the pictures. There is a fine large painting of one of the old English artists over the door, in the best drawing-room, the colours of which are quite faded. I am afraid you have used something improper to clean it.' "'Indeed, madam,' returned alfonso i think the fault is in the picture itself it did not dry well originally i don't think the oil that was used in its composition had the carbon and hydrogen mingled in the proper proportions you know madam that oil in general has an amazing affinity for oxygen and absorbs it rapidly now though the oil of this picture has been exposed for years to the action of the common atmospheric air yet it has never thickened properly into a concrete state mrs russell cried abelard venturing to sigh a little louder oh mr abelard exclaimed the fair eloisa with a pretty affectation of confusion how you startled me I declare you made me raise the adnatus of my visual organs like one of the honest genus when the clouds are charged with electrical fluid, whilst my heart leaped from its transverse position on my diaphragm and seemed to stick like a great bone right across my esophagus. How wretched am I to have occasioned fears in that lovely bosom! <clears throat> Might I hope to be indulged with a short interview? In a moment, dear Mr. Abelard, I will attend to you. I will but just finish my directions. The Duke, you know, gives a grand dinner today, and my heart palpitates in my bosom with fear lest I should commit some error. These town-bred people are so particular. You need not fear any scrutiny. La, Mr. Abelard. Eustace, addressing the butler, mind you must take care not to bring any variety of wines to the table nothing is drunk now but port and sherry and even they are going out of fashion have plenty of strong ale however and porter for they are now reckoned the most elegant liquors for the ladies i shall do my utmost endeavour to obey your injunctions madam said eustace bowing respectfully but i cannot imagine that any species of corn even if it have undergone the vinous fermentation can produce a liquid so agreeable to the palate as well as conducive to the sanity of the body as the juice of the grape cannot you spare a single moment to listen to me sighed abelard i have nearly done i have only to beg that you evelina and cecilia addressing the housemaids will carefully superintend the arrangement of the dormitories let the air out of the beds and reinflate them examine the elastic spring mattresses mend the gossamer curtains sweep the velvet carpets and take care the tubes for withdrawing the decomposed air and admitting the fresh are in proper order also clean out the baths attached to each chamber and take care there is an abundant supply of water 
I am told that abolition in the common aqueous fluid is becoming more fashionable than any medicated baths, said Evelina. And that some people of rank actually use a composition of alkali and oil to remove the pulverous particles that may have lodged upon their epidermis in the course of the day. I fear from the commands you have issued, madam, rejoined Cecilia, that you were oblivious of the alteration that has been effected in the superior dormitory. The air there is no longer changed by means of tubes, but there is a fan-feather ventilator fixed in the ceiling, which by its gentle undulations occasions a free circulation of the aeriform fluid. I do not think, however, it is quite adequate to supply the place of the tubes, as upon entering the room this morning I perceived a strong sensation of azote, and found the proportion of nitrogen more than trebled that of oxygen throughout the whole apartment. I am sorry for it, but as it cannot be avoided, we must submit. Now, Mr. Abelard, I am ready to attend you. I have taken the liberty of, of wishing, said the butler, in his turn affecting confusion, to show you a little poetry. These are some verses of my own, in the acromonogrammatic style, only every line begins with the same word which the last ended instead of the same letter. Will you permit me to read them to you? Mrs. Russell graciously simpered assent, and Abelard, unfolding the paper, read as follows. On Love Of all the powers in heaven above, above all others, triumphs love. Love rules the soul, the heart invades, invades the cities and the shades. Shades form no shelter from its power. Power trembles in his courtly bower. Bower of beauty, art thou free? Free thou art not, nor canst thou be. Be every other class released. Released from love thy woes increased. Increased by all the weight of care. Care flowing from complete despair. Charming, exclaimed Mrs. Russell. Only I own I don't understand why despair comes in the last line. Despair, despair, oh, to rhyme with care, my Eloisa. I hope I shall have no other reason to talk of despair. Oh, dear Mr. Abelard, do not endeavor to take undue advantage of my tenderness. Forbid heaven, exclaimed he, taking her hand, when their love scene was cruelly interrupted by the unexpected sight of Edric, who happened at this moment to pass in Lord Gustavus de Montfort's balloon. The recognition was mutual, and Edric was so exceedingly agitated by this encounter which convinced him that his father was in town, that he determined to delay his journey no longer, as his dread of meeting him was excessive. He therefore resolved to seek his tutor, and, if he found him inclined to procrastinate, to set off without him. On reaching the doctor's chambers, however, he found half his uneasiness converted into laughter at the ludicrous situation of the poor philosopher who, surrounded as he was on every side by a crowd of tradesmen clamorous for orders, looked something like mercury encircled by a tribe of discontented ghosts upon the banks of the Styx. "'Yes, yes, Mr. Jones,' said he, "'I see you understand me. "'Those coats are to be woven in machines, "'where the wool is stripped off the sheep's back by one end, "'and the coat comes out completely made "'in the newest fashion at the other.' "'Very well, sir,' said Mr. Jones, "'wagging his ears in token of assent. "'For in those days of universal education, "'even the muscles of the head were trained to perform functions "'which in former days it was only supposed possible they might attain. "'You are quite right, sir. "'No person of fashion ever wears anything else now.' "'Oh, Edric!' 
cried the doctor. I shall be ready to attend to you directly. And so, Mrs. Celestina, you must make the soup, if you please, waterproof. And you, Mr. Crispin, must have the boots ready to dissolve at a moment's notice. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what a perplexity I am in. My head is going just like a steamboat at the rate of sixty miles an hour. Upon my word, doctor, said Edric, looking round in dismay, if we are to take half the things assembled here, I do not know where we shall find a balloon large enough and strong enough to raise us from the ground. I will show you one, replied the doctor mysteriously, and solemnly drawing forth from his bosom a key, which appeared to have been suspended by a ribbon from his neck, he slowly opened, with great difficulty, a secret drawer in his escritoire, and produced from its inmost recesses a small bottle of Indian rubber. The gravity of the doctor's manner, and the length of time that he had employed in this operation, had excited Edric's curiosity, and he burst into a violent and uncontrollable fit of laughter when he saw the result. "'What is the matter, Edric?' asked the doctor with the utmost solemnity. "'What can be the occasion of this unceremonious and ill-timed levity?' "'Parturient mountains, my dear doctor,' replied Edric, still laughing. "'You know the rest.' "'Ridicule, Edric,' said the doctor gravely, "'is by no means the test of truth. "'Fools often, nay, generally, laugh at what they cannot understand.' and when I shall have explained the motives of my conduct, I trust you will feel ashamed of your present weak and unseasonable mirth. Calchuk, Edric, is a substance capable of astonishing dilation and contraction. Whilst the peculiar elasticity and tenacity of its fibres give it a strength and solidity very rare in bodies when in a state of extreme tension, but before I inform you of the novel use to which I intend to apply it, there are very several extraordinary phenomena relating to elastic bodies, which I am happy to have an apposite opportunity of explaining to you. Edric yawned. You know, elastic substances have the power of wonderfully resisting a force which would annihilate solids apparently infinitely stronger than themselves, as a feather bed would repulse a cannonball that would penetrate with ease through a thick table. Now the reason for this is evident. The elastic body has the power of summoning all its forces to its assistance, for the effect of a blow may be traced even to its remotest extremity whereas the solid substance can only oppose its enemy by the mere resistance of the identical part struck. Certainly, said Edric, striving to suppress a yawn, nothing can be more clear. Nothing, resumed the doctor. I was sure you would admire the force of my reasoning. Indeed, I see the excess of your admiration in the involuntary yawns in which you have been indulging. On some occasions, Edric, man shakes off the artificial restraints of society, and breaks forth into the full freedom of honest and unsophisticated nature. Thus it was with you, Edric. In ancient times, the extension of the jaws was held synonymous with the extension of the understanding, and the opening of the mouth and eyes was considered as the greatest possible sign of pleasure that could be given. In the works of an ancient author, whose poetry was doubtless once esteemed very fine, since it is now quite unintelligible, we find the following passage. And Hodge stood lost in wide-mouth speculation. Again, his eyes and mouth the hero opened wide. And divers others, which... "'We will leave till a more convenient opportunity, if you please,' said Edric, interrupting him. "'At present do favour me with your attention for five minutes. We cannot take all these things.' "'Why not?' asked the doctor, gazing at his pupil with surprise. "'For my part, I do not think we can dispense with a single article.' These cloaks, said Edric, and those hampers, for instance, cannot be of the slightest use. 
"'I beg your pardon,' returned the doctor. "'The cloaks are of asbestos, and will be necessary to protect us from ignition "'if we should encounter any electric matter in the clouds. "'And the hampers are filled with elastic plugs for our ears and noses, "'and tubes and barrels of common air for us to breathe when we get beyond the atmosphere of the earth. "'But what occasion shall we have to go beyond it? "'How can we do otherwise?' "'Surely you don't mean to travel the whole distance in a balloon. "'I thought, of course, you would adopt the present fashionable mode of travelling, "'and after mounting the seventeen miles or thereabouts "'which is necessary to get clear of the mundane attraction, "'to wait there till the turning of the globe "'should bring Egypt directly under our feet. "'But it is not in the same latitude. "'True. I did not think of that. "'Well, then.' sighing deeply i suppose we must do without the hamper certainly and without those boxes and bottles too i hope oh no we can't do without those those bottles contain my magic elixir that cures all diseases merely by the smell a new idea that you know it has been long discovered that the whole materia medica might be carried in a ring and that all the instruments of surgery might be compressed into a walking stick but the idea of sniffing health in a pinch of snuff is i flatter myself exclusively my own very likely but we cannot be encumbered with your panagea in our aerial tour then that box contains my portable galvanic battery, that my apparatus for making and collecting the inflammable air, and that my machine for producing and concentrating the quicksilver vapor, which is to serve as the propelling power to urge us onwards in place of steam. And these bladders are filled with laughing gas, for the sole purpose of keeping up our spirits." the first three will be useful said edric but i will positively have no more adieu adieu then my precious treasures exclaimed the doctor looking sorrowfully around dear offspring of my cares children of my mind and i must leave you to some rude hand which heedless of your inestimable worth may scatter your beauties to the wind alas alas breakfast is ready and my lord is waiting interrupted the shrill voice of one of lord gustavus's servants then we must go said the doctor and the rest of his pathetic lamentation remained for ever buried in his own bosom lord gustavus was already seated when they entered the room with two gentlemen who he introduced to our travellers as lord noodle and lord doodle these noble lords were both counsellors of the state as well as their illustrious host, and had attained that high honour in exactly the same way, viz. They had both succeeded their respective fathers. It was not easy to be very diffuse in their description, as they were members of that honourable and numerous fraternity, who never take the trouble of judging for themselves, but contentedly swim with the stream whichever way it may flow, and have nothing about them to distinguish them in the slightest degree from the crowd. Lord Gustavus was at present their leading star, and they might very appropriately be termed his satellites. Thus, when any new idea was started, they cautiously refrained from giving an opinion till they found what he thought of it they would then look wise shake their heads and say exactly so certainly nobody can doubt it or some of those other convenient ripieno phrases which fill up so agreeably the pauses in the conversation without requiring any troublesome exertion of the mental powers of either the hearer or the speaker these gentlemen had now visited Lord Gustavus for the purpose of accompanying him and Edric to the Queen's Levy, and, as soon as they had taken breakfast, the whole party, with the exception of Dr. Entwerfen, proceeded to court. When arrived there, however, they found the Queen had not yet risen. "'Her Majesty is late this morning,' observed Lord Maysworth, a gentleman loaded with orders and decorations, addressing Lord Gustavus. 
"'I am not surprised,' said his lordship, "'for her most gracious majesty told me the other day "'that she has slept badly for some time. "'Which of course caused you great grief,' asked Dr. Hardman, "'a little satirical-looking gentleman in a bob-wig. "'Thinking as I think,' said Lord Gustavus gravely, "'and as I am sure everyone here must think, or at least ought to think, "'Her Majesty's want of sleep is a circumstance of very serious importance.' "'Oh, very!' exclaimed Lord Noodle, shaking his head. "'Most assuredly!' cried Lord Doodle, shaking his. "'Why?' demanded the doctor. "'Of what possible consequence can it be to her subjects "'whether Her Majesty sleeps soundly or has the nightmare?' "'Of the greatest consequence,' replied Lord Gustavus solemnly. "'Nothing can be greater!' echoed his satellites. "'Well,' observed Lord Maysworth, "'for my part I am such a traitor as to think we might exist, "'even if the Queen did not sleep at all. "'Or if she slept forever,' rejoined the doctor significantly. "'Oh, fie!' cried Lord Gustavus. "'What would become of us if the great sun of the political hemisphere were to set?' "'We must watch the rising of another, I suppose,' said Lord Maysworth. "'Yes,' continued Dr. Hardman, "'and then the energies of the people would be roused. "'They want awakening from their present slumber. "'They have slept too long under the paralyzing effects of tyranny. "'The government wants reform. "'Corruption has eaten it to its root, "'and it must be eradicated ere England can be free or its people happy.' Would to heaven I might live to aid in the glorious struggle, that I might seek the people assert their right, and the fiend despotism sink below their blows. I have ever admired, said Lord Maysworth, the high integrity and fine principles of the worthy doctor, which have not only obtained for him the applause of England, but the admiration of Europe. The courage wisdom and purity of his mind cannot be too highly extolled and all who know him concur in calling him the firm and devoted friend of mankind i also have been a humble supporter of plans of economy and retrenchment and it was I who had the honor of suggesting to the council the other day that a humble position should be presented to Her Majesty, requesting her respectfully to order a diminution of the lights in her saloon, proving incontestably that there were at least six more than were absolutely necessary. Thinking as I think, and as I am sure everyone here must think, began Lord Gustavus, but ere he had time to finish his exordium when the folding doors at the back of the audience chamber were thrown open and the queen appeared sitting upon a gorgeous throne and surrounded by the officers of her household all splendidly attired the usual ceremonies then took place claudia smiled graciously on edric as he kissed her hand and inquired when he intended to depart edric informed her on the morrow when, condescending to express regret, and desiring to see him on his return, she wished him an agreeable voyage, and dismissed him. It is one of the most glorious attributes of greatness to have the power of giving great pleasure by saying very few words. Yet, as during their ride home, Lord Gustavus could talk of nothing but the graciousness of the Queen— upon which he was still expatiating when the balloon stopped. Edric, though he felt grateful for her kindness, was annoyed by hearing so much said of it, and hastened to leave him as soon as he possibly could with propriety. On his road to his own apartment, he heard a strange and fearful noise, like the voice of someone screaming in an agony of rage and pain, which seemed to proceed from the chamber appropriated to his learned tutor, and he was going thither to ascertain the cause when the agitated form of the unfortunate philosopher burst upon him. Sad, indeed, was the condition in which this splendid ornament of the twenty-second century now presented himself before the eyes of his astonished pupil. His face glowed like fire— his hat was off, 
and water streamed from every part of his body till he looked like the effigy of a water deity in a fountain. Here is management, cried he, as soon as his rage permitted him to speak. Here is treatment for one devoted to the service of mankind, but I will be revenged, and centuries yet to come shall tremble at my wrath. In this manner he continued, and being too much occupied in these awful denunciations to be able to give any information as to what calamity had brought him into this unseemly plight, it will be necessary to go back a little to explain it for him. When Dr. Entwerfen left the breakfast-room of Lord Gustavus, which he did not do till a considerable time after the rest of the party had quitted it, he was so absorbed in meditation that he did not know exactly which way he was going, and happening unfortunately to turn to the right, when he should have gone to the left, to his infinite surprise he found himself in the kitchen instead of his own study. Absent as the doctor was, however, his attention was soon roused by the scene before him. Being like many of his learned brotherhood somewhat of a gourmand, his indignation was violently excited by finding the cook comfortably asleep on a sofa on one side of the room, whilst the meat intended for dinner, a meal it was then the fashion to take about noon, was as comfortably resting itself from its toils on the other. The chemical substitute for fire, which ought to have cooked it, having gone out, and the cook's nap precluding all reasonable expectation of its reillumination, the doctor's wrath was kindled, even though the fire was not, and in a violent rage he seized the gentle Celestina's shoulder and shook her till she woke. "'Where am I?' exclaimed she, opening her eyes. "'Anywhere but where you ought to be,' cried the doctor in a fury. "'Look, hussy!' Look at that fine joint of meat lying quite cold and sodden in its own steam. Dear me, returned Celestina, yawning, I am really quite unfortunate today. An unlucky accident has already occurred to a leg of mutton, which was to have formed part of today's aliments, and now this piece of beef is also destroyed. I am afraid there will be nothing for dinner but some mucilaginous saccharine vegetables, and they most probably will be boiled to a viscous consistency. And what excuse can you offer for all of this? exclaimed the doctor, his voice trembling with passion. It was unavoidable, replied Celestina coolly. While I was copying a cast from the Apollo Belvedere this morning, having unguardedly applied too much caloric to the vessel containing the leg of mutton, the aqueous fluid in which it was immersed evaporated, and the viand became completely calcined, which the other affair— Hush, hush, interrupted the doctor. I cannot bear to hear you mention it. Oh, surely Job himself never suffered such a trial of his patience. In fact, his troubles were scarcely worth mentioning, for he was never cursed with learned servants— Saying this, the doctor retired, lamenting his hard fate in not having been born in those halcyon days when cooks drew nothing but their poultry, whilst the gentle Celestina's breath panted with indignation at his complaint. An opportunity soon offered for revenge, and, seeing the doctor's steam-valet ready to be carried to its master's chamber— she treacherously applied a double portion of caloric, in consequence of which the machine burst while in the act of brushing the doctor's coat-collar, and by discharging the whole of the scalding water contained in its cauldron upon him, reduced him to the melancholy state that we have already mentioned. The fear of ridicule attached to this incident, in a great measure, reconciled the doctor to Edric's project of a speedy departure and the following morning they bade adieu to Lord Gustavus, and stepping into their balloon, sailed for Egypt. End of Volume 1, Chapter 8、Chapter、9 of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century, by Jane Loudon. Volume 1, Chapter 9. No event of any importance occurred to our travelers in the course of their aerial voyage. They were too well provided with all kinds of necessaries to have any occasion to rest by the way. And in an incredibly short space of time, they were hovering over Egypt. Different, however, oh, how different from the Egypt of the 19th century, was the fertile country which now lay like a map beneath their feet. Improvement had turned her gigantic steps towards its once deserted plains. Commerce had waved her magic wand, and towns and cities, manufactories and canals spread in all directions. No more did the Nile overflow its banks. A thousand channels were cut to receive its waters. No longer did the moving sands of the desert rise in mighty waves, threatening to overwhelm the wayworn traveler. MacAdamized turnpike roads supplied their place, over which post chaises with anti attrition wheels bowled at the rate of fifteen miles an hour. Steamboats glided down the canals, and furnaces raised their smoky heads amidst groves of palm trees, whilst iron railways intersected orange groves, and plantations of dates and pomegranates might be seen bordering excavations intended for coal pits colonies of english and americans peopled the country and produced a population that swarmed like bees over the land and surpassed in numbers even the wondrous throngs of the ancient mizraim race whilst industry and science changed desolation into plenty and had converted barren plains into fertile kingdoms amidst all these revolutions however the pyramids still raised their gigantic forms towering to the sky unchanged unchangeable grand simple and immovable fit symbols of that majestic nature they were intended to represent and seeming to look down with contempt upon the ephemeral structures with which they were surrounded as though they would have said had utterance been permitted to them avaunt ye nothings of the day respect our dignity and sink into your original obscurity for know that we alone are monarchs of the plains indestructible however as they had proved themselves even their granite sides had not been able entirely to resist the corroding influence of the smoke with which they were now surrounded and a slight crumbling announced the first outward symptom of decay still however though blackened and disfigured they shone stupendous monuments of former greatness and edric and his tutor gazed upon them with an awe that for some moments deprived them of utterance the doctor however who was too fond of reasoning ever long to remain willingly silent after surveying them a few minutes broke forth as follows what noble piles what majesty and grandeur they display in their formation and yet what dignified simplicity can the imagination of man conceive anything more sublime than the thought that they have stood thus frowning in awful magnificence perhaps since the very creation of the world without equals without even competitors mocking the feeble efforts of man to divine their origin and seeing generation after generation pass away whilst they still remain immutable and involved in the same deep and unfathomable mystery as at first it is very strange observed edric that in this age of speculation and discovery nothing certain should be known concerning them it is returned the doctor but the thick mysterious veil that has rested upon them for so many ages seems not intended to be removed by mortal hands it remind one of the sublime inscription upon the temple of the goddess isis at sais i am whatever was whatever is and whatever shall be but no mortal has as yet presumed to raise the veil that covers me your question is apt doctor resumed edric for both relate to nature indeed nature appears to be the deity which the ancient egyptians worshipped under all the various forms in which she presents herself and their strange and animal deities were but reverenced as her symbols it was nature which they worshipped as isis it was nature that was typified in the pyramids and the good taste of the egyptians made them prefer the simple the majestic and the sublime in those works which they destined to last for ages formerly 
from the immensity of their population and high state of their civilization labor was so divided and consequently so lightened that multitudes were enabled to exist exempt from toil these persons devoting themselves to study became initiati and either enrolled themselves amongst the priesthood or passed their lives in making themselves masters of the most abstract sciences the consequences were natural they followed up the ramifications of creation to their original source they penetrated into the most profound secrets of nature and traced all her wonders in her works aware however of the taste of the vulgar for anything above their comprehension and of the natural craving of the human mind for mystery they wrapped the discoveries they had made in a deep impenetrable veil and concealed awful and sublime significations under the meanest and most disgusting images you are right said the doctor in your observations upon the religion of the ancient egyptians but it does not appear to me that the pyramids were erected by them what i suppose you draw your conclusions from the want of hieroglyphics in their principal chambers and from what herodotus says of their having been erected by a shepherd you think they were the work of the pallic race no though i allow much may be said in favor of that hypothesis particularly as herodotus says the kings under whom they were erected ordered all the egyptian temples to be closed which we know the shepherd or pallic sovereigns did but i cannot imagine that an ignorant goth-like race of shepherds men accustomed to live in tents or in the open air and possessing no talents but for war were capable of constructing such immense piles no no the pyramids required gigantic conceptions highly cultivated minds and unwearied perseverance all qualities quite incompatible with a warlike wandering race i do not think the palli were capable of imagining such structures much less of constructing them i think they were the work of evil spirits evil spirits exclaimed edric yes returned the doctor we are told that the evil spirits after their expulsion from paradise were under the command of the sultan or soliman giam ben giam as he is called by arabic writers but who is supposed to have been the same as cheops and i think that he employed them in this vast work i do not know by what analysis etymologists can draw the name of cheops from that of giam ben giam but supposing the fact to be correct that they designated the same person i think it only proves more strongly my hypothesis for the pali came from mount caucasus where the evil spirits were said to have been enchained and if cheops was a pallic king it is possible the egyptians might poetically call their conquerors evil spirits that is a good idea edric although i do not think it by any means certain that cheops was a pallic king however we shall soon be able to see his tomb and judge for ourselves for we have now approached near enough to the pyramids to descend for oh, what a smoke and what a noise it is enough to rouse the mummies from their slumbers before their appointed time and without the aid of galvanism have you opened the valves edric oh yes i perceive we are getting lower we will not lose a moment before we visit the pyramid but what a crowd of brutes are assembled to witness our arrival they stare as though they had never seen a balloon before egypt is certainly a fine country but the inhabitants are a century behind us in civilization an immense crowd had gathered together to witness the descent of our travellers and they did indeed stand staring lost in stupid astonishment at the strange sight that presented itself for though the egyptian people had occasionally seen balloons they had never before beheld one made of indian rubber the odd figure of the doctor too amused them exceedingly as he sat wrapped up in the most dignified manner in an asbestos cloak his bob wig pushed a little on one side from the heat of the weather and the warmth of his argument his round red oily face attempting to look solemn and his little fat punchy figure trying to assume an air of majesty the egyptians were amazingly struck with this apparition and being like most colonists somewhat conceited and not very ceremonious in their manners they looked at him a few minutes in silence and then burst into immoderate fits of laughter the doctor was exceedingly indignant at this rude reception 
and rising shook his fist at them in anger a manoeuvre that only redoubled the mirth of the unpolished egyptians whose peals of laughter now became so tremendous that they actually shook the skies and occasioned a most unpleasant vibration in the balloon edric who was almost as much annoyed as the doctor had yet sufficient self-command to continue calmly making preparations for his descent and without taking the least notice of the crowd below he screwed the top upon the propelling vapor bottle he let the inflammable air escape from the balloon which rapidly collapsed as they approached the earth and throwing out their patent spring grappling irons they caught one of the lower stones of the great pyramid and in a few moments the car in which our travellers were sitting was safely moored at a convenient distance from the earth for them to alight edric now unloosed the descending ladder and reverentially assisted the doctor who was encumbered with his long cloak to reach terra firma in safety amidst the bustle and exclamations of the crowd who thronged round them expressing their wonder and astonishment audibly in broad english where the deuce did this spring from cried one the car would load a wagon and what is gone with the balloon said another it is clean vanished well i never saw such a thing in all my life before exclaimed a third i think they must be come from the moon hush hush cried an old gentleman bustling amongst them who seemed as one having authority what's the matter what's the matter we are strangers sir said edric advancing and addressing him we come here to see the wonders of your country and we wish to explore the pyramids but the reception we have met with say no more say no more interrupted the worthy justice for such he was get about your business you rapscallions or i'll read the riot act here gregory call out the posse comitatus and set a guard of constables to keep watch over these gentlemen's balloon whilst they go to explore the pyramids eh but where is the balloon i don't see it i hope neither of the gentlemen has put it in his pocket laughing at his own wit no sir returned edric smiling though it is a feat which might easily be accomplished for that is our balloon pointing to the cow chowk bottle now shrunk to its original dimensions very strange that said the justice very curious very curious indeed well gentlemen if you wish to proceed immediately you'll want a guide of course these cottages at the foot of the pyramids are all inhabited by guides who get their living by showing the sights they are sad rogues most of them but i can recommend you to one who is a very honest man here samuel continued he knocking against the small door samuel i say samuel made his appearance in the guise of a tall raw-boned stupid-looking fellow with a pair of immensely broad stooping shoulders which looked as though he could have relieved atlas occasionally of his burthen without much trouble to himself coming forth from his hut in an awkward shambling pace he scratched his head and demanded what his honour pleased to want you must show these gentlemen the pyramid said the justice ay that i will with pleasure returned samuel i've got my living by showing them these fifty years man and boy and i know every crink and cranny of them though i am old now and somewhat lame so walk this way gentlemen we are very much obliged to you sir said the doctor bowing to the justice who was in fact one of those good-natured busy bustling men who are always better pleased to transact any other person's business than their own and are never so happy as when a new arrival gives them an opportunity of showing off their consequence indeed there is a pleasure in showing wonders to a stranger that only those who have little else to occupy their minds can properly estimate a man of this kind feels his self-love gratified by the superiority his local knowledge gives him over a stranger and as it is perhaps the only chance he can ever have of showing superiority they must be unreasonable who blame him for making the most of it justice freemantle was accordingly exceedingly delighted with travellers who seemed disposed to submit implicitly to his dictation and he returned a most gracious reply to the doctor's thanks don't mention it don't mention it my dear sir said he i am never so happy as when i can make myself useful is there anything else i can do for you 
you may command me i assure you and you may depend upon it no injury shall be done to your luggage whilst you are away what a very civil obliging good-natured old gentleman said the doctor as they walked towards the entrance of the pyramids i declare he almost reconciles me to the country though i own i thought at first the people were the greatest brutes i had ever met with which pyramid does your honor wish to see asked the guide that which contains the tomb of cheops man cried the doctor solemnly who encumbered with his long cloak and loaded with his walking stick and galvanic battery had some difficulty in getting on won't your honor let me carry that pole and that box said the man you'd get on a surprising deal better if you would avaunt wretch exclaimed the doctor nor offer to touch with thy profane fingers the immortal instruments of science the man stared but fell back and the whole party walked on in perfect silence in the meantime edric had advanced before his companions completely lost in meditation a crowd of conflicting thoughts rushed through his mind and now when he found himself at the very goal of his wishes the daring nature of the purpose he had so long entertained seemed to strike him for the first time and he trembled at the consequences that might attend the completion of his desires with his arms folded on his breast he stood gazing on the pyramids whilst his ideas wandered uncontrolled through the boundless regions of space and what am i thought he weak feeble worm that i am who dare seek to penetrate into the awful secrets of my creator why should i wish to restore animation to a body now resting in the quiet of the tomb what right have i to renew the struggles the pains the cares and the anxieties of mortal life how can i tell the fearful effects that may be produced by the gratification of my unearthly longing may i not revive a creature whose wickedness may involve mankind in misery and what if my experiment should fail and if the moment when i expect my rash wishes to be accomplished the hand of almighty vengeance should strike me to the earth and heap molten fire on my brain to punish my presumption the sound of human voices as the doctor and the guide approached grated harshly on the nerves of edric already overstrained by the awful nature of the thoughts in which he had been indulging and he turned away involuntarily to escape the interruption he dreaded quite forgetting for the moment from whom the sounds most probably proceeded lord have mercy on us said the guide i declare that gentleman looks as if he were beside himself and see there if he hasn't walked right by the entrance to the pyramid without seeing it sir sir hallooed he excessively annoyed but recalled to his recollection by these shouts edric returned these pyramids are wonderful piles said the doctor as he stumbled forward to meet him i really had no adequate conception of the enormity of their size they did not even look half so large at a distance as they do now immense masses seldom do replied edric compelling himself with difficulty to speak true returned the doctor the simplicity and uniformity of their figure deceive the eyes and it is only when we approach them that we feel their stupendous magnitude and our own insignificance they give an amazing idea of the grandeur of the ancient kings of egypt said edric without exactly knowing what he was saying their palaces must have been superb if they had such mausoleums how absurdly you reason edric replied the doctor peevishly for being annoyed with the, his burthens and his cloak he was not in a humor to bear contradiction i thought we had settled that question before in the first place i think it very doubtful whether the egyptians had anything to do with the building of these monuments and if they had i believe they were meant for temples not mausoleums and in the next place even if they were intended for tombs their greatness affords no argument for the splendor of the surrounding palaces as the egyptians were celebrated for the superiority of their burying places and for the immense sums they expended upon them indeed you know ancient writers say they went so far as to call the houses of the living only inns whilst they considered tombs as everlasting habitations a circumstance by the way as strongly corroborates my hypothesis at least as far as their opinions go as it seems to imply that both soul and body were designed to remain there they had now entered the pyramid and were proceeding with infinite difficulty along a low dark 
narrow passage observe edric said the doctor how the difficulty and obscurity of these winding passages confirm my opinion you know the religion of the ancient egyptians like that of the ancient hindus was one of penances and personal privations and granting that to be the case what can be more simple than that the passages the initiati had to traverse before they reached the aditum should be painful and difficult of access besides this as you know the bones of a bull no doubt those of the god apis were found in a sarcophagus in the second pyramid it seems probable that it was sacred to his worship and its vicinity to the nile which was indispensable to the temples of apis as when it was time for him to die he was drowned in its waters confirms the fact indeed i am only surprised that any human being possessing a grain of common sense can entertain a single doubt upon the subject how do you account for the tomb we are about to visit being placed in the pyramid if you think they were only designed for temples asked edric the question is futile said the doctor a strange fancy prevailed in former times that burying the dead in consecrated places particularly in temples intended for divine worship would scare away the evil spirits and the practice actually prevailed in england even as lately as the nineteenth or twentieth century indeed it was not till after the country had been almost depopulated by the dreadfully infectious disease which prevailed about two hundred years ago that a law was passed to prevent the interment of the dead in london and that those previously buried in and near the churches there were exhumed and placed in cemeteries beyond the walls edric did not reply for in fact his ideas were so absorbed by the solemn object before him that it was painful for him to speak and the doctor's ill-timed reasoning created such an irritation of his nerves that he found it required the utmost exertion of his self-command to endure it patiently the passage they were traversing now became higher and wider shelving off occasionally into chambers or recesses on each side till they approached a kind of vestibule in the center of which yawned a deep dark gloomy-looking cavity like a well we must descend that shaft said the guide and that will lead us to the tomb of king cheops but as the road is dark and rather dangerous we had better each of us take a torch as he spoke he drew some torches from a niche where they were deposited and began to illuminate them from his own the red glare of the torches flashed fearfully on the massive walls of the pyramid throwing part of their enormous masses into deep shadow as they rose in solemn and sublime dignity around and seemed frowning upon the presumptuous mortals who had dared to invade their recesses whilst the deep pit beneath their feet seemed to yawn wide to engulf them in its abyss edric's heart beat thick it throbbed till he even fancied its pulsations audible and a strange mysterious thrilling of anxiety mingled with a wild undefinable delight ran through his frame a few short hours and his wishes would be gratified or set at rest for ever the doctor and the guide had already begun to descend and their figures seemed changed and unearthly as the gleams of the torches fell upon them edric gazed for a moment and then followed with feelings worked up almost to frenzy by the over excitement of his nerves whilst the hollow sounds that re-echoed from the walls as they struck against them in their descent thrilled through his whole frame no one spoke and after proceeding for some time along a narrow path or rather a ledge formed on the sides of the cavity which gradually shelved downwards the guide suddenly stopped and touching a secret spring a solid block of granite slowly detached itself from the wall and rising majestically like the portcullis of an ancient fortress showed the entrance to a dark and dreary cave the guide advanced followed by our travellers into a gloomy vaulted apartment where long vistas of ponderous arches stretched on every side till their termination was lost in darkness and gave a feeling of immensity and obscurity to the scene i will wait here said the guide and here if you please you had better leave your torches that avenue will lead you to the tomb the travellers obeyed and the guide placing himself in a recess in the wall extinguished all the torches except one which he shrouded so as to leave the travellers in total darkness nothing could be now more terrific than their situation 
immured in the recesses of the tomb involved in darkness and their bosoms throbbing with hopes that they scarcely dared avow even to themselves with faltering steps they proceeded slowly along the path the guide had pointed out shuddering even at the hollow echo of their own footsteps which alone broke the solemn silence that reigned throughout these fearful regions of terror and the tomb suddenly a vivid light flashed upon them and as they advanced they found it proceeded from torches placed in the hands of two colossal figures who placed in a sitting posture seemed guarding an enormous portal surmounted by the image of a fox the constant guardian of an egyptian tomb the immense dimensions and air of grandeur and repose about these colossi had something in it very imposing and our travellers felt the sensation of awe creep over them as they gazed upon their calm unmoved features so strikingly emblematic of that immutable nature which they were doubtless placed there to typify it was with feelings of indescribable solemnity that the doctor and edric passed through this majestic portal and found themselves in an apartment gloomily illuminated by the light shed faintly from an inner chamber through ponderous brazen gates beautifully wrought the light thus feebly emitted showed that the room in which they stood was dedicated to typhon the evil spirit as his fierce and savage types covered the walls and images of his symbols the crocodile and the dragon placed beneath the shadow of the brazen gates and dimly seen by the imperfect light seemed starting into life and grimly to forbid the farther advance of the intruders our travellers shuddered and opening with trembling hand the ponderous gates they entered the tomb of cheops in the centre of the chamber stood a superb highly ornamented sarcophagus of alabaster beautifully wrought over this hung a lamp of wondrous workmanship supplied by a potent mixture so as to burn for ages unconsumed thus awfully lighting up with perpetual flame the solemn mansions of the dead and typifying life eternal even in the silent tomb around the room on marble benches were arranged mummies simply dried apparently those of slaves and close to the sarcophagus was placed one contained in a case which the doctor approached to examine this was supposed to be that of sores the confidant and prime minister of cheops the chest that enclosed the body was splendidly ornamented with embossed gilt leather whilst the parts not otherwise covered were stained with red and green curiously blended and of a vivid brightness the mighty ta the jupiter of the egyptians spread its widely extended wings over the head grasping in his monstrous claws a ring the emblem of eternity whilst below the vulture form of rhea proclaimed the deceased a votary of that powerful deity and on the sides were innumerable hieroglyphics the doctor removed the lid and shuddered as the crimson tinge of the everlasting lamp fell upon the hideous and distorted features thus suddenly exhibited to view this sepulchral light indeed added unspeakable horror to the scene and its peculiar glare threw such a wild and demoniac expression on the dark lines and ghastly lineaments of the mummies that even the doctor felt his spirits depressed and a supernatural dread creep over his mind as he gazed upon them in the meantime edric had stood gazing upon the sarcophagus of cheops the sides of which were beautifully sculptured with groups of figures which from the peculiar light thrown upon them seemed to possess all the force and reality of life on one side was represented an armed and youthful warrior bearing off in his arms a beautiful female on whom he gazed with the most passionate fondness he was pursued by a crowd of people and soldiers who seemed rending the air with vehement exclamations against his violence and endeavoring in vain to arrest his progress whilst in the background appeared an old man who was tearing his hair and wringing his hands in ineffectual rage against the ravisher the other side presented the same old man wrestling with the youthful warrior who had just overpowered and stabbed him the helpless victim raising his withered hands and failing eyes to heaven as he fell as though to implore vengeance upon his murderer whilst the crimson current was fast ebbing from his bosom the dying look and agony of the old man were forcibly depicted whilst upon the features of the youthful warrior glowed the fury of a demon 
the sarcophagus was supported by the lion emblem of royalty the symbol of the solar god horus and above it sat the majestic hawk of osiris gazing upwards and unmindful of the subtle crocodile of typhon that crouching under its feet was just about to seize its breast in its enormous jaws neither of the travellers had as yet spoken for it seemed like sacrilege to disturb the awful stillness that prevailed even by a whisper indeed the solemn aspect of the chamber thrilled through every nerve and they moved slowly gliding along with noiseless steps as though they feared prematurely to break the slumbers of the mighty dead it contained they gazed however with deep but undefinable interest upon the sculptured mysteries of the tomb of cheops vainly endeavoring to decipher their meaning whilst as they found their efforts useless a secret voice seemed to whisper in their bosoms and shall finite creatures like these who cannot even explain the significance of objects presented before their eyes presume to dive into the mysteries of their creator's will learn wisdom by this omen nor seek again to explore secrets above your comprehension retire whilst it is yet time soon it will be too late edric started at his own thoughts as the fearful warning soon it will be too late rang in his ears and a fearful presentiment of evil weighed heavily upon his soul he turned to look upon a doctor but he had already seized the lid of the sarcophagus and with a daring hand removed it from its place displaying in the fearful light the royal form that lay beneath for a moment both edric and the doctor paused not daring to survey it and when they did they both uttered an involuntary cry of astonishment as the striking features of the mummy met their eyes for both instantly recognized the sculptured warrior in his traits yes it was indeed the same but the fierce expression of fiery and ungoverned passions depicted upon the countenance of the marble figure had settled down to a calm vindictive and concentrated hatred upon that of its mummy prototype in the tomb awful indeed was the gloom that sat upon that brow and bitter the sardonic smile that curled those haughty lips all was perfect as though life still animated the form before them and it had only reclined there to seek a short repose the dark eyebrows the thick raven hair which hung upon the forehead and the snow-white teeth seen through the half-open lips forbade the idea of death whilst the fiend-like expression of the features made edric shudder as he recollected the purpose that brought him to the tomb and he trembled at the thought of awakening such a fearful being from the torpor of the grave to all the renewed energies of life let us go whispered the doctor to his pupil in a low deep and unearthly tone fearfully different from his usual cheerful voice edric started at the sound for it seemed the last sad warning of his better genius before it abandoned him forever the die however was cast and it was too late to recede edric felt worked up to frenzy by the overwrought feelings of the moment he seized the machine and resolutely advanced towards the sarcophagus whilst the doctor gazed upon him with a horror that deprived him of either speech or motion innumerable folds of red and white linen disposed alternately swathed the gigantic limbs of the royal mummy and upon his breast lay a piece of metal shining like silver and stamped with the figure of a winged globe edric attempted to remove this but recoiled with horror when he found it bend beneath his fingers with an unnatural softness whilst as the flickering light of the lamp fell upon the face of the mummy he fancied its stern features relaxed into a ghastly laugh of scornful mockery worked up to desperation he applied the wires of the battery and put the apparatus in motion whilst a demoniac laugh of derision appeared to ring in his ears and the surrounding mummies seemed starting from their places and dancing in unearthly merriment thunder now roared in tremendous peals through the pyramids shaking their enormous masses to the foundation and vivid flashes of light darted round in quick succession edric stood aghast amidst this fearful convulsion of nature a hard creeping seemed to run through every vein every nerve feeling as though drawn from its extremity and wrapped in icy chillness round his heart still he stood immovable and gazing intently on the mummy whose eyes had opened with the shock 
and were now fixed on those of Edric, shining with supernatural luster. In vain Edric attempted to rouse himself, in vain to turn away from that withering glance. The mummy's eyes still pursued him with their ghastly brightness. They seemed to possess the fabled fascination of those of the rattlesnake, and though he shrank from their gaze, they still glared horribly upon him. Edric's senses swam, yet he could not move from the spot. He remained fixed, chained, and immovable, his eyes still riveted upon those of the mummy, and every thought absorbed in horror. Another fearful peal of thunder now rolled in lengthened vibrations above his head, and the mummy rose slowly, his eyes still fixed upon those of Edric from his marble tomb. The thunder pealed louder and louder, Yells and groans seemed mingled with its roar. The sepulchral lamp flared with redoubled fierceness, flashing its rays around in quick succession and with vivid brightness. Whilst by its horrid and uncertain glare, Edric saw the mummy stretch out its withered hand as though to seize him. He saw it rise gradually. He heard the dry, bony fingers rattle as it drew them forth. He felt its tremendous gripe. Human nature could bear no more. His senses were rapidly deserting him. He felt, however, the fixed steadfast eyes of Cheops still glowing upon his failing orbs as the lamp gave a sudden flash, and then all was darkness. The brazen gates now shut with a fearful clang, and Edric, uttering a shriek of horror, fell senseless upon the ground, whilst his shrill cry of anguish rang wildly through the marble vaults, till its re-echoes seemed like the yell of demons joining in fearful mockery. How long he lay in this state he knew not, but when he reopened his eyes, for the moment he fancied all that had passed a dream. As his senses returned, he recollected where he was, and shuddered to find himself yet in that place of horrors. All now was dark, except a faint gleam that shone feebly through the half-open gates. These ponderous portals slowly unclosed, and the form of a man wrapped in a large cloak and bearing a torch, entered, peering around as it advanced, as though half afraid to proceed. Edric's feelings were too highly wrought to bear any fresh horrors, and he shrieked in agony as the figure approached. The sound of his voice subdued the terrors of the intruder, and the doctor, for it was he, shouted with joy as he rushed forward to embrace him. Edric, Edric, thank God he is alive, exclaimed he. Edric, my beloved Edric, for God's sake, let us leave this den of horrors. Come, come. Reassured by his tutor's voice, Edric arose, and taking one hasty, shuddering glance around as the light gleamed on the sarcophagus, he hurried out of the tomb. Neither he nor the doctor spoke as they passed through the vestibule, where the colossal figures still sat in awful majesty. Indeed, as their torches were extinguished, their gigantic forms looked still more terrific than before, from the wavering and indistinct light thrown upon them. Edric shuddered as he looked, and hurried on with hasty strides to the place where they had left the guide, whom they found kneeling in a corner, hiding his face in his hands, and roaring out, O oh Lord, defend us! Heaven have mercy upon us! Lord have mercy upon us! Heaven have mercy upon us! He has been in that state for more than an hour, said the doctor mournfully, for after I came to myself, I tried to rouse him, but all to no purpose. Then you also fainted, said Edric, with difficulty compelling himself to speak. Why, resumed the doctor with some hesitation, I don't know that you can exactly call it fainting, but the fact was, when I saw you touch the plate upon the mummy's breast and start back, looking so horribly frightened, I, I thought I had better call for assistance. So as I ran for that purpose, somehow or other I fell down and lay insensible. I don't know how long. When I came to myself, I tried to rouse the guide. And when I found I could not, I came to seek you. But now that we are both recovered, I really don't know what is to become of us. For this fellow will never be able to show us the way out. And I'm sure I don't know the road. Let us try to find it at any rate, said Edric faintly. Oh, for God's sake, take me too, screamed the guide. If you have any mercy, don't leave me in this fearful place. 
take the light then and lead the way said edric the guide obeyed shaking in every limb and every now and then casting a terrified look behind whilst the quivering flame of the torch betrayed the unsteadiness of the trembling hands that bore it in this manner they proceeded starting at every sound and frightened even at their own shadows without daring to stop till they reached the plain thank god cried the doctor the moment they stepped out of the pyramid looking round him gasping for breath and inhaling the fresh air with rapture thank god reiterated edric and the guide as they walked rapidly towards the place where they had left their balloon when arrived there however they looked for it in vain and fancying themselves under the influence of a delusion they rubbed their eyes and again looked but without success dear me it is very strange said the doctor this is certainly the place and yet where can it be where indeed repeated edric horrors and unaccountable incidents environ us at every step i am not naturally timid yet ah screamed the doctor as he tumbled over a man lying with his face upon the ground oh groaned he as edric and the guide with difficulty raised him would to heaven i were safe at home again in my own comfortable little study indulging in pleasing anticipations of that which i find is anything in the world but pleasing in reality end of chapter nine of volume one Chapter 10, Volume 1 of The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sally J. The Mummy, A Tale of the 22nd Century by Jane Loudon, Volume 1, Chapter 10. We left Dr. Endwarfen in the last chapter, uttering a very moral, if not new, exclamation on the vanity of human expectations, which had scarcely escaped from his lips ere a cruel fate, resolving not to be accused in vain, supplied him yet with more abundant cause for lamentation. We have before mentioned that the doctor had stumbled as he quitted the pyramids and that his friends raised him from the ground. But what was his consternation and dismay when looking around to thank them he found that he was surrounded by armed men who commanded him in the royal name to surrender sadly the doctor turned his woeful eyes upon edric but alas he was in the same predicament himself and in spite of their entreaties they were marched off to prison without being at all informed of what crime they had committed sadly passed the night and gloomy dawned the day upon the unfortunate travellers whose minds were harassed and bewildered by the extraordinary success of their awful experiment, and whose misery was infinitely increased by the suspense they had to suffer, both on account of their ignorance of the crime of which they were accused and its probable punishment if they were to be found guilty. Soon after daybreak, they were conducted as criminals before the same magistrate the day before who had treated him with such officious kindness. Very different, however, was a solemn judge who, clothed in an insignia of magisterial dignity, now sate upon the bench from the easy, good-tempered gentlemen of the pyramids, and the unlucky travellers saw in an instant that they were not likely to experience any favour from their previous acquaintance with him. The court was thronged with people, and the prisoners saw that they were regarded with curiosity, mingled with horror and supernatural fear. It is not agreeable to feel oneself an object of disgust to any one and though Edric magnanimously and frequently repeated to himself that it was quite indifferent to him with what such ignorant wretches as Egyptians thought of him, yet, if he would have avowed the truth, he would have been quite as well content to have found himself the object of their admiration instead of their hatred, and he would have been very glad to have relinquished both to have been safely at home again, whilst the doctor openly and loudly lamented the much-regretted comforts of his own dear, delightful study at Sir Ambrose's little time however was allowed for reflection for as soon as the prisoners were placed at the bar their examination commenced so gentlemen said the learned judge you stand convicted no i mean you stand accused of the most horrible heinous and sacrilegious offence an offence that makes our hair start with horror from our heads and every separate lock rise upon in vengeance against you the justice paused 
that the prisoners might admire his eloquence. But alas, such was the absorbing nature of self-love that they were only thinking of what was going to be done with them and to what this terrible exordium was likely to lead. After a short pause, Edric, supposing they were expected to speak, addressed the judge and begged to know of what crime they were accused. We are strangers, he said, and gentlemen, we were attracted to your country by an account of wonders that it contained. We declared our purposes openly, and we have effected no concealment. We have done nothing we need to blush to avow. A confused murmur ran through the court as he spoke, expressive of the utmost disgust and abhorrence. But Edric felt indignant, and he looked round proudly as he added, Yes, I repeat, we have done nothing need to blush to avow, and nothing derogatory to our characters as Englishmen and gentlemen. Sorcerers, wizards, demons in disguise, cried the crowd. Down with them, burn them, guillotine them, destroy them. Is this fair? Is this generous? asked Edric. If we have done wrong, let our crime be proved, and we are ready to submit to any punishment you may think proper to inflict, but do not condemn us unheard. In England, every man is deemed innocent until he is proven guilty. You boast of having important and improved upon all the useful regulations of the mother country, and cannot surely have admitted her most glorious law. Let us then have a fair trial, and God forbid that the course of justice should be impeded. You talk well, sir, said the judge, but it is no use here. My chair, sir, is made of witch elm, and the whole court is lined with consecrated wood, so you may take your familiars to another market, for here they will avail you nothing. Good God! exclaimed Edric, wringing his hands. What ignorance! What gross superstitious! And yet, in this man's power are lives. Oh, oh! said the judge, who saw his despair, though he would not exactly know the cause. I have brought to you, have I? Yes, yes. I tell you, no incantations will be of any avail here. And so, clerk, call the witnesses. The first person examined was the man who had been left in charge of the balloon, and he disposed as follows. Why, sir, he said, scratching his head, as though he might have supposed wisdom dwelt in his fingers, and that their touch might give little to his brain. Your honour told me to call you up the post say combatius, and set guard on the constables over the gentleman's whirligig. But I thought as how, seeing it was but a queer-looking thing, and not likely to tempt anybody to steal it, I might as well save the gentlemen from throwing their money away upon the parcel of idle fellows, and keep watch over it myself. And so get the reward instead of them, observed the judge. Why, your honour, said the fellow, grinning, I thought they might give me something that might do me good, but which would be nothing amongst so many. Very true, remarked the judge. Go on, Gregory. Well, continued Gregory, as I was sitting there thinking of nothing at all, and somehow I believe I have fallen into a bit of a doze, I heard a queer sort of buzzing sound, and I opened my eyes, and there I saw a gentleman whirligig buzzing and puffing like a steam engine on fire, and I omits the smoke, I take my oath. I saw the mummy, the king of Cheops, as plain as I see his worship there, sitting on this throne. Oh, groaned the horror-stricken crowd. Oh, groaned the judge and jury. Yes, continued the man, I'll take my oath if it was the last word I had to speak that I saw him there vomiting fire and his big eyes flaring like a fiery furnace. Oh, groaned the judge, crowd, and jury a degree louder than before. And then, resumed Gregory, something went whiz, and off it fled altogether like a flash of lightning. Oh, shrieked the whole court in a convulsion of horror. Some of the fair sex in particular screamed and covered their faces as though they feared the next exploit of the redoubtable magicians would blow up, and the court and send them all flying after the resuscitated mummy. With your permission, sir, said Edric, as soon as the tumult had somewhat abated, this proves nothing against either my friend or myself. We are, in fact, injured by it, and we have a claim against it, instead of your being able to substantiate a charge against us. We left our balloon containing valuable articles and money to a considerable amount. In your charge, or at least to the custody of a man who you recommended, and we quitted the pyramid. We, of course, inquired for our balloon. It had vanished. 
and instead of making us amends for our loss, you throw us into prison and tell us a wild, extravagant story of the disappearance of our property, which no man in his senses could possibly believe. Another confused murmur, though very different in its character from the former, ran through the court in a conclusion of this speech. And the judge, if such an expression be not profane when speaking of the representative of justice, looked most excessively foolish. Had not your worship better call the other witnesses? whispered the clerk, pitying the dilemma of his principal. True, true, said the Lygurkus of Anglo-Egypt. Your observation is premature, young man. When in the case had been proved against you, it will be time enough for you to think of your defense. Edric bowed assent, and the examination continued. The guide was the next witness. Well, Samuel, said the judge, what do you know about this matter? Why, sir, replied Samuel, you see, my dame and I were sitting by the fire, and we'd got a black pudding as we was going to have for our dinners, and so says dame, I likes it cut into slices and fried, and so says I, hold it, fellow, cried the judge, with great dignity. Don't abuse the patience of the court. We have nothing to do with your dame or black pudding. It is quite irrelevant to the matter now before us. Go on. But Samuel could not go on. And like his predecessor in the witness box, he only stood still and scratched his head. Why don't you speak, fellow? asked the clerk. Because I don't know what to say, replied Samuel. You must tell all you know about this affair, pursued the clerk. But I don't know where to begin, rejoined the perplexed witness. His worship says it's irrelevant. Begin with the pyramid said the judge, and if you can give a clear account of all that happened after you left the old passage by the movable block in the wall which was last discovered. Why, I can't say there was anything very particular happened as I know, sir, said Samuel. After that, till we got to the shaft and then we went down, sir, you know, till we came to the tomb of King Cheops. And then I turned the gentlemen in by themselves, as we always does, for the fact as Parson Schnorm calls it, and then I sits me down in the vault, and I wait for him. And just as I rolled myself up and was dozed asleep, I hear such a noise as if the pyramids were coming tumbling around my ears. So I jumped up and I rubbed my eyes, for I did not know very well where I was. And I saw something that I seemed to strike the torches out of the hands of the two great sitting figures and extinguish them. And then I saw a great tall figure come gliding by me. And when he came up to the light, I saw his great flaming eyes. And when I fell upon my knees, he laid a hold of my shoulder and gripped it. Look, your honor, laying bare his shoulder as he spoke and showing the deeply indented marks of the bony figures of the mummy. Again, a groan of horror and indignation ran through the court. And when another witness proved that the sarcophagus of Cheops had been examined and was found empty, the judge seemed to think it was a clear case and called triumphantly upon Edric for his defense. I do not see what has been proved, said Edric, shuddering in spite of himself, can affect either my tutor or myself. These people say that a mummy was revived, and quitting the pyramid in which we had been so long immured, has flown away with our balloon. But, supposing the tale be true, what proof have you that we were at all implicated in the business? We were in the pyramid, it is true, but so was this man as well, whom you have brought forward as a witness against us. Supposing it was the intervention of some human aid that aroused the mummy from its tomb, a fact, by the way, by no means proved, why may not he be the agent instead of us? Why is there to fix the charge against us? Have we gained anything by the adventure? Have we not, the contrary, been serious losers by it? Where is our balloon and the valuable articles contained in it? If we were wizards, it must be confessed that we are very foolish ones, for we have lost our property and thrown ourselves into prison, and without reaping the smallest possible advantage? And if we have the power you seem to attribute to us, why do we have to stay here and be questioned when we might be so easily fly away in a flame of fire or turn to all the statues and walk quietly off without you being able to follow us? Everybody shuddered, and many turned pale at this speech seeming to fear that Edric was about to point out his suggestions to the execution. Whilst the judge seemed posed in the vast perplexity as what he had better determine. And the people were dreadfully afraid, lest they might, after all, lose the edifying spectacle of auto da fe for which they had been so impatiently longing. Edric marked the hesitation of the judge and endeavored to improve it to his own advantage. For my part, he continued, I am a British subject, 
and as such, under the protection of my own court. My sovereign has a council here, and to him I make my appeal. I am neither ignoble nor unknown in my own country. My name is Montego, and I am the brother to the celebrated general of that family, whose victories, no doubt, have reached even this remote province. My dear Mr. Montego, said the judge, I really beg your pardon. Why did you not acquaint with me sooner your dignity? I dare say there is no truth in that charge. Only assure me upon your honour that you did not touch the mummy, and that you know nothing of what has become of it at present, and I will instantly order you to be set at liberty. I certainly do not know what has become of it, replied Edric. No, interrupted Dr. Endwarfin coming forward with the air of a determined martyr. I will not suffer such equivocation. I would rather perish at the stake than disavow for a moment my opinions or betray the sacred interests of science in with which I feel I am entrusted. No, sir, my pupil cannot make the public declaration you require. I know he would not, and he cannot if he would. On the contrary, I avow the fact. We came here for the express purpose of endeavouring to resuscitate the mummy of Cheops, and I glory and proud thought that we have succeeded. A groan of horror. Yes, sir, I do not hesitate to avow openly that the grand object of my life for several successive years has been to detect in what consisted the strange, inexplicable secret of life. We live, sir. We die. We are born and we are buried. We know that time, sickness, or violence may kill us. But who can say in what the mysterious principle of life consists? Various theories have been broached with which, no doubt, a gentleman of your intelligence and extensive information is well acquainted, and life has been successfully stated to depend upon the heart, the brain, and the circulatory of blood, and the respirations of lungs. All, however, are fallacious. The heart has been wounded, and the brain has been removed, and yet the patient has lived. Whilst the operations of respiration and circulation have kept up for hours in a body from which the vital spirit has departed. Weighing all these, and the divers of other arguments, in mind, it has struck me, and indeed I may say, that after mature deliberation, I have confidently arrived at the conclusion that both the faculties in which we call life and soul depend entirely upon the nervous system. Do not all philosophers agree that we receive ideas merely through the medium of the senses? And can our senses be operated upon otherwise through the influence of the nerves? Ergo, the nerves alone convey the ideas and sensations of the mind. Or rather, the nerves alone are the mind. Not a single instance, I believe, is known in which life remained after the sensorium had been destroyed or even seriously injured. What then can be more simple than to suppose life resides there? Pursuing this idea, I have long been convinced that where the nervous system remained uninjured and the appearance of death was only occasioned by a suspicion of the operation of the animal functions, that life might be restored if, by the intervention of any powerful agency, the nervous system could be excited to reaction, and that this, of course, could be effected where any kind of decomposition had taken place. It appeared to me that the mummy was the only body in which the experiment could be tried with the least prospect of success. From various circumstances, however, it has never now been in my power to realize my wishes on this head. But for a few weeks past, my pupil has entertained similar longings to myself, and yesterday saw our hopes accomplished. Yes, I flatter myself, and there cannot now remain a shadow of doubt to the world, that in ordinary cases, before don decomposition has taken place, Resuscitation is not only possible, but probable, that the dead bodies may be easily restored to life. The horror and consternation produced by this extraordinary speech amongst the Anglo-Egyptians who heard it far exceeded any human powers of description. Their terror at what they may consider as the doctor's daring impiety being considerably augmented by their not understanding above one-tenth part of what he said. And when he had finished, there was a dead pause in which no one dared to interrupt, till a sudden gust of wind happening to blow the door open of the justice retiring room, the terrified crowd fell back aghast upon one another, pale and trembling, as though they absolutely expected his infernal majesty to appear before them in properia persona. When tranquility was in some degree restored, the judge ordered the prisoners to be reconducted to prison. After the dangerous and impious speech we have just heard, said he, 
It would be madness to trust such suspected persons at large, and yet I would willingly take time to consider the case, and to ascertain whether this young man be indeed the person he represents himself. As I own, I should be sorry to inflict the full penalty of the law upon the brother of her Britannic Majesty's commander-in-chief. Remonstrance was useless, and the prisoners were again conducted to their dungeon, where they were heavily chained and left to ruminate upon the calamities that had befallen them. Far from agreeable were these meditations for Edric, for he was too angry with the doctor's ill-timed candor to be inclined to speak, and the doctor was too much ashamed of the effect already produced by his eloquence to wish to make any farther display of it. At length, his eyes became accustomed to the faint glimmering light emitted into the dungeon. He perceived the wall to which he was chained and covered it was with hieroglyphics, and endeavored to divert his jargon by examining them. "'I congratulate you, sir,' said Edric, when he perceived this, feeling rather indignant at this tutor's coolness. "'I congratulate you most sincerely upon your philosophy, and most earnestly do I wish that I could imitate it.' "'Oh, Edric,' said the doctor, "'all men are not equally gifted.' "'With the, either the art of making blunders or forgetting them,' said Edric pointedly. "'These hieroglyphics are very curious,' observed the doctor." who had his own reasons for not wishing to pursue the subject. See how beautifully the ancient Egyptians worked in granite. The fine polish they contrived to give this hard substance would be perfectly astonishing, if we did not recollect that they always edged their tools with emerald dust. Humph, said Eric, in a tone which seemed to imply, and what does it matter to me if they did? The doctor, however, was abashed, and continued. You see, as usual, the figure of the bull is frequently repeated here, this wall is evidently built of stones gathered from some ancient ruin. By the way, Edric, I don't think I've ever explained to you why the ancient Egyptians chose a bull as one of their deities, or, rather, as their principal one. You know, that anciently the year began in Taurus, though, by the precision of equinox, it has now advanced past Aries. Well, as the ancient Egyptians found that the sun began its career in Taurus, what could be more natural than that they should identify a bull with the verifying principle? The same theory may account for that legend of the Chaldeans, which supposes the world to have been produced by a bull striking chaos with his horn. Which horn, by the way, was probably the origin of the fable Amathea, or the horn of plenty? Edric made no reply, and the doctor dreading a pause which might give his pupil an opportunity of abrading him went on. Though the Egyptians had a number of divinities, they clearly worshipped only two, viz. The principles of good and evil, Osiris and Isis, Neph, Thath, Horus, and all of their hosts of inferior deities, were clearly types of the first, and light of life were their essence, whilst Typhon, Kamsa, and the malignant deities exemplified the second, and their attributes were invariably darkness and death. For heaven's sake, cried Edric, say no more upon the subject, for it is not in the power of language to describe the horror that I have at mere thought of anything with Egyptian. Let us escape from this fearful country, and I most sincerely hope nothing may ever happen to recall even its recollection to my imagination. Such and so, changeable are the desires of human life, said the doctor, but a few short weeks since... Egypt was a goal of your wishes, and the prospect of reanimating a corpse. Oh, no! Do not mention it! cried Edric, shuddering. Oh, God, how justly I am punished by the very fulfillment of my unhallowed hopes! Even now the fearful eyes of that hideous mummy seem to glare upon me, and even now I feel the grip of its horrid bony fingers on my arm. Oh, yes, no doubt! exclaimed the doctor. He pinched hard. He was a king, and kings should have strong arms, you know. For God's sake, do not jest upon such a subject, returned Edric, a subject so wild and fearful that I can scarcely believe but all that which has passed is such a dream. If it be, said the doctor, it is one from which I freely avow I should be very happy to awake, for I must confess this prison is not at all to my taste. And yet it is not your fault, began Edric. Recrimination, Edric, is always folly, interrupted the doctor who did not feel very proud of the part he had acted before the magistrate, nor very anxious to have alluded to. And instead of losing time and regretting past errors, it is part of a wise man to endeavor to find means of remitting them and avoiding them in the future. Agreed, returned Edric. And as I presume you are now convinced that you learned 
dissertation on the probable seat of human life was, to say the least, ill-timed. We will drop the subject. But even if we get out of prison, what is to become of us? Our money and valuables were all in that balloon, and here we are in a foreign country, entirely destitute. Not entirely, Edric. Not entirely, cried the doctor, a glow of satisfaction spreading itself over his face. Oh, no, no, I have guarded against that. Ah, what a thing it is to have foresight. Well, some persons are certainly singularly gifted in that line, and it is a happy thing for you that you have somebody to think for you. See here, displaying the things as he spoke, here is a bed, bolster and pillows, ready for inflation, a portable bedstead, linen, soap, pens, ink, paper, candle, fire, knives, forks, spoons, and money, all snugly packed up in my walking stick. Your supporter, returned Edric, smiling, as he used to call it, and now so it seems likely to prove in more senses than one. Yes, yes, cried the doctor. Only let us get out of prison and all the rest will be easy. But that only, doctor, of that we must take time to consider. Well, it is some comfort that we are likely to be allowed enough time, as my hint respecting the British counsel did not seem thrown away upon the judge. Oh, doctor, if you did not speak out, why, surely you would have not given him the declaration he required. There was no occasion. He neither wished nor expected more than I had already said, and after I had mentioned of my family, he only wished a decent pretext for setting us at liberty. At any rate, said the doctor, by way of changing the subject, you see, my doctrine is proved completely by the resuscitation of the mummy, for it must have been perfectly restored to life and consciousness, or it could not have flown away in our balloon. For my part, returned Edric, I can scarcely believe what has occurred to be real. Yet there must be some deception. And yet by whom can a deception have been practiced? And for what purpose? In short, I am quite bewildered. The doctor, being much in the same condition, could only sympathize with his people, and in this state we must leave them, whilst we inquire respecting the mysterious object of their speculations. The mummy thus, strangely recalled to life, was indeed Cheops, and horrible were the sensations that throbbed through every nerve as returning to consciousness brought with it all the pangs of his former existence and renewed circulation thrilled through every vein. His first impulse was to quit the tomb in which he had been so long immured, and to seek again the regains of light and day. Instinct seemed to guide him to this, for, as yet, a mist hung over his faculties, and ideas thronged in painful confusion through his head, which he was incapable of either arranging or analyzing. When, however, he reached the plain, light and air seemed to revive him and restore his scattered senses. And gazing wildly around, he explained, where am I? What is this place? Methinks all seems wondrous, new, and strange. Where is my father? And where? Oh, where is my Arsono? Alas, alas, he continued wildly. I had forgotten. I had hoped it was a dream, a fearful dream, for methinks I have been long asleep. Was it indeed reality? Are all, all gone? And was that hideous scene true? Those horrors which still haunt my memory like a ghastly vision? Speak! Speak! Continued he, his voice rising in thrilling energy as he spoke. Speak! Let me hear the sound of another's voice before my brain is lost in madness. I have entered Hades, or am I still on earth? Yes, yes it is earth. For there is the mighty pyramid that I caused to be erected towers behind me. Yet where is Memphis? Where are my forts and palaces? What a dark, smoky mass of building now surrounds me. Can this be the once proud queen of cities? I see no palaces, no temples. Memphis is fallen. The mighty barrier that protects her splendor from the waste of waters must have been swept away by the enroaching inroads of the swelling Nile. But is this the Nile? he continued, looking wildly upon the river. Sure I must be deceived. It is the fatal river of the dead. No papyrine boats glide smoothly on its surface, 
but strange infernal vessels vomiting forth volumes of fire and smoke. Holy Osiris, defend me! Where am I? Where have I been? A misty veil seems thrown upon the face of nature. Awake! Awake! he cried with a scream of agony. Set me free! I did not mean to slay him. Then throwing himself violently upon the ground, he lay for some moments, apparently insensible. Then slowly rising, he looked at himself, and in deep, unnatural shuddering convulsed his whole frame. His sensation of identity became confused, and he recoiled with horror from himself. These are the trappings of a mummy, murmured he in a hollow whisper. Am I then dead? The next instant, however, he broke into a wild laugh of derision. Poor feeble wretch, he cried. What do I fear? Need I tremble? In whose bosom dwells everlasting fire? Let me rather rejoice. I cannot be more wretched. Why should I dread a change? I welcome it with transport, and I dare my future fate. At this moment, the car of the balloon caught his eye. Ah, what is that? he cried. I am summoned. Tis the boat of Hecate, ready for me to ferry across the Marian Lake, to learn my final doom. I come, I come, I fear no judgment. My hell is here. And striking his bosom, he leaped into the car and stamped violently against its sides. At this instant, Gregory awoke, and his terror was not surprising. The dry, distorted features of the mummy looked yet more hideous than before, when animated by human passions, and his deep, hollow voice, speaking in a language he did not understand, fell heavily upon his ear, like the groans of fiends. Gregory tried to scream, but he could not utter a sound. He attempted to fly, but his feet seemed nailed to the spot on which he stood, and he remained with his eyes fixed upon the mummy, gasping for breath, with the cold sweat distilled from every pore. In the meantime, Chops had stumbled over the box containing the apparatus for making the inflammable air, and striking it violently, he had unintentionally set the machinery in motion. The pipes, tubes, and bellows instantly began to work, and the Indian rubber bottle became gradually inflated, till it swelled to an enormous magnitude and fluttered into the air like an imprisoned bird, beating itself against the massive walls to which it was still attached. Still it goes not, cried Chops again stamping impatiently. The quicksilver vapor bottle had fallen beneath his feet, and it broke as he trod upon it. The vapor burst from it, and it was inconceivable violence. And tearing the balloon from its fastenings, sent it off through the air like an arrow darting from a bow. End of chapter 10, volume 1, The Mummy Volume 1, Chapter 11 of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century, by Jane Loudon. Volume 1, Chapter 11. In the meantime, Sir Ambrose Montague had attended the Duke to the Queen's drawing-room. The splendor of the English court at this period defies description. The walls of the room in which the Queen received her guests were literally one maze of precious stones, and these being disposed in the form of bouquets, wreaths and trophies were so contrived as to quiver with every movement these magnificent walls were relieved by a colonnade of pillars of solid gold around which were twined wreaths of jewels fixed also upon elastic gold wires so as to tremble every instant the throne of the queen was formed of gold filigree beautifully wrought richly chased and superbly ornamented whilst behind it was an immense plate of looking-glass 
stretching the whole length and height of the apartment, and giving the whole effect of a fairy palace. The carpet spread upon the floor of this sumptuous saloon was so exact an imitation of green moss, with exquisitely beautiful groups of flowers thrown carelessly upon it, that a heedless spectator might have been completely deceived by the delicacy of their shape and richness of their colouring, and have stooped to pick them up, supposing them to be real. The suite of rooms appropriated to dancing was equally splendid, and fitted up in the same manner, save that the floors were painted to imitate the effect of the carpet, and rows of trees were placed on each side hung with lamps. This imitative grove was so exquisitely managed that the spectator could scarcely believe it artificial, and the music for dancing proceeded from its leaves, or from automaton birds placed carelessly amongst its branches. The dresses of the queen and her attendants were worthy of the apartment they occupied. Brocaded silks, cloth of gold, embroidered velvets, gold and silver tissues and gossamer nets made of the spider's web were mingled with precious stones and superb plumes of feathers in a profusion quite beyond description the most beautiful of the female habiliments were robes made of woven asbestos which glittered in the brilliant light like molten silver the ladies were all arrayed in loose trousers, over which hung drapery in graceful folds, and most of them carried on their heads streams of lighted gas, forced by capillary tubes into plumes, fleur-de-lis, or, in short, any form the wearer pleased, which, jets de feu, had an uncommonly chaste and elegant effect. The gentlemen were all clothed in the Spanish style with slashed sleeves, short cloaks, and large hats ornamented with immense plumes of ostrich feathers, it being considered in those days extremely vulgar to appear with a head uncovered. It would be difficult, perhaps, to imagine more perfect models of male and female beauty than those which now adorn the court of Queen Claudia, for the beau ideal of the painter's fancy seemed realized, nay surpassed, by the noble living figures there collected. The women were particularly lovely, and as they stood gathered round their queen, or lightly threaded the mazes of the graceful dance, dressed as above described, their brows bound with circlets of precious stones, and their glossy hair hanging in rich, luxuriant ringlets upon their ivory shoulders, they looked like a group of Auries, or the nymphs of Circe, ready with sparkling eyes and witching voices to lure men to destruction. Claudia was very handsome, and though her countenance wanted expression, her noble figure and majestic bearing well qualified her to play her part as queen amongst this bevy of beauties with becoming dignity. There is something in the habit of command, when it has been long enjoyed, that gives an imposing majesty to the manner, which the parvenu great strive in vain to imitate, and Claudia had this in perfection. The consciousness of beauty, power, and high birth swelled in her bosom, and even when she wished to be affable, she was only condescending. She now, however, received Sir Ambrose most graciously. She gave him her snowy hand to kiss, and addressed a few words of compliment to him, which sank deep into his heart. It is one of the privileges of greatness easily to excite emotion. One word of commendation from those above us far outweighs all the labored flattery of our inferiors. Thus the words of Claudia, and the warm praise she bestowed on Edmund, gave the purest transport to his father's heart, and affected him so violently that he would have fallen at her feet had he not been supported by Father Morris, who stood near him. "'I leave you in excellent hands, Sir Ambrose,' said Claudia, smiling. 
I have known Father Morris from my cradle, and estimate him as one of my dearest and best friends. So saying, the queen passed on, whilst Father Morris, with pallid lips and quivering limbs, conducted the baronet to a sofa, under the shade of the harmonious trees before mentioned. The agitation of the priest was so marked and so unusual, that notwithstanding Sir Ambrose's indisposition, he could not avoid noticing it. "'Good heavens! What is the matter with you, Father Morris?' exclaimed the baronet. "'I... I... I believe that I am ill,' stammered the priest, hastening to fetch a glass of water. By the time he returned, all traces of agitation had vanished from his countenance, and the mind of Sir Ambrose was too much occupied with the thought of Edmund to suffer him to dwell long upon the circumstance. The following day was appointed for the triumphal entry of Lord Edmund, and the greatest part of the night preceding it was passed by Sir Ambrose in the greatest agitation. He could not sleep, and he rose several times from his bed in excessive anxiety to listen for the reception of noises which he fancied he heard. Once he opened his window, all was still. His room looked into the garden of the palace, which, as we have already mentioned, shelved down to the Thames, and the calm moonlight slept peacefully upon the tall, thick trees and verdant lawn that spread before him. The evening breeze felt cool and refreshing, but Sir Ambrose sighed, and a strange fear of something he could not wholly define hung over him. He again retired to bed and at length sank into a feverish and uneasy doze. At daybreak a thundering cannon announced the arrival of the important day. Sir Ambrose started from his pillow at the first discharge, and the solemn sound thrilled through every nerve as it pealed along the sky. Scarcely had its echoes died upon the ear when another and another peal succeeded, and the heart of Sir Ambrose throbbed in his bosom almost to suffocation, as he sate resting his head upon his hands, and striving, though ineffectually, to stop his ears from the solemn sound, which seemed to absorb his every faculty, and strike almost with the force of a blow upon his nerves. Whilst he was still in this position, Father Morris entered the room. "'Come, come, Sir Ambrose,' he cried he, "'are you not ready? The Queen has sent for us, and the procession is just ready to set off.' Sir Ambrose started. He attempted to dress himself, but his trembling hands refused to perform their office, and Father Morris and Abelard were obliged to attire him, and lead him down to join his friend, the Duke, who was waiting for him impatiently. It has often been said— that the anticipation of pleasure is always greater than the reality. This, however, was not the case in the present instance, as the brilliancy of Lord Edmund's triumph was far greater than even the imaginations of the spectators had before dared to conceive. The Duke and Sir Ambrose, attended by Father Morris, found the individuals who were to compose the procession of the Queen assembled in the extensive gardens belonging to the superb palace of Somerset House. These fine gardens, spreading their verdant groves along the banks of the river, adorned by all the charms of nature and art, and enriched by some of the finest specimens of sculpture in the world, were now crowded with all the beauty and rank of England, who, waiting for the arrival of their sovereign, formed an ensemble no other nation in the world could hope to imitate. In the centre walk appeared the superb Arabian charger of the Queen, led by his grooms and magnificently caparisoned. His bridle was studded with precious stones, and his hooves cased in gold, whilst his blue satin saddle and housings were richly embroidered and fringed with the same metal. The noble animal, whose flowing mane and tail swept the ground, paced proudly along, tossing his head on high and spurning the ground on which he trod, as though conscious he should perform a conspicuous part in the grand pageant about to take place. 
all now was ready but yet queen claudia did not appear it is very strange but lately it is always so said lord maysworth to lord gustavus de montfort who had been for some time engaged in earnest conversation with father morris lord gustavus started at the sound of his friend's voice in some apparent confusion whilst father morris replied in his usual soft insinuating tones perhaps her majesty may be indisposed and may have slept rather longer than usual most likely returned lord maysworth yet it is strange the same thing should happen so often if you remember continued he again addressing lord gustavus i made the same observation the morning of her last levy indeed i have frequently made it lately and i have observed that she looks pale and languid here she comes at any rate and for my part i think i never saw her look better said dr hardman who had now joined them and who notwithstanding his violent politics was one of the physicians of the court the indolence of claudia which indeed seemed daily increasing having induced her to overlook what another sovereign would have resented claudia did indeed look well and her dress suited well with her style of beauty her trousers and vest were of a pale blue satin whilst over her shoulders was thrown a long flowing drapery of asbestos silk which hanging in graceful folds swept the ground as she walked along shining in the sun like a robe of woven silver on her head she wore a splendid tiara of diamonds and in her hand she bore the regal sceptre surmounted by a dove and richly ornamented with precious stones thus gorgeously attired surrounded by the ladies of her household she issued from her palace and whilst her kneeling subjects bent in humble homage around her she mounted her noble charger cannon were now fired in rapid succession the bells of every church rang in merry peals and martial music mingled in the clamour the palace gates were thrown open and the procession poured from them along the streets where crowds of people bustled to and fro eager to catch a glimpse of the sumptuous spectacle first advanced a long double line of monks arrayed in sacerdotal pomp and bearing immensely thick lighted tapers in their hands chanting thanksgiving for the victory they were followed by chorister boys flinging incense from silver vases that hung suspended by chains in their hands and chanting also their shrill trebles mingling with the deep bass voices of the priests in rich and mellow harmony the queen next appeared her prancing charger led by grooms whilst beautiful girls elegantly attired walked on each side of their sovereign scattering flowers in her path from fancy baskets made of wrought gold behind the queen rode the ladies of her household and the principal nobles of her court the superb plumes of ostrich feathers in the large spanish hats of the latter with their immense mustachios and open shirt collars giving them the air of some of van dyck's best pictures as they rode slowly along their noble arabians paced proudly and champed the bit impatient of restraint the ladies of the court superbly dressed in open litters next appeared borne upon the shoulders of men splendidly clad in rich liveries amongst these were elvira and rosabella these were followed by monks and boys as before but singing a somewhat different strain it was now a chant of glory and triumph that swelled upon the ear for these preceded the duke and sir ambrose who the one as uncle to the queen and the other as father of the expected hero occupied the post of honour the two venerable old men sate hand in hand in a sumptuous car drawn by two arabian horses and were followed by a large body of the queen's guards 
the costliness and variety of the dresses worn this day were quite beyond description many of the ladies had turbans of woven glass whilst others carried on their hats very pretty fountains made of glass dust which being thrown up in little jets by a small perpetual motion wheel sparkled in the sun like real water and had a very singular effect in this manner the procession advanced towards blackheath square said to be the largest and finest in the world where the meeting between the queen and her general was appointed to take place amongst the numerous balloons that floated in the air enjoying this magnificent spectacle was one containing father murphy clara mrs russell and abelard clara's youth preventing her joining in the procession and nothing could be more enthusiastic than their delight as they looked down upon the splendid scene below them few things indeed could be imagined finer than the sight of this gorgeous cortege winding slowly along a magnificent street supposed to be five miles long leading from blackfriars bridge through greenwich to blackheath sumptuous rows of houses or rather palaces lined the sides of this superb street the terraces and balconies before which were crowded with persons of all ages beautifully attired waving flags of different colours richly embroidered and fringed with gold whilst festoons of the choicest flowers hung from house to house we have already said the air was thronged with balloons and the crowd increased every moment these aerial machines loaded with spectators till they were in danger of breaking down glittered in the sun and presented every possible variety of shape and colour in fact every balloon in london or the vicinity had been put in requisition and enormous sums paid in some cases merely for the privilege of hanging to the cords which attached the cars whilst the innumerable multitudes that thus loaded the air amused themselves by scattering flowers upon the heads of those who rode beneath besides balloons a variety of other modes of conveyance fluttered in the sky some dandies bestrode aerial horses inflated with inflammable gas whilst others floated upon wings or glided gently along reclining gracefully upon aerial sledges the last being contrived so as to cover a sufficient column of air for their support as the procession approached the river the scene became still more animated innumerable barges of every kind and description shot swiftly along or glided smoothly over the sparkling water some floated with the tide in large boat-like shoes whilst others reclining on couch-shaped cars formed a mother-of-pearl were drawn forward by inflated figures representing the deities or monsters of the deep when the queen reached a spot near greenwich where through a spacious opening the river in all its glorious majesty burst upon her she paused and commanded her trumpeters to advance and sound a flourish they obeyed and after a short pause were answered by those of lord edmund the sound mellowed by the distance pealing along the water in dulcet harmony delighted with this response which announced the arrival of lord edmund and his troops at the appointed place the procession of the queen was again set in motion and in a short time arrived at blackheath the noble square in which the meeting was to take place was already thronged with soldiers whilst every house that surrounded it was covered with spectators no trees or fantastical ornaments spoiled the simple grandeur of this immense space the houses that surrounded it built in exact uniformity each having a peristyle supported by corinthian pillars and a highly decorated facade looked like so many athenian temples as the cortege of the queen entered the square the soldiers formed an opening to receive it 
and reverentially knelt on each side with reversed arms and bending banners as she passed in the centre was lord edmund surrounded by his staff all in polished armour for since an invention had been discovered of rendering steel perfectly flexible it had been generally used in war lord edmund's helmet was thrown off and his fine countenance was displayed to the greatest advantage as he and his officers threw themselves from their war steeds to kneel before the queen claudia also descended from her charger and as she stood in her glittering robes surrounded on all sides by her kneeling subjects she looked indeed their sovereign with becoming dignity she addressed a few words of thanks and commendation to lord edmund whose graceful figure was shown to the utmost advantage as he knelt before her his thick dark brown hair falling in clustering curls over his noble forehead and his elegant form attired in a suit of closely fitting armour over which upon the present occasion was thrown a short cloak of fine scarlet cloth richly embroidered with gold and fastened in front by a cord and superb tassels made entirely of the same metal in short he looked like a living personification of the god of war the queen raised him from the ground in the most gracious manner and then turning to the still kneeling soldiers she made a short speech to them of the same nature as that which she had addressed to lord edmund after which again mounting her palfrey she made lord edmund ride by her side and prepared to return to town edmund's quick eye had discovered and exchanged looks of affection with his father and friends though the etiquette of his present situation did not permit him to do more and now he rode proudly by the side of the queen gracefully bowing to the assembled crowd as he passed his heart beating with pleasure at the thought that his triumph was witnessed by those most dear to him whilst his noble arabian prancing forward tossed his head and champed his bit as though he also knew the part he was performing in the splendid ceremony acclamations rent the sky as the procession advanced and the showers of roses were rained down upon the queen and her general from the balloons above from which also flags waved in graceful folds and flapped in the wind as the balloons floated along the sky every one seemed delighted with the grandeur of this splendid pageant but no one experienced more pleasure than clara montague and her companions the raptures of mrs russell being so excessive that like the spectators of the stag hunt on the lake of killarney she was in imminent danger of throwing herself overboard in ecstasy whilst clara clasped her hands together in all the transports of childish delight her sparkling eyes and animated looks bearing ample witness to her gratification what shouting what a noise exclaimed abelard i declare it puts me in the mind of the acclamations in the time of nero when the romans shouted in concert and birds fell from the skies with the noise how well the queen looks observed mrs russell it was said a short time since that she had lost her appetite and could get no rest but i think she doesn't seem to have much the matter with her now evelina says she's being poisoned cried clara and that the people say that it would be no great matter if she was for then they would have to choose a queen for themselves and then they might make what terms they pleased with her an awkward pause followed this speech which no one seemed inclined to break till clara exclaimed dear me what a pretty horse my cousin edmund rides i think that's a prettier comes after him said father murphy what that one with his head hanging down and his mane sweeping the ground asked mrs russell yes and sure it's a very pretty young man that walks by the side of him so he is replied father murphy his hands are chained so you see he is a prisoner observed abelard 
sure and it's a barbarous custom that of putting chains about the hands of the prisoners said father murphy as if it was not bad enough to be a prisoner without looking like one poor fellow cried clara i should like to go and let him loose he looks very melancholy how great lord edmund looks exclaimed mrs russell i declare if he were a real king he couldn't have a grander appearance and then to see the poor old gentleman his father sitting there hand in hand with my master i declare it does my heart good to look at them whilst the occupiers of the balloons were thus enjoying the splendid scene below them the pleasure of the exalted personages they admired had not been inferior to their own the duke in particular seemed almost out of his senses with joy his impatience during the whole procession from london had been excessive and the moment he saw edmund he rubbed his hands in ecstasy and jumping up in his seat almost overturned sir ambrose who was also bending forward eagerly gazing upon his son there there he is cried the duke see how handsome he looks oh the young rogue there'll be many a heart lost to-day i warrant me look at him how the colour comes into his cheeks when the queen speaks to him now he helps her on her horse and now see he's looking round for us there i caught his eye look sir ambrose don't you see him surely you aren't crying my old friend why you'll make me as great a fool as yourself god bless him i am sure i don't know anything we have to cry at but we are two old simpletons father morris who had joined the procession of monks was almost as much affected as his patron indeed his affection for edmund seemed the only human passion remaining in his aesthetic breast cold even to frigidity in his exterior father morris seemed to regard the scenes passing around him but as the moving figures of a magic lantern which glittered for a moment in glowing colours and then vanished into darkness leaving no trace behind whilst he unmoved as the wall over which the gaudy but shadowy pageant had passed saw them alternately vanish and reappear without the slightest emotion being excited in his mind under this statue-like appearance however father morris concealed passions as terrific as those which might be supposed to throb in the breast of a demon though never did his self-command seem relaxed for a moment but when the interest of edmund were in question on the present occasion joy swelled in his bosom almost to suffocation as he raised his eyes to heaven and wringing his hands together exclaimed oh it is too too much there is something indescribably affecting in seeing strong emotion expressed by those who are generally calm and unimpassioned thus sir ambrose by whom this burst of feeling was quite unexpected gazed at the confessor with the utmost surprise and strange to tell though he had known him nearly twenty years it was the first time he had seen his head completely uncovered father morris's cowl had now fallen off entirely and displayed the head of a man between forty and fifty whose fine features bore the traces of what he had endured his noble expressive brow seemed wrinkled more by care than age and his sable locks had evidently become grizzled here and there prematurely sir ambrose gazed upon him intently for the peculiar expression of his features seemed to recall some half-forgotten circumstance to his mind dimly obscured however by the mist of time the earnestness with which he regarded the monk seemed at length to remind the latter of his imprudence he started and whilst a deep crimson flushed his usual sallow countenance he ha he started and whilst a deep crimson flushed his usually sw he started 
and whilst a deep crimson flushed his usually sallow countenance, he hastily resumed his cowl, and appeared again to the eyes of the spectators, the same cold, unimpassioned, abstracted being as before. The ovation had now nearly reached Blackfriars Bridge, at the entrance to which a triumphal arch had been erected. The moment the Queen and her heroic general passed under it, a small figure of fame was contrived to descend from the entablature, and hovering over the hero to drop a laurel crown upon his head. Shouts of applause followed this well-executed device, and the passengers in the balloons, wondering at the noise, all pressed forward at this same moment to ascertain the cause of such continued acclamations. The throng of balloons became thus every instant more dense, whilst some young city apprentices, having hired each a pair of wings for the day, and not exactly knowing how to manage them, a dreadful tumult ensued, and the balloons became entangled with the winged heroes and each other in an inextricable confusion. The noise now became tremendous, the conductors of the balloons swearing at each other the most refined oaths, and the ladies screaming in concert. Several balloons were rent in the scuffle, and fell with tremendous force upon the earth, whilst some cars were torn from their supporting ropes, and others roughly overset. Luckily, however, the whole of England was at this time so completely excavated, that falling upon the surface of the earth was like tumbling upon the parchment of an immense drum, and consequently only a deep hollow sound was returned as cargo after cargo of the demolished balloons struck upon it, though some of them rebounded several yards with the violence of the shock. Amongst those who fell from the greatest height, and of course rebounded most violently, were the unfortunate individuals who accompanied Clara, an unlucky apprentice having poked his right wing through the silk of their balloon, in endeavouring to avoid the charge of an aerial horseman, who found his Aeolian steed too difficult to manage in the confusion. The car containing our friends was in consequence precipitated to earth so rapidly as for the moment to deprive them of breath. "'Sure, and I'm killed entirely,' cried Father Murphy. "'Oh, my bonnet! My beautiful bonnet!' sobbed Mrs. Russell, whilst Clara, dreadfully frightened, began to cry. And Abelard, whose ideas were generally a long time travelling to his brain, particularly upon occasions of sudden alarm, stood completely silent, stupidly gazing about him, as though he had not the least notion what could have possibly happened. Indeed, it was not till a full hour afterwards that he found himself sufficiently recovered to exclaim, "'Dear me! I do think we were very near being killed!' The confusion in the air still continued, piercing screams that demons were amongst them, mingled horribly with the crashing of balloons, the cries of the sufferers, and the successive falling of heavy weights. The situation of the crowd below, however, was infinitely worse than that of those above, the momentum of the falling bodies being fearfully increased by the distance they had to descend. Those beneath had no chance of escape and were inevitably crushed to death by the weight, whilst the agonizing shrieks of the unfortunate wretches who saw their danger coming from a distance, yet were so jammed together in the crowd that they could not fly, rang shrilly upon the ear, and pierced through every heart. At this moment a dreadful scream ran through the crowd, and the horse of Queen Claudia, his bridle broken, his housings torn, his nostrils distended, and his sides streaming with gore, rushed past. "'Oh, God! The Queen! The Queen!' burst from every voice, and one general rush took place towards the spot from whence the cry had proceeded. Beneath the triumphal arch, and partially sheltered by its shade, lay the bleeding body of Claudia, supported by Edmund. By her side knelt Rosabella, 
who, assisted by Father Morris, was applying restoratives, whilst Henry Seymour was endeavouring to restore Elvira, who had fainted in his arms, and Sir Ambrose, his face streaming with blood, stood at a little distance amongst a group of courtiers, several of whom had also experienced severe injuries. The tumult in the air continued, groans and shrieks and exclamations that the atmosphere was supernaturally haunted were heard in many places, and some persons declared the accident to be the work of demons. A current of wind had blown those balloons that had become unmanageable across the city, while the others, their occupiers terrified almost to madness, appeared still contending with some fearful monster in the sky. The courtiers, however, heeded not this disturbance, for all their attention was occupied by the apparently expiring queen, whose long-drawn sighs and convulsed bosom seemed to threaten her instant dissolution. "'She's gone!' cried Lord Gustavus de Montfort, as her bosom heaved with a deep, heavy sigh, and then all was still. "'Yes, she's dead,' repeated Lord Noodle. "'She is certainly dead,' reiterated Lord Doodle. And then these sapient counsellors of the apparently departed queen shook their wise heads in sympathy. "'Hush! She breathes!' cried Lord Edmund. For some moments— the courtiers stood in breathless anxiety watching the body, and fearing to move, lest they should break the awful silence that prevailed, though their hearts throbbed till the pulsations were almost audible. Fearful was the pause that now ensued. All were suffering from the torments of hope or fear, for all knew that the interests of the whole community hung upon her breath. Most of the courtiers either hoped to gain places or feared to lose them, whilst all trembled at the uncertainty that seemed to rest upon their future destiny, and the prospect of the anarchy which the proposed mode of electing their future sovereign might create. The interest which the fate of the queen excited was thus intense, and the courtiers hung over her body with streaming eyes and motionless limbs to watch the result. At this instant a fearful and tremendous yell ran through the air, and the car containing the mummy, which had been for some time entangled with the other balloons, fell to the ground with tremendous force, close to the expiring queen. The gigantic figure of Cheops started from it as it fell, his ghastly eyes glaring with unnatural luster upon the terrified courtiers, who ran screaming with agony in all directions, forgetting everything but the horrid vision before them. End of Volume 1 Chapter 11「12 of the Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Hort. The Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century. By Jane Loudon. Volume 1, Chapter 12. The tumult had now nearly subsided. The late busy crowd fled, uttering shrieks of horror and dismay, and of all the countless mass of human beings that had so lately thronged around, none remained save Edmund and Father Morris, who supported Claudia, and the Duke, and Henry Seymour, who still remained near the insensible form of Elvira, whilst they, pale and immovable as the sculptured marble of the tomb, their eyes chained as though by magic upon the hard vision before them, waiting in fearful expectation of what was next to happen, scarcely daring to move or breathe, the solemn silence that prevailed being only broken by the convulsive gasps of the expiring queen, presented an awful change from the busy hum of thousands 
which had so lately filled the air. Where am I? exclaimed Cheops, gazing wildly around, his deep sepulchral voice thrilling through every nerve. Where is Arsenal? They seize her. They tear her from me. Curses on the wretches. May Typhon's everlasting vengeance pursue them, and may their hearts wither, gnawed by the never-dying snake. The mummy gnashed his teeth as he spoke, and the gloom which gathered on his dark brow grew black as night. All shuddered as that hard glance of eternal hatred seemed to freeze their blood. They turned away involuntarily, and when they looked again, the specter had disappeared. The shattered remains of the balloon alone lay before them, rent to atoms. For happening to cross London just at the moment of the greatest confusion, it had become entangled in the crowd, and, notwithstanding the strong material of which it was composed, it had been torn asunder in the scuffle, and had fallen with its fearful occupier to the ground. Good God! cried Father Mars, after a short pause. What a horrid vision! What can it mean? It seemed an Egyptian mummy, said Edmund, shuddering, and it spoke that language. But what can have resuscitated it? What human power can have recalled to life a being so long immured in the silent tomb? Perhaps the vehicle in which it came may contain something to explain the mystery, said Henry Seymour. At this moment, several persons ran past, screaming with terror, and exclaiming that they had seen a demon. When the confusion excited by these trembling fugitives had a little subsided, a few of the courtiers began also to make their appearance, and returned to their posts near the queen. But all were pale, starting at every sound, and seeming ready, at the least alarm, to take flight again as expeditiously as before. Claudia still lay insensible, her heaving chest and deep convulsive sobs for breath alone betraying signs of life. But her fate no longer excited a deep, overwhelming interest. Whispers of wonder and superstitious horror mingled with the hopes and fears inspired by her danger, and her removal to the palace was almost regarded with indifference. So completely were the minds of men occupied by the strange spectacle they had so lately witnessed. Everyone, indeed, neither thought nor spoke of anything but the mummy and a thousand rumors each more extravagant than the last spread from mouth to mouth respecting it men stood in groups whispering to each other and scarcely daring to stir without a companion nay even then creeping from place to place looking cautiously around and starting at every noise as though they feared the awful visitor was returned whilst the sages of the country gravely shook their heads and declared that what had taken place was evidently a visitation from heaven in punishment of the sins of mankind an indefinable presentiment of evil hung over the spirits of all gloom indeed spread through every class of society all dreaded they knew not what and all shrunk with horror from the thought of supernatural agency there is indeed an invincible feeling implanted by nature in the mind of man which makes him shudder with disgust at anything that invades her laws the body of the queen being removed attended by her physicians and the ladies of her household the rest of the assembled courtiers gathered around the balloon and exclamations of terror and surprise broke from their lips when they discovered it to be the same in which edric and dr antwerfen had so short a time before taken their departure for egypt the whole truth now seemed to flash upon them i thought how it would be said lord maysworth you know i told you lord gustavus that in my opinion it was an expedition that could never possibly do any good but you were of a different belief my lord returned lord gustavus solemnly thinking as i think and as i am convinced every one who hears me must think or at least ought to think it is my deliberate opinion that the expedition of my youthful friend and his learned tutor was both admirably planned and well concocted, and that if it have failed in its ulterior object, it has been solely owing to some of those unforeseen events which sometimes do occur in the best regulated arrangements, and which it was utterly impossible for any human ability entirely to ward off or revert. Edric's balloon? Impossible, cried Sir Ambrose, rushing forward to ascertain the fact and forgetting all his anger against his son in his anxiety for his fate yes yes continued he 
looking at some of the things as they were drawn forth and exhibited by different persons in the crowd those were edric's books that was his desk oh my son my son what is become of him many sympathized with the unfortunate father and more eagerly questioned each other as to the probable meaning of what they saw no one however could give any explanation and all was confusion and dismay in one individual alone the arrival of the mummy produced no emotion the bosom of edmund after the first moment of excitation had passed was racked with anguish too bitter to allow him to feel curious even to know his brother's fate only a few hours before love and fortune seemed to unite in showering their choicest blessings upon his head and now he was the most wretched of mankind for if claudia died rosabella or elvira must be queen and if elvira should be chosen all hopes of becoming her husband must be lost oh god cried he striking his forehead in agony why was i reserved for this why did i not perish fighting the battles of my country and why was i saved only to be mocked with the hope of happiness which just as it seemed within my grasp flies from me for ever wretch that i am would that i had never been born or at least had died in my nurse's arms that i might have thus escaped the tormenting pangs which now drive me to distraction while edmund thus raved the eye of rosabella followed his every movement and seemed to exult with a fiend-like pleasure in his agonies i am avenged thought she he now feels what i so often have suffered but this is not all he must be probed to the quick ere he can know the bitter vengeance of a woman scorned whilst these violent emotions were convulsing the bosoms of all around the old duke knelt by the side of elvira gazing upon her with the most intense anxiety her gentle and feminine nature had been overpowered at seeing the blood of claudia and she still lay insensible looking more exquisitely lovely than fancy can conceive the beauty of elvira was of the most soft and feminine description long silken eyelashes shaded her dark hazel eyes and gave them an expression more voluptuous than brilliant whilst nothing could exceed the delicacy of her complexion or the beauty of her full rosy lips the figure of elvira might not have served as the model of a courageous heroine but it would have suited admirably for an hoary and lovely as she always was she had perhaps never looked more so than at this moment when the returning blood softly retinted her cheeks and her eyes gradually unclosed lord edmund gazed upon her till maddened by the thought that he must lose her for ever he could no longer endure his own sensations and darting amongst the crowd he endeavoured to fly from the world and from himself the duke on the contrary saw the recovery of his daughter with unalloyed transport for though he loved edmund and wished to have him for a son-in-law he was by no means insensible to the prospect of seeing his daughter a queen and his breast throbbed with violent emotions to which it had long been a stranger in the meantime the mummy had stalked solemnly through the city urged more by instinct than design the mist that still hung over him making him seem like one wandering in a dream yet still he advanced his path like that of a destroying angel spreading consternation as he went and all he met flying horror-stricken from his sight many however when the monster had passed crept softly back to gaze after him and amongst this number were mrs russell in whose breast curiosity that vice of low minds reigned predominant the moment their balloon fell mrs russell attended by her faithful abelard had hurried home leaving clara in the care of father murphy lest as she said in the confusion that might ensue the servants might be induced to leave the duke's house and some evil disposed personages might strip it of its contents urged by this prudent motive mrs russell hastened home and finding all was safe was just about to retire to rearrange her disordered dress when one of her servants rushed into the room with the account of a fearful spirit having been seen in the strand whose mysterious appearance coupled with the accident that had happened to the queen seemed to portend some dreadful calamity which was about to fall upon the country what is it like asked mrs russell have you seen it evelina oh yes ma'am cried the panting girl its eyes flare like fire and it stares so wildly round it and as it went along 
it saw a dead cat lying in the street, and it knelt down and took the creature up and kissed it and lamented over it in such a way and in such a strange language I never heard anything like it in my life. Oh, dear, I should like to see it, cried Mrs. Russell, flying to the door and holding it half open to secure a retreat in case of necessity. Just as she reached the street, however, fate, as though willing to gratify her curiosity, occasioned the mummy to turn back, and with that kind of half pleasure and half pain, with which the good people of England sometimes delight to gaze upon anything horrible, Mrs. Russell continued to look at it as it rapidly approached her, till, as it reached the door, to her infinite horror it stalked towards it. Awestruck and trembling, Mrs. Russell retreated. The mummy followed her. He stretched his hand out to her. She shrunk back aghast from his touch. Leon, cried he with a voice of thunder. Mrs. Russell could bear no more, and she fled screaming to her own apartment, where her lover was awaiting her return, impatient to delight her attentive ears with a few more of his poetical effusions. Absorbed as Abelard was, however, he was roused by this unexpected intrusion, and the blood ran chilly through his veins as he saw the tall majestic figure of Cheops stride across the apartment. His athletic stature, his dark swarthy complexion, and his strongly marked features, aided by the fearful luster of his piercing eyes, gave to his figure, swathed as it yet was, in the vestments of the grave, a supernatural grandeur that thrilled through every nerve of Abelard's frame, and he shrank back with horror as his fearful visitant stalked past him. Cheops saw his terror and smiled in proud disdain as he threw himself upon a couch placed near a window looking upon the garden, which, as we have before stated, shelved down to the river. There he lay, his eyes fixed upon the majestic Thames, whilst Abelard and Mrs. Russell gazed with trembling limbs and pallid lips at the strange intruder without daring either to approach or disturb him. Thus have I watched the Nile, said Cheops, his awful voice sounding as from the tomb. Whilst the gently rising waters have gradually swelled into the flood, which was to pour joy and plenty over the land, and thus too have I lain, gazing upon its streams, when the purpose of all bounteous nature having been fulfilled, it has sunk back, slowly retiring to its natural bed. But oh! How different were the feelings that then throbbed in my breast to the corroding fire which now consumes me. Oh, Osiris, what hard thoughts flash through my brain. They come like overwhelming floods pouring from heaven to the great deep and sweeping all before them in one mighty ruin. Oh, Arsinoe, by the fell rites of Typhon, there's madness in the thought. Then spring from the couch, his eyes glared with yet fiercer brilliancy as he flashed them round, whilst Abelard and Mrs. Russell, terrified beyond the power of expression, flew towards the door, eyeing the motions of their dangerous guests with feelings of unspeakable horror. Their terror was needless, for the storm of passions in the breasts of Cheops, though tremendous, was soon allayed, and ere many moments had elapsed, he sank again upon the couch in a kind of lethargy, which, if it were not slumber, seemed at least to imply a temporary cessation from pain. Thank God, whispered Abelard, as he motioned to Mrs. Russell to creep out of the apartment. She tremblingly obeyed, and the moment she thought herself in safety, she threw herself upon her knees and thanked God with more fervor than she had ever done before in her whole life. Whilst the servants, who were all assembled in the anteroom, crowded round her, trembling, with pallid cheeks and white lips, and clustering together like bees swarming round their queen. Oh, madame, madame, exclaimed Angelina in a whisper, what will become of us? A serous moisture transudes from every pore in my body, with the chilliness of death, and my very hair erects itself with horror upon my head. And my heart throbs with such violence, said Cecilia, that the whole arterial system seems deranged. It is evidently an Egyptian mummy, observed Abelard, and as he spoke, every word he uttered was listened to as an oracle. Its language and its dress bespeak its origin, but by what strange event it has been resuscitated. 
at this moment a sharp knock at the door made the terrifying servants all spring closer together clinging to each other in an agony of nervous horror and no one daring to approach the door the knocking and ringing however at length became so violent as to rouse abelard to give the clamorous intruders entrance it was father morris and sir ambrose oh abelard cried the latter panting for breath have you heard the news the queen is certainly dying and every one says the demon that appeared this morning has killed her what the mummy asked abelard have you heard of it then cried sir ambrose eagerly it is now in this house said mrs russell in this house repeated sir ambrose with a faint scream whilst father morris who had looked pale and exhausted when he entered the hall became still paler and seemed scarcely able to support himself to arms cried cheops from the inner room the pali are upon us cowards that we are the enemy are at our gates screaming and scarcely knowing where they went the terrified servants tumbled over each other in the hastiness of their retreat huddling themselves together in a heap yet keeping their eyes fixed upon the door from which they expected the spectre to appear as though charmed by the fascination of a rattlesnake a loud crash now produced a fresh scream then all was still after a long pause which seemed of endless duration father morris evidently with a dreadful effort roused himself and advanced death itself is not so hard as this suspense said he as he resolutely threw open the door of the room which had contained the mummy and entered it it was empty but the broken framework of the window seemed to point out in what manner the awful visitor had made his exit it was with infinite difficulty that mrs russell could be persuaded to return to this room and when she did the remainder of the day was passed by her and every domestic of the mansion in fear and trembling when they spoke it was in whispers and when they moved they crept along with stealthy noiseless steps as though they feared the echo of their own footsteps the eyes of all fixed timidly upon the broken window through which the fearful stranger had disappeared slowly and heavily the hours rolled on with mrs russell and her constant abelard till the time appointed for dinner arrived when the inferior servants as they served the meal looked timidly around instead of regarding the dishes they carried in their hands and the higher ones at first scarcely dared to eat and only spoke in whispers fancying every moment the wild eyes of cheops again glaring upon them and his deep hollow voice ringing in their ears whilst their own tones sounded strangely hoarse and unnatural yet as the bottle circulated their terrors dissipated and abelard had just begun again to breathe some of his tenderest effusions when the crashing of branches in the garden announced the return of the spectre and the laugh of cheops strange wild and unearthly again rang in their ears like the yell of a demon the servants terrified at the appalling sound listened for a moment their limbs shaking in every joint their teeth chattering in their heads and terror blanching their lips and cheeks to a ghastly paleness till as the hideous noise increased they could bear no more and springing from their seats they fled shrieking from the room in the meantime the sensations these extraordinary events had created amongst the people were indescribable strange rumors and contradictory reports were circulated and the most incredible stories invented of all that had passed the minds of men became bewildered they knew not what to credit nor what to think a gloomy presentiment hung over them they seemed to feel some fearful change was at hand but scarcely knew what to hope or what to fear business was at a stand people indeed gathered together in the shops but it was only to whisper secretly to each other strange mysterious stories of the late marvelous events which they dared not breathe in public the extremes of ignorance and civilization tend alike to produce credulity and the wildest and most improbable stories were as greedily swallowed by the most enlightened people in the world as they could have been even by a horde of uncultivated barbarians the family of the duke of cornwall retired early to rest at the close of the eventful day we have been speaking of hoping to lose in sleep the remembrance of the harassing events they had so lately witnessed lord edmund had returned soon after the disappearance of the mummy but he locked himself in the chamber prepared for him and refused to see any one his mind being too much agitated for him to endure the common forms of society 
all was soon quiet throughout the mansion it was midnight when a tall figure wrapped in a large cloak appeared slowly gliding with cat-like steps through the garden it cautiously avoided the light and crept along the shadiest walks and thickest alleys carefully shrouding itself from observation and endeavoring by availing itself of the shelter of the trees the better to conceal its movements at the very extremity of the garden was a terrace very little used the doors indeed leading to it had been so long closed up as to be nearly forgotten and yet it was towards this unfrequented spot that the mysterious figure directed its course the long neglected door slowly opened and the stream of light it admitted was obscured for a moment by a passing shade and then all seemed dark silent and mysterious as before it certainly went that way said a voice the preciseness of which marked it as belonging to abelard and it was a real tangible material form as i saw its shadow intercept the light when the door was opened and it passed through it is quite impossible cried mrs russell who having been induced by the romantic butler to take a ramble with him by moonlight had also witnessed this strange apparition you must be mistaken mr abelard for that door does not appear to have been opened this age it is even nailed up as you may see yourself if you examine it it is very strange said abelard after he had tried the door and found it immovable i certainly saw it open it must have been an optical delusion resumed mrs russell the retina of the eye is sometimes strangely affected and represents objects quite differently to what they really are i must consult father morris about it tomorrow for in my opinion it was certainly the mummy spectre la do you think so mr abelard why then didn't you speak to it i will if it comes again returned abelard oh there it is cried mrs russell and the worthy pair flew back to the house screaming in concert and without once daring to look behind them scarcely however had the last echo of their footsteps died away upon the ear when the figure emerged from the recess in which it had lain concealed and again crept slowly towards the door leading to the terrace hist marianne exclaimed the stranger pausing for a reply but all was still marianne repeated he still louder fools dolts idiots continued he stamping violently as he still found his call of no avail they have kept me so long with their cursed folly that she is gone eternal misery haunt them for their officious babbling by heaven if they had had the sense to climb the wall i had been lost but hark she comes the door now slowly opened and a female figure holding a light appeared how is she cried the stranger better returned the female then it is past the power of man to kill her resumed the first and rushing wildly past his companion he buried himself in the deepest recesses of the grove end of chapter twelve of volume one volume two chapter one of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by arnie hort the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon volume two chapter one father morris when abelard and mrs russell confessed to him the following morning the strange specter they had witnessed treated the whole as the mere vision of their heated imaginations and refusing to listen to any of their surmises respecting it prepared to attend the queen who finding herself sufficiently recovered to be able to attend to the duties of religion had from the general reputation of his superior sanctity sent for him to confess her her majesty indeed seemed rapidly improving and the hopes of edmund reviving with her health he passed every hour he could abstract from the duties of his station at the feet of his adored elvira his love for whom seemed increased by the imminence of the danger he had just escaped of losing her for ever in this manner several days had passed and the strange visit of the mummy and the accident of the queen had already taken their place on the shelf with the other evnemens passes of the day 
when one morning whilst sir ambrose was dressing he was startled by an earnest message from the duke of cornwall entreating him to come to him without delay sir ambrose immediately obeyed the summons and found the duke walking up and down his study in a state of the greatest agitation which father morris was vainly endeavouring to tranquillize oh my beloved friend exclaimed the duke springing forward and grasping the baronet's hand the moment he saw him approach my dear sir ambrose claudia is no more dead cried sir ambrose involuntarily looking at father morris whose aspect however still preserved only its usual cold and statue-like appearance are you sure she is dead i thought she was better so we all did said the duke but alas we deceived ourselves for father morris has just seen her expire oh where is edmund why is he not with you what will become of him it will destroy him to lose elvira and i too that have felt so proud in the expectation of his becoming my son-in-law oh it will break my heart oh cried father murphy who was also present and if that's the case why don't you let rosabella take the crown at once and make no more fuss about it and yet continued the duke i cannot bear that alvira should be deprived of her right she would so become a crown and with her inflexible sense of justice and desire for improvement she would do so much good that i should not feel justified in depriving the country of such a sovereign thus said father morris smiling do we deceive ourselves you are ambitious whilst you think that you are only just believe me if you consult elvira's real happiness you will not impose upon her the troublesome duties of a crown she will make a better wife than a queen for her gentle nature is less fitted to command than to obey rosabella has more firmness i do not agree with you father said sir ambrose in my opinion elvira is infinitely better fitted to be a queen than rosabella for her passions are more under the control of reason that is to say resumed the monk sneeringly they have not yet been called into play what do you mean father began the duke nothing that could give you offence my lord returned the priest disgusted myself with the world i naturally thought the princess most likely to find happiness where i seek it myself viz in a life of quiet and retirement enough said the duke but where is edmund let us seek him no doubt he is with elvira poor things we must spoil their billing and cooing edmund was with elvira and was passionately urging his suit whilst she engaged with her embroidery frame listened with a half abstracted mind and emma dubiously waited behind her chair you do not love me said he or you could not answer with such provoking coldness you are so unreasonable edmund i have already told you i have no idea of that passionate overwhelming love you appear to feel it absolutely terrifies me and i am sure it is not natural to my character this silk is too dark emma and so edmund if you feel you cannot be happy with such affection as it is in my power to bestow we had better determine at once to separate good god exclaimed edmund striking his forehead violently with his clenched hand how coldly you talk of our separation what can i do i try everything in my power to please you emma give me my scissors but since you will not hear reason reason cried edmund fiercely seizing her arm and then letting it go again if you talk of reason you will drive me distracted you quite terrify me with your violence edmund said elvira rising and preparing to quit the room oh stay stay my adored elvira exclaimed lord edmund throwing himself upon his knees and catching her hand for heaven's sake stay pardon my impetuosity frown upon me treat me with coldness disdain or contempt but do not do not leave me i do not know what you wish i have repeatedly told you i am ready to become your wife whenever our parents think fit and that i will do everything in my power to make you happy do you call that coldness i do i do indeed freezing insulting coldness oh elvira i would rather see you spurn me hear you declare you hated me or know that you doomed me to destruction than hear you speak of our marriage in that calm unvaried tone how unreasonable you are said elvira 
as henry seymour says you do not understand my character in the least henry seymour cried edmund fiercely how dare he pass an opinion upon my conduct he shall account for his insolent interference oh no no exclaimed elvira turning pale with terror i'm sure he meant no harm for heaven's sake edmund my dear edmund continued she earnestly laying her hand upon his arm she paused edmund gazed upon her intently she became confused and added in a faltering voice do not hurt him edmund edmund sighed deeply you shall be obeyed said he at this moment a slight tap at the door announced the arrival of the duke and his friends so so said the duke we have found you have we but you must take your leave of tender scenes for the future what do you mean asked edmund the queen is dead said sir ambrose the glowing countenance of edmund turned of a ghastly paleness and his livid lips quivered as he leaned against the window for support assist him cried the duke he will faint don't distress yourself edmund the death of claudia shall make no alteration in your prospects i am better said edmund faintly attempting to smile and waving off all assistance twas but for a moment the suddenness of the shock overcame me i thought the queen was better she was supposed so returned the duke but it seems she had some internal malady her physicians were not aware of an inward bruise i believe but don't make yourself unhappy about it edmund i cannot bear to see you wretched let rosabella take the crown and think no more about it your grace wrongs me said edmund his fine countenance glowing with the exalted feelings of his soul however i may suffer from the violence of my feelings i can never permit them to interfere with my sense of duty elvira has a right to ascend the throne and if my exertions can ensure her success she shall be queen thou art a brave lad cried the duke and will you really try to secure the election of elvira when you know by so doing you will deprive yourself of her for ever i shall do my duty said lord edmund pressing his lips firmly together as though to suppress his feelings father mars looked at him from under his overshadowing cowl with a kind of sardonic smile which seemed to say you speak well but let us see how you will act my noble edmund murmured sir ambrose tears rolling down his cheeks elvira's eyes thanked her lover for his disinterestedness whilst the glow which flushed her cheeks betrayed that a deeper emotion than joy at the flattering prospect opened before her swelled in her bosom elvira said lord edmund gazing upon her earnestly as though he would penetrate the inmost recesses of her bosom what are your wishes do not hesitate to declare them for alas much hangs upon your words elvira blushed and cast her eyes upon the ground whilst the rapid changes of her expressive countenance bespoke the agitation of her mind lord edmund comprehended but too well the meaning of her silence and he sighed deeply it is enough said he in a mournful tone then the die is cast he paused a few moments whilst his friends though they looked at him with the deepest commiseration respected his emotion too much to venture to interrupt it then rousing himself he hastily brushed a tear from his eye and exclaimed how weak is human nature i know my duty and i will perform it but yet o oh elvira compose yourself my beloved edmund said his father to-morrow you will be more calm oh talk not of to-morrow replied edmund to-day is the season for action i will instantly assemble my friends i know the army is devoted to me a council of state will be chosen to direct the kingdom during the interregnum i must be one of its members some weeks will elapse before the election can i think take place three months is the time fixed said the duke as you know the votes of all the people are to be collected and that with such a population as ours will be no trifle to be sure it is the deputies that are to do the business but then it will take some time to elect them when the founder of the present dynasty ordained her successor should be chosen by the votes of the whole people said sir ambrose she wisely recollected the difficulty that must arise from collecting their votes individually and directed they should elect deputies 
but when she ordered that every ten thousand men throughout the kingdom should choose a deputy of their own rank and station to come to london to represent them she did not calculate upon the immensity of our present population nor think of the evils the presence of such a disorderly body of men must bring upon the capital yet any attempt to reduce their number would inevitably overturn the government observed father morris for as it is the only act of freedom the people have long been permitted to enjoy they will be proportionably tenacious of it and the majority of these deputies is to decide the election said edmund musing then our business must be to secure that majority think you that any good can be done by endeavoring to procure the return of those who are disposed to be favorable to us very little returned father mars to whom this observation was addressed for the lower classes from their conceit and pedantry are extremely difficult to manage though their deputies may possibly be more tractable as notwithstanding the ordinance of the queen they will probably be more polished and less learned the lower classes will be ill able to spare the time necessary to become deputies whilst the country gentlemen will be delighted to obtain something to do we must be prompt said the duke at all events i don't like delay true replied edmund starting from a reverie into which he had fallen i must get myself nominated a member of the council and we must arrange our other plans afterwards the party now separated and elvira left along with her companion indulged in dreams of futurity i am sorry for the death of claudia said she but i never loved her she was so cold and uninteresting such a mere matter-of-fact being she had no soul emma and how can one love a being so totally passionless and insipid i wonder continued she after a short pause what henry seymour will think of this emma smiled poor lord edmund said she i know what you would say returned elvira i am sorry for him and i admire his conduct extremely there is really something very noble about him and though i do not love him it is only from the fault of my character i am incapable of feeling strong passions yet i pity him poor lord edmund emma again smiled for she thought differently and she saw in spite of this pity and admiration that in a week poor lord edmund would be forgotten in the meantime rosabella's mind was a prey to the most violent passions a billet from father morris had informed her of the death of her cousin and of the designs brooding against her interests i will be revenged said she i will show them mine is not a soul to dwell upon impotent grief i will assemble my friends my father's party was strong in the state it cannot be quite extinct let me see to whom shall i apply the lords noodle and doodle both of ancient families were devoted to your father and were under great obligations to him when they were young observed marianne but they are such fools said rosabella they are well connected returned her confidant and power does not always attend upon talent true and as they are so weak i may guide them as i will do not rely upon that folly is generally obstinate and though there may be hopes of convincing a man of sense fools will always have their own way how then are they to be dealt with by letting them fancy they direct when in fact they are directed apply to lords noodle and doodle as though for advice more than assistance consult them how you ought to act and suggest the advantages that will arise from your possessing the throne so artfully that they may fancy what you say the dictates of their own minds and then if they advise any course they in some measure pledge themselves to support you if you pursue it i do not doubt obtaining their sanction and that of lord gustavus de montfort but i wish i could also obtain the countenance of dr hardman for he has many friends and some talents said rosabella and i own i do not feel satisfied to trust myself entirely in the hands of any of the others talk of liberty and public spirit replied marianne promise a redress of grievances and a radical reform of all evils and you may secure dr hardman yet he is not a fool nay he is even shrewd penetrating and persevering but as lunatics are generally mad only upon one subject 
so even men of sense have generally some prevailing folly and his is that of being thought of importance in the state indeed in my opinion there are very few human beings whom we may not make subservient to our views if we have but penetration enough to discover their weak sides and art enough to avail ourselves of the discovery the world is very much obliged to you for the high opinion you have of it returned rosabella however i like your advice and will pursue it but do you think father mars will approve oh i will answer for him interrupted marianne i will then write to each of the three lords continued rosabella and appoint a time and place for an interview with each i must attend to the doctor afterwards beware said marianne you have a difficult game to play the old proverb says it is well to have two strings to one's bow but four i fear will be too much for you to manage fear me not cried her mistress impetuous as i generally am i can be cautious when i see occasion in pursuance of her resolution rosabella wrote to the nobleman whose assistance she wished to secure and receiving favorable answers the hour of twelve that night was fixed upon for a secret meeting between lord gustavus and herself upon the subject the utmost secrecy was requisite as rosabella knew the fiery temper of her uncle and felt confident that if he discovered her plans before they were ripe for execution his vengeance would have no bounds she wished therefore to ascertain her strength privately and as she was aware a fruitless struggle would only involve her in ruin she resolved not to betray her intentions till there appeared at least a fair prospect of success for this reason when the duke informed her of the death of the queen she affected only the surprise she might naturally be supposed to feel at the suddenness of the event and appeared absorbed in grief for the loss of her cousin without seeming even to think of the consequences likely to ensue to herself in short she acted her part so well that the duke was completely deceived and when he returned to sir ambrose after his conference with her he exclaimed we had no occasion to alarm ourselves or give ourselves so much trouble i don't believe rosabella even thinks about the throne and i am sure she doesn't care a straw whether she has it or not i am even confident from what i have seen to-night that i have only to express my wishes in favour of elvira to have her resign all pretensions immediately sir ambrose smiled and shook his head incredulously and the duke was provoked for like all weak obstinate men he was extremely tenacious of the infallibility of his judgment why do you shake your head said he do you disbelieve my assertion i do not disbelieve your assertion i only doubt your penetration and why do you doubt that because i know rosabella then you think her indifference affected i think it too great to be real moderation is not by any means a characteristic of rosabella she is ever in extremes and when she appears otherwise depend upon it she is only acting a part and she has some end in view that she hopes to gain by it well let her be as sly as she will she cannot deceive me i'll watch her i'll defy her to think walk look or speak without my knowing of it and if i find she nourishes even the thought of rivaling elvira she shall quit my house immediately i will encourage no vipers sir ambrose smiled inwardly at the mistaken confidence of his friend in his own judgment thinking it useless however to irritate him by farther opposition he endeavoured to turn the conversation upon another subject it is strange said he how frequently i have been thinking of that mummy if there be no deception in the business it is a perfect miracle and what deception can there be returned the duke peevishly you think yourself so very wise and that you know so much better than other people only because you are always suspecting something wrong now for my part i think as poor dr entwerfen used to say incredulity is often as much the offspring of folly as credulity i wonder what has become of the doctor and edric for ill as edric behaved he is still my son and i own i should like to know where he is oh i don't think you have the least occasion in the world to trouble yourself about him depend upon it he and his mad friend dr entwerfen are rambling about egypt 
and are happier now than ever they were before in their lives if you are right said sir ambrose and they are now in egypt as they have lost their balloon they may be in want even of necessaries and it is very right they should be so replied the duke what business had they to go away the hours of this eventful day rolled on heavily with rosabella the important consequences of the struggle she was about to engage in forcibly impressed her mind ruin must inevitably ensue if she failed and even if she succeeded her past seemed strewed with thorns the anxiety natural to the intrigue she was about to be involved in also hung about her though haughty and vindictive rosabella was not naturally deceitful indeed the very violence and impetuosity of her passions rendered it difficult for her to appear otherwise than she really was the secret intercourse however which through the intervention of marianne she had long maintained with father morris had somewhat practised her in concealment but it was still repugnant to her nature she was now anxiously expecting a visit from the reverend father and as he was generally remarkably punctual to his appointments his non-appearance filled her with a sensation of dread and a presentiment of evil crept over her that she tried in vain to overcome it is long past the hour the father mentioned said marianne after a long pause during which she had been listening with the utmost attention to every sound i cannot imagine the cause of his absence surely our plans have not been discovered and as she spoke her blanched cheeks and livid lips betrayed the deep interest she took in his fate how mournfully that heavy bell clangs in my ear said rosabella it seems to ring the death knell of my hopes a gloomy foreboding hangs upon my mind and undefinable horrors rise in dim perspective before me hark cried marianne her sense of hearing sharpened by anxiety he comes yes yes he comes added she after a short pause and in a few seconds rosabella heard the father's well-known step you are very late said she as he entered the room good god what is the matter asked marianne as the haggard agitated features of the priest met her eye you look like one who has held communion with infernal spirits you say right marianne replied the father in a deep hollow tone i have indeed conversed with spirits for never could those fearful eyes which still seem to glare upon me belong to mortal what do you mean asked rosabella i have again seen the mummy that fearful spectre from the tomb even now he crossed my path and bade me beware or i should become his slave i am not timid but my very soul recoiled from the hideous aspect of that awful being the surclos of the grave are still wrapped round him his fearful eyes glare with unearthly lustre and his deep sepulchral voice thrills through every nerve are you certain it is no deception asked marianne deception returned the priest even i trembled marianne when i gazed upon the countenance of that tremendous being and read there the traces of fierce and ungoverned passions wild and destructive in their course as the raging whirlwind even i dread the influence he might exert upon our destinies and shuddered at the thought of such a creature's being released from the fetters of the tomb and sent back as a destroying spirit upon earth the eternal gloom which hangs upon his brow seems to bespeak a fallen angel for such is the deadly hate that must have animated the rebellious spirits when expelled from heaven his look is terrific and my blood froze in my veins at his hard laugh which seemed to ring in my ears like the mockery of fiends when they have involved the human being inextricably in their toils it may be a fiend murmured marianne in a low whisper at this moment the clock struck twelve rosabella started at the sound lord gustavus will expect me cried she go then replied the priest with marianne i will follow presently with trembling limbs beating heart and all the trepidation which the consciousness of guilt cannot fail to give even to the firmest mind rosabella and marianne proceeded to the terrace where they found lord gustavus waiting to receive them you may think it strange my lord said the agitated princess as she advanced leaving her confidant at the gate which led from the garden that i should desire this meeting by no means by no means said lord gustavus condescendingly 
indeed i have already had some conversation with an emissary of yours that has let me into your views and i find from him your ideas upon several important subjects are so clear so just so sensible and so accordant with my own that i feel disposed to become your partisan even before you utter a syllable and who is this emissary asked rosabella unable to account for a reception so unexpectedly gracious and alarmed at what she feared a premature exposure of her plans father morris replied lord gustavus alarmed in his turn lest he should have unguardedly committed himself he told me he was an accredited agent of yours and even induced me to to your lordship need not hesitate returned rosabella i was not aware that father morris had seen you or i should not have expressed surprise i have been induced then said lord gustavus to bring with me two friends of mine lord maysworth and dr hardman they are fully convinced of the justness of your ideas respecting retrenchment and reform and they think your plans of curtailing the expenditure by throwing all the power of the state into the hands of a few trustworthy individuals upon whom you may thoroughly rely such as them or myself for instance most excellent poor rosabella was here completely puzzled as she had not the slightest idea of what plan lord gustavus could possibly allude to nor indeed was it probable she should it being entirely the offspring of the creative brain of father morris invented by him solely for the purpose of the winning of the noble lords to whom he had confided it over to her party rosabella was naturally quick and possessing abundantly that very unexplainable but well-known faculty designated tact she instantly divined the motive that had induced father morris to attribute this scheme to her and determined to avoid if possible betraying her ignorance lord maysworth and dr hardman who had remained at a little distance and whom the agitation of rosabella had prevented her before seeing now advanced and after having been presented to the princess the former assured her of his devotion to her cause i admire your ideas exceedingly said he and particularly your intention of removing lord edmund from the command of the army and placing an older and more experienced person in his stead lord edmund cried rosabella thrown off her guard by the sudden mention of that name father morris told me so resumed lord maysworth in surprise and he told you truly interrupted rosabella father morris is worthy of all the confidence i can repose in him in fact he knows my inmost thoughts but i was not aware that he had seen you a conversation now ensued in the course of which lord maysworth detailed with admirable minuteness a variety of subjects calling for reform rosabella did not understand half he said for his calculations bewildered her and her mind accustomed to soar with the eagle flight of genius and take in oceans with a glance could scarcely condescend to listen to the petty articles of economy in expenditure to which it seemed principally his object to draw her attention she assented however to all he said and having let him speak as long as he liked without showing symptoms of weariness and having luckily said yes and no in the right places he departed quite enchanted and completely gained over to her party declaring her to be without exception one of the most sensible young women he had ever conversed with in his life to this lord gustavus and dr hardman assented as she had appeared also to acquiesce in all they had said and the noble lords and learned doctor departed perfectly satisfied scarcely were they gone when father morris appeared my dear father exclaimed rosabella enraptured at the result of the interview congratulate me lord maysworth dr hardman and lord gustavus are our own i rejoice sincerely my child returned the priest for heaven knows i feel as great an interest in your welfare as in my own but what do they say let us hear if your hopes are well founded at first their expressions were rather of a negative nature for they told me rather that a party existed against my rival than for myself they say the duke has many enemies from his obstinate and conceited disposition they said also that my father had had many friends and do they exist no longer then 
that you lay such emphasis on the word had asked father mars bitterly they exist but it seems my father has been so unfortunate as to lose their friendship returned rosabella for lord gustavus repeatedly alluded to that crime which it is said my father committed in his youth and which i would sacrifice my life to wash away crime did he dare to call it crime he did indeed and it is not possible to describe the torture that rent my bosom as he spoke i can bear to hear my father called unfortunate but i cannot endure to have him suspected of having been guilty nor was he guilty girl none but fools or idiots dare breathe such an accusation against his name ten thousand blessings on you for relieving my mind from the agony of believing him unworthy of my love i am perfectly satisfied with your assurance and yet methinks i would fain know his history rosabella you never knew your father you were but three years old when circumstances occurred that urged him to commit a deed of desperation seek not to inquire farther and endeavor since misfortune has thrown a shade over your father's name to redeem it by the lustre of your own as an obscure individual whatever might be my will power would be wanting but it shall not be wanting you shall be queen i swear it though all the powers of heaven and earth should unite to oppose my design and though even blood should be necessary to seal the compact he was going on when a fiendish laugh rang in his ears and looking up he beheld a gigantic form of cheop standing over him the bright moonbeams showed with horrible distinctness the strange attire savage features and unearthly gaze of the mummy as his horrid laugh echoed from the wall behind them and pealed across the water rosabella had not before seen him except when she knelt before the dying queen and shrieking with horror she fled for refuge to her own apartment whilst cheops thus tauntingly addressed the priest you were conspiring mischief though the language your lips employed was unknown to me that of your looks was clear men do not cast their eyes upon the earth and murmur forth their accounts as though they trembled at the sound of their own voices when their purposes are such as will bear avowal make me your confidant and by the aid of my serpent deity my guardian knef i may assist you but force me to become your enemy and typhon himself never pursued isis and the infant horus with more unrelenting vengeance then i will follow you and destroy your plans dreading alike to trust or enrage this mysterious being and cursing the evil chance that had led him to that spot father mars who like all the english in those days was an universal linguist found himself obliged partially to obey this injunction and inform the mummy of his design cheops burst into one of his terrific laughs of derision and so he said you would make yonder feeble girl who fled screaming at my approach a queen a fit monarch for a warlike people can a woman's arm resist an invasion of the pali or a woman's hands direct the reins of misraim's government alas alas where am i wandering i forgot the change wrought in my destiny and that your people seem powerless as a sovereign you would give them be satisfied i will not betray thee indeed so do i hate thy countrymen that i shall rejoice to see thee triumph in deceiving them beware however how thou attemptest to deceive me lest my vengeance quick sure and unforeseen as a secret agency of the epopti should fall upon and trust thee at the very moment of the fruition of thy wishes fearing whilst he hated the mysterious being thus strangely thrust into his most inmost secrets father morris promised obedience and the mummy his wild eyes flashing triumph held out his hand to him give me your hand said he and let us seal our compact father morris shuddered for the words of the mummy recalled those he had just employed when this fearful apparition broke in upon him and brought with them a train of thoughts he would now willingly have shaken off he did not dare however to refuse and reluctantly held out his hand the mummy seized it with an iron grasp 
and an icy chill seemed to creep to Father Morris's heart as his hideous ally burst into one of his demon-like laughs and left him to his own meditations. Unable to shake off the horror that oppressed him, for he felt as though he had entered into a compact with the fiend, the priest stood immovable, gazing at the supernatural appearance of Cheops as he stalked across the terrace. His gaunt figure, rendered more awful by the grave clothes that bound it, was magnified in the moonbeams, which seemed to increase rather than to mitigate the unearthly ugliness of the apparition they shone upon. The priest was fixed in a fearful trance. In imagination he still felt the cold and iron grasp of the mummy, whose eyes seemed as though they were still looking into his very soul, and whose solemn accents were even now scarring his faculties. At length, however, Father Morris recovered something of his self-possession, and fled from the spot he scarcely knew in what direction, under the fear, at every turning, of again encountering the dreaded mummy. End of chapter 1 of volume 2volume two chapter two of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lynn thompson the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon volume two chapter two when the reverend father took refuge in his chamber after this fearful and memorable interview he felt that strange mysterious sensation of something dreadful hanging over him though he scarcely knew what which so often weighs upon the mind when any great and unexpected change has taken place in our destiny he threw himself upon a sofa and endeavoured in vain to analyse his feelings he was not superstitious but there was something about the mummy that inspired him with awe in spite of himself, and he felt that he was no longer his own master, for a supernatural power seemed to mingle with his designs and control his actions. He endeavoured in vain to recur to the plans he had that morning arranged for gaining over partisans to the side of Rosabella. He could not govern his ideas. He could no longer direct them as he wished. One sole thought occupied his mind, one sole image floated before his senses. He held his head with his hands, he pressed them firmly against his ears, and closed his eyes, as though by shutting out external objects, his mind could recover its tone. It was all in vain. The gaunt figure of the mummy still seemed to stalk before his eyes, and his fiendish laugh still to ring in his ears. Father Morris rose from his couch and threw open his window, the cool evening breeze revived him and restored his faculties. He now began to reason with himself. It is very strange, said he, but unaccountable though it may seem. The destinies of this fearful being are evidently interwoven with mine. His appearance here at this eventful moment, and his forcing himself upon my confidence, which a secret power superior to my own prevented the possibility of my refusing him, cannot surely be accidental. No. No, he is permitted to revisit this earth for some positive and definite purpose, perchance to counteract my plans, perchance to aid them. There is no vanity in the thought, for upon my destiny at this moment hangs that of a mighty empire, and I feel that I am but a blind instrument in the hands of fate, condemned to work mole-like in the dark, uncertain whether I be not drawing destruction upon my head at the very moment when I fancy I am attaining the pinnacle of happiness and glory. However, I will not be wanting to myself. This strange agent may be sent to aid me, and it shall not be my fault if I do not avail myself of his assistance. The night was now far advanced. Sleep had waved his leaden pinions over the inhabitants of the late noisy city, and no sound broke upon the stillness that spread around, save the great bell of the ancient cathedral of St. Paul's, which told solemnly, at lengthened intervals, to announce the death of the departed queen. The contemplation of nature always soothes the mind, 
and Father Morris, as he gazed upon the quiet garden sleeping in the calm moonbeams, felt half his cares pass away, and refreshed by the cool breeze which now blew keenly from the water, he closed his window and prepared to retire for the night. But what was his horror on turning round to find, stretched upon the couch he had so lately occupied, the dreaded mummy? his eyes fixed upon the brilliant constellation of orion and his lips murmuring an address to the deity he fancied it to represent yes blessed horus cried cheops as father morris gazed upon him with indescribable emotions thou wilt hear my prayer for thou hast also been a stranger in a foreign land forced even in thy mother's arms to fly pursued by all the fury of fell typhon's rage thou knowest how to pity the unhappy and now too bright isis continued he addressing the moon thou also hast known sorrow when thy streaming tears occasioned the first overflowing of the nile and grief for the loss of osiris rent thy bosom with despair then becamest thou well fitted to be patroness of the wretched o arsinoe could i but recall the fatal moment when i saw thee last despair is sinful said the priest feeling compelled to speak almost without his own volition repentance may obtain forgiveness even of the most heinous crimes cheops started upon his feet at the sound of the father's voice and burst into one of his fearful laughs and who art thou cried he who presumest to preach repentance to me oh i know thee now thou art the priest whose confident i am become but though i will aid thee think not i will be thy slave no rather art thou mine for thou art in my power father morris felt his blood curdle in his veins at this address and though he strove to speak his tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he could not articulate a word at this moment the solemn clang of the deep-toned bell fell heavily upon their ears Cheops started at the sound, and bent forward eagerly, to listen as it slowly pealed through the deep silence of the night. "'Whence comes that fearful knell?' exclaimed he. "'Awful as the sound which is doomed to sink into the souls of the initiator of the Isian mysteries. Again it tolls. Speak. Whence comes it? What does it foretell? Is it the signal of another change of existence, strange, awful, and mysterious, as that I have already experienced?' let it come i am prepared the gods cannot inflict tortures more horrible than those i already suffer cannot have i said dread osiris forgive the impious thought methinks e'en now i see thy dark blue countenance frowning in awful majesty at my unguarded rashness forgive me mighty spirit no longer will i repine at thy decrees but teach my proud rebellious heart submission alas alas had i before done so but it is now too late, and happiness is lost to me for ever. Sighing, he hid his face in his hands as he spoke, and all again was silent, save the deep-toned bell, which still fell heavily at intervals upon the ear. Slowly the hours rolled on, yet still Father Morris sat gazing on the mummy till the first bright tints of morning broke through the dark grey sky, and a half-subdued bustle in the streets, as of people hurrying to and fro, announced that preparations were making to hang them with black. The confused murmur, the busy voices hushed to whispers, and the still-continued tolling of the muffled bell, harmonized with the fearful form of the mummy visitant, which, now seen dimly by the uncertain shades of the breaking twilight, seemed to acquire fresh horrors from the obscure and wavering gleams thrown upon it. It was at this moment, when objects were gradually becoming more distinct every instant, that Lord Edmund rushed into the room. "'Father Morris,' cried he, "'you must aid me, or all is lost.' And as he spoke, he started back aghast, for the terrific form of the mummy struck upon his sight. He had seen him, it was true, on his first descent, but the events that had since occurred, involving as they did the dearest interests of his soul, had almost driven the circumstance from his memory. Now, however, aided by the elusive light, the spectre appeared before him in all its frightful reality, and even the firm mind of Edmund shrank back aghast from the appalling sight. "'Why do you shrink?' said Cheops, his deep, hollow voice thrilling through the souls of his auditors. 
Why does my form appear to create such terror? Is it because a tomb has been my dwelling? O oh, degenerate race, know that the sons of Mizraim, bold, wise, and learned as they were, held that communion with the dead was needful to the living. They loved to gaze upon the empty casket, deprived of all that gave it value, for it taught the meanness of the body, and who could dwell upon the withering worthless clay and not acknowledge to his soul how poor were its highest pleasures, when compared to the sublime aspirations of the spirit? Why then tremble? Virtue need fear no spectres, and vice might shudder at itself. If thine own conscience do not upbraid thee, what hast thou to fear? Nothing, said Lord Edmund firmly. Spectre or demon, whatever you may be, I fear you not. "'Twas but the infirmity of human nature. "'It is past, and I am again myself, "'and strong in the consciousness of the integrity of my own mind. "'It is not in the power of hell itself to fright me from my purpose.' "'The integrity of thy own mind,' cried Cheops, with one of his horrid laughs. "'Poor weak offspring of clay, I confide in thy boasted strength, "'rely upon thy vaunted firmness, "'but when the hour of trial and temptation shall arrive.' tremble lord edmund shuddered in spite of himself and his blood ran colder in his veins who art thou cried he indignantly strange terrible being that thou art and why art thou permitted to revisit earth to taunt me into madness i was once as thou art returned cheops young ardent and impetuous i thought the world was made for happiness and that men were born to be my slaves glory was my idol and fame the only mead i coveted deeply did i drink of her intoxicating cup my renown spread to the remotest corners of the earth and my power became as boundless as my ambition to immortalize my name i caused the erection of an enormous pyramid and my grandeur seemed beyond the reach of destiny to destroy but i trusted in my own strength and i fell tremble then weak man nor dare to boast how thou wilt act until the moment of temptation shall arrive. The deep, thrilling voice of the mummy fell upon Lord Edmund's ear as a warning from the tomb. He too was relying on his own strength, and should he too fail? Forbid it, heaven! No, thought he, in some cases I might fear, but now, when the welfare of her I love is at stake, I cannot fail. The mummy smiled as he read the thoughts that passed over Lord Edmund's expressive countenance. Thus I too thought, muttered he, and as I was, so will he be deceived. Human nature is still the same, even in this remote corner of the globe. Fool that I was, then, to attempt to reverse her decrees. Forgive me, mighty Isis. The rest was lost in inarticulate murmurs as the mummy's head sank upon his breast. O oh God, cried Edmund to Father Morris, where comes this fearful spectre? What does it import? I know not, said Father Morris, in a hoarse, unnatural whisper, his eyes still strained upon the mummy. Edmund started, for the unusual abstraction of Father Morris added fresh horror to the scene. His senses seemed bewildered. He scarcely knew where he was, or what was passing around him. He rubbed his eyes and tried to wake from what appeared a frightful dream, but in vain. The vision was still there in all its horrible distinctness and Edmund felt a terrific creeping steal along his nerves as the hollow, sepulchral voice of the mummy again fell upon his ears. "'Alas, where am I?' continued he. "'Can that river be a ramification of my beloved Nile? "'Or am I indeed torn from all I prize and love "'to be cast upon this secluded spot "'where all seems strange and insignificant? "'O deity of the foaming waters, holy Sirius, hear me!' Calm my troubled spirit and grant some gracious manifestation of thy divinity to chase my growing doubts. But I deceive myself. This is not the Nile. No papyrine boats glide o'er the polished surface. No scanthus groves, nor forests of lofty palm border its banks. No, no, the immortal palm, fit emblem of the soul, grows only in those favoured realms where spurning at oppression it resists the feeble efforts of man to bend it to the earth and springs upward with the only added vigour from the feeble attempts made to subdue it the mummy ceased and a solemn silence prevailed whilst passions fierce at that whirlwind's fury flitted across his face chilling the beholder's heart with horror at the fearful being whose bosom could conceive them 
Father Morris was not naturally timid. He even possessed uncommon strength, both of nerves and mind. Yet an unwanted shuddering ran through his frame as he gazed upon Cheops, and traced the workings of that demoniac mind as they were successively imprinted on his features. Involuntarily he turned away in disgust. "'For God's sake, let us go,' cried he, gasping for breath, for a strange feeling that he could not define seemed to impede his respiration. "'Yes, yes, let us go,' stammered forth Edmund, still, however, keeping his eyes fixed upon the awful object of his fear, as he slowly moved towards the door. "'Stay!' cried Cheops, in a voice of thunder. Involuntarily they obeyed. "'How feeble is this race of men,' resumed the mummy. "'How different from the sons of ancient Mizraim, from the Macrobian Ethiopians, or even our pallic foes! Degenerate in form as well as in spirit, their souls no longer seem emanations from the divinity, though perhaps the immortal spark becomes degraded and abused from its long continuance in clay, and is sunk for ever from its pristine greatness. Stay, then,' continued he. "'Why should you fly me? I mean you no harm, and I swear by the sacred tomb of Osiris in Philo that I will not hurt you. Drive me not, then, from amongst you, and I may aid your projects. At least it is your duty to receive me as the destined instrument of fate, since Osiris decrees that my soul shall quit its transmigrations in the form of animals to reanimate this worthless body.' Take me, then, to your counsels, confide in my power, and I swear by the holy dust of Isis that you shall not repent. Avaunt, demon, cried Lord Edmund, and, bursting from the room, he rushed out of the house. What farther passed between the priest and his awful visitor was known only to themselves, for when Father Morris descended to breakfast, he appeared absorbed in his usual studies, without taking the slightest notice of the terrific occurrences of the night. The death of the queen being now generally known, her remains laid in state were exposed to the lamentations of her subjects and innumerable visitors, with that strange fondness for seeing sights which can make even death considered as a show, crowded to the mournful spectacle. In an immense hall, hung with black, was placed a kind of bier, covered with black cloth, supporting the body of the deceased queen, over which was thrown a velvet pall, so disposed as to display the beautiful features of the deceased, which, though now fixed in death, still retained their native expression of majestic dignity. Immense tapers of an enormous thickness lighted the sombre walls hung with black cloth, while chorister boys walked up and down chanting hymns in honour of the deceased, and flinging incense in the air from silver vessels suspended by silver chains, which they carried in their hands, thus shedding fragrance around, and chasing the fearful odour of mortality even from the very chamber of death. Priests wrapped in funeral garments also slowly paraded the room, muttering prayers and joining occasionally their full, deep-toned voices with the shriller chant of the boys. The space where the public were admitted was railed off from the lower end of the hall, but near the body knelt a beautiful female arrayed in black velvet and her fair face and arms shaded by a veil of black crape. "'Oh, Osiris!' cried a figure wrapped in a long, dark cloak, grasping the arm of Father Morris. "'Who is that lovely creature?' There, bending over the last awful relics of mortality, methinks she looks beauteous as the phoenix rising from the funeral pile, and triumphing in glory over the impotent malice of the grave. "'Hush, hush, for heaven's sake!' whispered the deep, full voice of Father Morris. It is Elvira, the rival of Rosabella, whom you have sworn to support. Typhon himself could not injure her, said Cheops, for it was he, and he stood with his eyes fixed upon her, apparently lost in meditation. For mercy's sake, let us go, whispered the priest. You will excite attention. We shall be discovered. Besides, continued he in a lower tone, did you find a crown so delightful that you think you would injure her by depriving her of one? No, by the holy limbs of Osiris, said Cheops, and, obeying the influence of the friar's arm, he moved onwards. Why was not Rosabella with Elvira in the hall? asked Sir Ambrose. I thought it was commanded by the law that all the princesses of the blood royal should exhibit themselves publicly as mourners by the corpse of the deceased queen. 
"'Rosabella is ill,' replied the Duke. "'Grief for the loss of her cousin has produced an access of fever, "'and she is unable to quit her bed.' "'Indeed,' returned Sir Ambrose incredulously. "'It is very strange. "'I own I did not give Rosabella credit for so much sensibility.' Notwithstanding the incredulity of Sir Ambrose, however, Rosabella was really dangerously ill, though her illness did not proceed exactly from the cause she chose to assign for it. The terror she had felt at the sudden appearance of the mummy, whom she thought a supernatural being, at the very moment she believed the death of her cousin was darkly hinted at by the monk, operating upon an over-excited imagination, had produced fever, and for some days Rosabella was in considerable danger. The secret exertions of Father Morris, however, in her behalf, prevented Rosabella's cause from being injured by her illness, and by the time she was able to leave her bed, Lord Gustavus de Montford, Lord Maysworth, and Dr. Hardman, with the Lord's Noodle and Doodle, had declared themselves her adherents, bringing with them all the numerous hosts who, finding it too much trouble to judge for themselves, are always ready to follow in the train of a great man. The day when this important declaration was made was that on which all the nobility of the realm assembled in that splendid monument of antiquity, Westminster Hall, to choose the Council of State to govern the kingdom during the interregnum. This venerable pile, which has seen so many generations successively rise and pass away, now cleared of the encumbrances with which the bad taste of the Middle Ages had loaded it, shone in all its original magnificence and opened wide its ponderous portals to receive the whole nobility of England upon this important occasion. It was a glorious, almost an awful sight, to see so many great and illustrious characters, some of whose names were celebrated even to the remotest corners of the globe, collected together in that magnificent hall. Though few thought of the grandeur of the spectacle, the deep interest excited by the occasion that assembled them, absorbing all minor feelings, the business of the day was soon entered upon, and twelve noble individuals chosen to direct the affairs of state till another queen should be elected. The Duke of Cornwall, Lord Edmund Montague, Lord Gustavus de Montford, Lord Maysworth, and the Lords Noodle and Doodle were amongst the number chosen, and as soon as the election was completed, the council retired together to an apartment appropriated to their use, to consult upon the measures to be taken to secure the due election of their future queen. Then it was that the anxious father of Elvira was paralysed, to hear the noble lords above mentioned declare themselves partisans of her rival, and to see others who till then had remained neuter, seem inclined to range themselves upon the same side. In vain did Edmund exert his powerful eloquence. The weight and influence of the adverse lords far outweighed all his arguments in the breasts of his auditors and the poor old duke returned home depressed and almost heartbroken from the conviction he received that the feeling of the majority of the council was decidedly against his child the moment the duke reached his own palace he repaired to the apartment of rosabella and found her apparently in a state of convalescence reclining upon a sofa supported by her confidant marianne with father morris sitting at her feet the Holy Father was evidently confused at the unexpected arrival of the Duke, and he rose hastily in great disorder, to endeavour to account for his appearance there, though, in fact, as there was nothing extraordinary in a priest visiting a sick penitent, his eagerness to exculpate himself from suspicion would have excited it had not the Duke been too angry even to be aware of his presence. "'Wretch!' exclaimed he, addressing Rosabella. "'Vile, ungrateful wretch that thou art!' Thou hast destroyed me. Thou wilt bring the grey hairs of thy benefactor with sorrow to the grave. And with such treachery, O oh, Rosabella, how could you plot against me, whilst you were enjoying the shelter of my roof? Against me, did I say? Alas, would it were only against me, but no, with fiend-like barbarity you have conspired to destroy my child. The Duke had here unwittingly struck a chord that thrilled through the inmost soul of his auditors, though he did not heed their confusion. "'Oh, Rosabella,' continued he, "'if I could have guessed when thou wert brought to me a little smiling infant, and I took thee under my protection to foster thee as my own child, that thou wast prove a serpent to sting my heart to the core. But I was told it would be so. Sir Ambrose warned me to beware. 
"'Your brother,' said he, "'has proved a villain. "'The violence of his passions has led him to commit unheard-of crimes, "'and may not the same furies glow in the bosom of this smiling infant? "'Do not desert her, but do not educate the offspring of guilt "'in the bosom of your own family.' "'And did Sir Ambrose say this?' exclaimed Father Morris, "'grinding his teeth together and scarcely able to articulate "'from the strong emotions that convulsed his frame. "'The Duke did not hear his question and passionately continued. "'He advised well, but I was deaf to his counsel. "'Fate hurried me on to my own destruction, "'and I nourished with the tenderest care a wretch whom I have this day discovered has been plotting with traitors to deprive my child of her birthright. "'What do you mean, my lord?' said Rosabella. "'I do not understand you.' "'Yes, yes,' replied the Duke. "'Ask what I mean. "'You may well assume that face of smiling innocence. "'Too, too often it has served your purpose. "'Fool, idiot that I have been, "'to have been so easily deceived. "'But your arts will now be vain.' Lord Gustavus de Montfort will not have openly declared himself your friend, as he did today, if the most insidious arts had not been practised to win him. "'And has he done so?' asked Rosabella, her eyes sparkling with joy. "'Has he done so?' repeated the Duke bitterly. "'No doubt you know it but too well. Also that prosing Lord Maysworth, the enlightened Lord Noodle, and the intelligent Lord Doodle have enlisted their empty heads— and long purses upon your side. "'Have they?' cried Rosabella, transport brightening every feature. "'Oh, Rosabella!' exclaimed the Duke, passion giving way to agony, and torrents of tears streaming down his aged face. "'That look of affected astonishment is intolerable. You must have known all this. I am a poor, weak old man. There needed not such plotting to deceive me.' It breaks my heart to find you guilty of hypocrisy. Rosabella was affected by her uncle's tears. All his former kindness rushed upon her mind, and nature resuming her powerful influence, she forgot all her ambitious projects, her hopes, her fears, and her intrigues. She thought only of the feeble, miserable old man before her, and attempting to throw her arms round his neck, she sought to mingle her tears with his, and, clinging to his feet, to implore his forgiveness. The Duke, however, could not read her heart, and, blinded by his passion, saw in this action only an aggravated insult. Violently he spurned her from him, commanding her to leave his house immediately, and by so doing extinguish for ever every gentler feeling in his niece's breast. Rosabella's haughty spirit did not wait a second repulse. Her tears were instantly dried, and, with eyes flashing fire and cheeks glowing with indignation, she rushed out of the room without deigning to reply. The Duke's rage, if possible, exceeded her own, and these near relations, united as they were by the tenderest ties, parted in mutual hatred, sincerely hoping on both sides that they might never meet again. Father Morris and Marianne followed Rosabella, and they found, as they expected, that the violent over-excitement of the moment had given way to hysterics. These tremendous convulsive agonies soon exhausted her in feeble frame, and she lay upon the sofa in a state of torpid languor, nearly approaching to insensibility, while her friends consulted upon what course they should pursue. During this pause of uncertainty and painful deliberation, for as Rosabella was entirely dependent upon her uncle, the case seemed hopeless. A letter arrived from Lord Gustavus de Montfort, offering the loan of his palace and his purse to the princess. That prudent and calculating nobleman was fully aware of the situation in which Rosabella would be thrown by his declaration in her favour, and of the advantage that would accrue to himself in after times, if she should obtain the crown, from his having at such a moment conferred an important service upon his future sovereign. Father Morris did not hesitate to open this letter and read it. Rosabella was not in a state to be consulted. Indeed, the case was one that did not admit of hesitation, and a conveyance having been procured, the princess was removed to the house of Lord Gustavus before she had recovered the full use of her faculties. End of Volume 2, Chapter 2